please. And your mic is on. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to our session this morning. Before we call the meeting to order, we're going to swear in three new commissioners. So, Hope, would you help us, please? Place your left hand on the Bible, raise your right hand, and repeat after me. I state your name. I do solemnly, solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I support the Constitution of the United States. I state your name. I do solemnly swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance. That I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of North Carolina and to the constitutional powers and authorities and to the constitutional powers and authorities which are or may be established which are or may be established for the government thereof for the government thereof and that I will endeavor and that I will endeavor to support and maintain and defend to support and maintain and defend the constitution of said state the constitution of said state not inconsistent with not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. I state your name. I do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will well and truly. That I will well and truly execute the duties of my office. Execute the duties of my office as a member of the Marine Fisheries Commission. As a member of the Marine Fisheries Commission. According to the best of my skill and ability. According to the best of my skill and ability. According to law. According to law. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anna, Donald, and Doug. <laughs> Just a little bit of business to take care of. All right. All right. Donald, I have you. Well, I did, thank you.
Thank you, Hope, and thank you all for agreeing to serve. I'd like to give you all just a couple of seconds just to tell a little bit about yourself, where you're from, a little bit of your background, family, whatever you want to say, talk about your dogs if you want to. So, Doug, why don't we start off with you? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Doug Rader, it's really great to be back working in North Carolina on things that are dear to my heart and that I, over many years, have worked here and elsewhere in the United States and elsewhere in the world on. So this is the mission of this commission is really quite important to me as a personal matter. So I'm glad to go back to go on the commission and bear the response, co-bear the responsibility with you guys of, of figuring that out uh, in service to my native and our state. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. Hi, I'm Anna Shellam, and I am super proud to be here as well. It is such an honor. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm a commercial fisherman and fish dealer out of Wrightsville Beach in Wilmington, and I harvest, I specialize in shellfish. Uh, my company is called Shellam Seafood, and I supply directly to restaurants. Um, I can't wait to <laughs> make these moves with everyone. It's really, really a big deal, and I'm really thankful to be here. Thank you. Donald? Yes, my name is Donald Huggins. I live in Wendell, North Carolina. I'm an attorney by, by trade. That's my profession. Uh, I'm an outdoorsman. That's my passion. Um, at the end of the day, I'm looking forward to serving this state and, <clears throat> excuse me, serving the resource. Thank you all. We do have one more commissioner to uh, get online. Uh, the the uh, candidate has been identified. Right now, she is... Uh, out of touch, should we say, and uh, she should be up and going for the November meeting. Uh, but uh, so we got one more to do, and we'll do that one at that time. I would now like to call our August meeting of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission to order. Would you all stand with me and uh, entertain a moment of silence where we ask our greater power for help with deliberations with this meeting and any special needs? Amen. And now turn to behind me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Laura, would you uh, take us through the um, ethics evaluations of our new commissioners? Yes, Chairman. Okay, so the commission um, is required by the North Carolina State Ethics Commission to review the evaluation of the statement of economic interest for new commissioners. So at this time, I will read into the record the evaluation of the statement of economic interest conducted by the commission for Doug Rader, Anna Shellam, and Donald Huggins, as prospective appointees to the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. The State Ethics Commission received the 2022 Statement of Economic Interest for Mr. Rader, Ms. Shellam, and Mr. Huggins as prospective appointees to the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. They have reviewed them for actual and potential conflicts of interest pursuant to Chapter 138A of the North Carolina General Statutes, also known as the State Government Ethics Act. For uh, Dr. Rader, they did not find an actual conflict of interest, but found the potential for a conflict of interest. The potential conflict identified does not prohibit service on this entity. Uh, Dr. Rader would fill the role of a scientist serving on the commission. He is a part-time senior science advisor for the Environmental Defense Fund and plans to retire in December of this year. In addition, he is a board member of the North Carolina League of Cons Conservation Voters and therefore Dr. Rader has the potential for a conflict of interest and should exercise appropriate caution in the performance of his public duties should issues involving these entities come before the commission uh, for official action. For Ms. Shellam, they did not find an actual conflict of interest but found the potential for a conflict of interest. The potential conflict identified does not prohibit service on this entity. Ms. Shellam would fill the role of a member who is an active or recently retired commercial fisherman. 
from the coastal region. She owns Shellam Seafood LLC. And because she would serve uh, on the authority for members of her own profession, she has the potential for a conflict of interest. Therefore, Ms. Shellam should exercise appropriate caution in the performance of her public duties should issues involving Shellam Seafood LLC come before the commission for official action. For Mr. Huggins, they did not find an actual conflict of interest or the likelihood for a conflict of interest. Mr. Huggins uh, will fill the role of an at-large member on the commission. The evaluation, state, uh, the evaluation of statement of economic interest for each appointee to the commission is kept on record at the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, and that completes this item, Chairman Bizzle. Thank you, Laura. Speaking of conflict of interest, I'd like to refer you all to, on the agenda at the top of it, North Carolina General Statute 138A-15E, which mandates at the beginning of any meeting of a board, the chair shall remind all members of the duty to avoid conflicts of interest under Chapter 138. The chair also shall inquire as to whether there is any known conflict of interest with respect to any matters coming before the board at this time. Is there any possible known conflict of interest that anybody would have with what we're talking about this today? None being. I'd like y'all just to refer to the next paragraph, North Carolina General Statute 143B-289.54.G2, dash which further goes into detail about conflict of interest. Okay. Laura, would you do our roll call, please? Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Shellam? Present. Thank you. Chairman Bizzle? Here. We have a quorum, we may conduct business. And please, everybody, remember to turn your mics on whenever you do have anything to say or any questions to ask. You were sent out our agenda for today. If there are no changes to it or no questions about it, uh, the chair would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as is. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Blanton. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner McNeil. Any other discussion on this? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Also, you were sent out the meetings from the, our last meeting. If there are no additions, corrections, deletions, I'd like to have a motion to approve the agenda, uh, to approve the minutes. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Roll. Is there a second? Commissioner Cross seconds Second. it. That's all you coming. Any other discussion on it? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we're moving into our public comment period. I do not have any uh, sheets from out there. Do we have anybody who wants to comment? Can you check, please? Okay, good morning, everyone. I am Rob Bizzle, Chairman of the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission. We'd like to welcome you to our public comment session where you have a unique opportunity to, on the record, give comments in regards to the Marine Fisheries Commission's management of the state's public trust estuary and marine resources. I ask you to limit your comments to three minutes. You'll be reminded when you have approximately 30 seconds left. If you addressed the commission last night, you will not be allowed to do so at this time. Remember, this is a time to share a concern or gather information, not to be confrontational. So the first one we have up is Glenn Skinner, followed by Stuart Crichton. Hi, I'm Glenn Skinner, Executive Director of North Carolina Fisheries Association, uh, also a commercial fisherman. 
Uh, I'd like to start off by uh, congratulating the newly appointed commissioners and the ones that have been reappointed. Uh, I came here to talk about the strike bass amendment. Probably no surprise to y'all uh, after last night's public comment. Uh, I know some of the new commissioners have not been involved in this process that led up to the net ban that we're discussing in the news in Pamlico Rivers. And quite frankly, that's something to be proud of because the process that got us here has been disgraceful. Uh, there was no public comment allowed uh, at the emergency meeting, so-called emergency meeting that was held. No advice from the AC uh, committees. Uh, you, you know, Steve Murphy, as you heard last night, Senator Sanderson say Steve Murphy declined uh, the initial request to issue this proclamation because it wasn't supported by science. Uh, the commission forced him uh, to issue that proclamation, and shortly after, Secretary Regan uh, former Secretary of DEQ uh, issued a press release, uh, the first time that I'm aware of that any acting secretary has ever publicly condemned an action of this Marine Fisheries Commission. I felt like that was a really strong statement. Uh, the fact that you all are new here does not prevent you all from doing the right thing. Uh, if you approve this amendment with this language in it, you're approving the process that got us here. Uh, this is an opportunity for you all to step up and do the right thing and try to restore a shred of integrity to this commission in this process. And uh, I hope that's as important to you all as it is to me and the over 2,000 members that I'm here to represent. Uh, it, this is an opportunity for you all to get this commission on the right track to show that you intend to do what you are tasked with in the Fisheries Reform Act, which is to fairly manage both sectors. Uh, we understand management has to be implemented for this species, but this gillnet ban was not supported by science. It is still not supported by science. Uh, the fact that it's still included in this amendment is absurd in my mind, and it's even more absurd that we closed the gillnet fishery, and now in this amendment they're asking the division to go and look for data to justify that closure. You all are supposed to collect the data before you implement the management measure. Uh, that's not the way this process is supposed to work, and I just hope you all will take that into consideration. You have the full DMF staff at your disposal. Ask questions. Get up to speed. Understand this issue before you take a vote. You have the time to do it today. This is the last administrative step in this process before it's final. If it is adopted, this gillnet ban cannot be lifted without reopening this plan once this amendment is passed. And in my mind, y'all can't let that happen. So uh, I appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart Crichton, followed by Jess Hawkins. Not to interrupt long, so these are the, uh, the sum and total of my comments that I probably won't get finished with this morning. I try to be brief, but I can't always do that. Uh, first of all, good morning, all. I would like to take a moment to welcome the new commissioners and thank them in advance for their service, as well as the returning commissioners for all the work they have previously put in. This is a tough assignment. It's a thankless assignment. And you do have some difficult decisions ahead of you as you determine the best ways to rebuild our struggling marine resources. To begin with, your main actionable item on the agenda this time is the final vote on Striper Amendment Number 2. It contains a continuation of the gill net ban above the ferry lines on the Noose and Tar Pamlico Rivers. And I would like to remind you that the previous Marine Fisheries Commission voted on this issue both during its February and May meetings, and both times by a supermajority decided to keep the net ban in place. I urge this new commission to maintain that in your final vote today. As a final reminder, I have included a graphic showing that commercial fishermen in these river systems have not been hurt at all by the ban. DMF data shows that fishermen are catching more speckled trout and more striped mullet since the restrictions were put in place in 2019. Again, yes, the flounder catches are reduced, but that is because of the restrictions from Southern Flounder Amendment Number 2. The red drum catches remain low, but fairly consistent in each system. Um, it's important, guys, that ban is working. The stripers in the river are larger, they are more numerous, and yes, it is having a beneficial effect to other fisheries upriver. Red drum, speckled trout, even white perch are benefiting from this ban. I've heard all the arguments about no science 
that was used or they, they disagree with the science that was used. Guys, the initial stock assessment itself called for significant action to rebuild the striped bass population. That ought to be science enough. It's often poo-pooed but the Rachels and Rick study that was mentioned, or that I mentioned in the last meeting, showed that gillnet mortality was responsible for a lot of the cryptic mortality experienced by stripers in those river systems. From your last meeting, the public opinion, 60% of the public wanted that net ban to be maintained. Only 10% that responded to that survey wanted the gillnet ban to be lifted. On the observations that talked about striped bass interactions, if you'll recall, there were 119 interactions over nine years. And across those three major river systems, that averages about six observations per year. That's not much of a snapshot. So please remember that as you consider this actionable item today. Uh, there's quite a bit more that I wanted to discuss about the ITPs, about uh, shrimp trawl bycatch as it relates to southern flounder but I'm obviously not gonna have time to get to that. So uh, if you feel the need, please ask questions. I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Jess Hawkins. Good morning. I wanna welcome the new commissioners also, some of you that I do know, some of you that I don't. Welcome, and thank you for your duty. Those that do not know me, my name is Jess Hawkins. Uh, I used to sit where Laura is, and then actually sat in your chair for a few years. I was honored to be appointed by the governor to serve on the commission. So, lifelong resident of North Carolina, grew up on the water. I'm a recreational fisherman. I run a small business uh, doing nature tours. So, my comments today also involved the striped bass FMP amendment, and it's mainly one item, in which is the gillnet closure in the upper parts of the rivers. And what I tell you as a scientist <clears throat> is that this is not based on science. You've heard that, and so uh, it's not necessary. There were bycatch provisions put in place by the division after numerous years of studies to try to minimize bycatch in gillnets in those areas. It was not part of your FMP, which statutorily, the division prepar prepares the FMP. They are the scientific experts. And then you have input, and then you decide to approve or not approve it. So your experts did not recommend that as part of the FMP. Your advisors, which are mandated to review the FMP, the two regional advisory committees, which are uh, in statute, did not support this measure. Our state leaders uh, admonished this body when you originally took this, play, took this action back in 2019 due to the lack of science and to the, the, uh, the way that it addressed it. These action, this action does not address the major source of bycatch mortality for striped bass in these areas. Your division can tell you what the major source of that is, so, uh, which is recreational bycatch. Our legislative leaders have taken the rare opportunity to express significant concerns about this plan, and that's only happened two two times in my career, 40 years of dealing with fisheries issues. And so, um, and lastly, which is most important, you know, the decisions you make are very difficult a lot of times. Your science is uncertain sometimes. The main test that I used to use is, is it fair? And the answer is, it is not in my opinion. And this possibly violates your statutory responsibility for the fair regulation of, of commercial and recreational fishermen. We put that as part of your statutory duties to make sure when science was not strong that at least the body would use a fair moral compass as your decision maker. Thank you for you allowing me to comment to you. I hope they were useful to you. Thank you, Jess. Has everybody had a chance to uh, address the commission this morning that cares to? That being said, we will end our public comment session going into the chairman's report. In your briefing materials, there were some letters and online comments uh, about the things, the issues we're dealing with today. Please refer to those. Um, ethics training and statement of economic interest reminder. I hope everybody is up to date. Laura, do we think everybody's up to date? Good enough. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Also, we have in the briefing materials the 2022 meeting schedule. 
and our 2023 proposed meeting schedule. In particular, um, you all will take a look at the 2023. If you see something that's going to cause a personal um, inconvenience that we might can work around and change the uh, dates by a week or so, we'll be glad to look into doing that. But check on that and let Laurel and myself know about that real soon. Chairman? Yes. Hi. The 2023 is not included. Oh, it is It not. will come out immediately after. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. You shall have that shortly then. Um, I need to appoint uh, ethics liaison, and I'll appoint Laura Klebanski as our ethics liaison. Thank you, Laura, for serving in that role. And as mandated by statute uh, at the first meeting of each year, which is this is our first meeting of the year, we elect the vice chairman. So uh, I will, I'm going to recuse myself from voting on this. And so uh, I will entertain any nominations from the floor for vice chairman, and they do not have to be seconded. Commissioner Bland. I'd like to uh, nominate Commissioner Cross. Doug Cross has been nominated. Commissioner Roller. I'd like, I'd like to nominate uh, Commissioner McNeil. Okay, Commissioner McNeil, any other nominations? If not, uh, the nominations are closed, and we will do a hand vote on this. All in favor of Commissioner Cross, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Yeah, you can vote for yourself if you're that narcissistic. I mean, <laughs> and we know the answer to that. Okay. Five, and for Commissioner McNeil, we got... You going to abstain from voting? Or something. Now he's not Boy, narcissistic. Ron, he's not narcissistic. Ron. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to take the high road. So Commissioner Cross is uh, the vice chairman. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, five, uh, vote was five to one. Yeah. All right. Uh, also in your briefing materials are our committee reports. Please refer to those as you see fit. Moving on into our director's report. Director Rawls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Especially thank you for not calling me Madam Director. <clears throat> Good morning, uh, everyone, and, and welcome to the new commissioners. I look forward to working with y'all, um, and welcome to... The, I won't say old commissioners, but uh, to the old commissioners uh, uh, coming back as well. I'm looking forward to this. I think this looks like a, a really good commission, and, and I can't wait to tackle some of the things that we've got coming up in the, in the coming months and years. And somebody alluded to this in their public comments, managing fisheries in this state is not for the faint of heart, but I, I am sure that you are all ready for that duty, and I think it's much better when we are headed in the same direction and I think we are, and I think I like to think that we've made some really great improvements in the last several years relative to our relationship with this commission, the division's relationship with this commission, and how we work together, and it seems more like a team approach, and I certainly advocate for that and, and want that, and we are here to help in any way we can to try and make the best decisions and help you make the best decisions that you can, so I am look forward to it, and welcome to, to you all. Moving on, I want to just talk about our 200-year anniversary. Uh, Laura mentioned this in some of her orientation comments. The division is celebrating 200 years of management and conservation beginning on December the 1st of this year. You will be receiving a save-the-date invite for our bicentennial kickoff, which will occur uh, at December the 1st from 10 to 12 at the Crystal Coast Civic Center in Moorhead City, and you, you all are invited to that. This will kick off a year-long celebration of the division's 200 years of service to this state and to the citizens of this state. So that we look forward to this, and we will keep you updated on what we have planned throughout the year as those events and items become available and, and as soon as we get those uh, details ironed out. That was December what? Again? Yes, sir. What, yep. you, December 12th? First. Just, first. Yep, from 10 to 12, and you'll get okay. a, you'll get a, a save-the-date invite uh, Right, Hope, that'll be coming out soon that you'll get, wanted you to be aware of that. <clears throat> uh, moving on, just talk a little bit about DMF 
um, outreach, and we talked about this some at the May meeting, but for the benefit of some of the new commissioners, uh, I have made outreach a priority at the division. If we don't tell our story, someone else will, and they do, and most of the time we don't like it. So we experience this firsthand every day, and misinformation is a huge thing in this world, uh, much less in fisheries. Um, and we want to try and, and remedy that. I have worked at the division for 26 years, and practically all of my 26 years, there has been discussion at technician level all the way up to the director's office about the need for um, better information, more information, share the facts, th those type of approaches, and that's what we're really trying to do. We've established an internal uh, working group uh, called the Communication Advisory Team, and they really are... Um, put together to develop and engage uh, communication and have a strategy for the division. The goal is just to better engage the public and bring awareness, improve knowledge, and, and develop relationships for a better understanding of what we do at the division. <clears throat> we, we want to make a clear path for the science and put the rhetoric in the back of the bus where it needs to be. And that's, this is a tall order, and it's especially a tall order in fisheries, but I think we can, we can certainly do it. I want to <clears throat> highlight a couple of the activities that staff has been doing uh, since your last meeting, and they've been really, really busy. In June, we attended the Big Rock uh, Blue Marlin Tournament, um, two middle school camps in Carteret County. We were in Ballhead Island for Public Safety Day, and in Hyde County at the Public Library, and again for an early college summer program. In July, the staff attended the Dare County Boat Builders Tournament and two Hero Day camps in the area. In August, they were in Chowan County and Carteret County for a, a couple of camps. They were in Elizabeth City, Manio, and Hyde County for National Night Out events. And these are just to name a few of the things that staff has been working on and participating in. And as I, as I reported at your last meeting, I try to practice what I preach. Uh, can't ask the staff to do something that I'm not equally as willing to do when I have the time. And so myself and Hope Wade and Captain Daniel Ipock attended the uh, Sarah James Fulcher Redfish Tournament in Cedar Island on August the 6th. That was my first time uh, ever being visiting this tournament. And it's held in honor of Sarah James Fulcher, who passed away in 2017 at, at the age of nine due to a rare uh, brain disease. And her parents and her family started this tournament in her honor and in her memory. And this is their fifth year. And I was completely inspired by the success that they have had. So they started this tournament with 230 plus anglers around there. And last year, this year, they had 982 anglers that participated in this tournament. And it kind of struck me that this is really the way that outreach works. Like one person at the time. One person tells another person and another person, and another person. And I just, I, I was just amazed at, you know, the success that they've had. And that's really what we're trying to do at DMF. We're just trying to share the facts one person at a time, generate conversation and better understanding. And I think that that will really take us places together uh, as we handle these very difficult subjects. Um, as a state agency, we do have limited resources, so it does make it difficult, but we have a staff that is very dedicated to doing this, even on their weekends. And so I think it, 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 I think it will make a difference. I think it can make a difference, and I think that if we keep our eye on that particular ball, that we can, we can have some success there. Um, again, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and all we're trying to do is engage and educate people in the facts and one person at a time. And as I have in the past, and I know I mentioned at the last meeting that the chairman has also done some outreach on his own. And you may have an opportunity to do that in your everyday lives, depending on what you do. Uh, Captain Roller, certainly, um, and Anna Shellum. I mean, you, you guys run into people all the time, and you have an opportunity, even oh, uh, though it might not be an official thing that you're working on, just talking to people and sharing the facts. So if you ever want to participate with us in any of our outreach, please let us know, and we would be more than happy for you to come along and then obviously do what you do in your daily lives as well. So I want to uh, move on with a couple of um, Southern Flounder updates, and you will hear more about, a little bit more about Southern Flounder and what we're working on um, as the day goes by and we move through the agenda. 
staff has been working on implementation of Amendment 3, and uh, this was adopted by this commission um, at your May meeting. And as a reminder, Amendment 3 requires a 72% reduction in total removals. We know this is a significant amount of reduction. Uh, it is... Um, it is a very tough pill, has been a tough pill for the commercial sector as well as the recreational sector, and they have certainly let us know, and I'm sure they have let y'all know as well. Um, we can't overstate the importance of that fishery to our state, to both our commercial and recreational fishermen, and we realize that the reductions are significant, but we do feel like it's important that management is pointed in the right direction to recover this stock. We just don't, well, there's no other choice. I mean, it is the, the only choice that we have. Um, Amendment 3 really included commercial and recreational quotas uh, as well as sector allocations. These were the very heavy lifts uh, that this commission took uh, in, the, in this amendment. Um, and really, I, I hesitated in even talking about flounder because I, I enjoy meetings where we don't talk about flounder, actually. But um, Amendment 3 did also give the director some flexibility in set and season dates, which we have done. Um, the proclamations will be issued Opening the seasons, I think the recreational proclamation has already gone out. Where, yep, yep, okay, thanks. Looking for Steve over there. The recreational season is September the 1st to the 30th, 15 inch minimum size limit and a one fish bag limit. The commercial season is split by gear in areas. The mobile gears are basically split into two management units and they will open statewide. So both management units will open September the 15th. And the pound net uh, gear is split by three management areas, basically along the uh, uh, incidental take permit boundaries. The northern management area will open September the 15th, and then the central southern management area will close, uh, I mean, will open October the 1st, and those commercial seasons will close when the quotas are projected to be met. So a couple of, of important things to remind folks about, and I, I'm not trying to... Some of these comments, I, I just said to myself, I don't know what I was doing when I wrote some of these. It might seem a little salty, but I'm just trying to remind people of our responsibility uh, as, a, as, a, as users of the resource and, you know, as people that um, are trying to protect the fisheries of the state of our responsibilities here. So just for recreational fishermen, I just want to, um, and hopefully there's lots of folks listening online, and the, they can, again, talk to your buddies when you, when you hear these comments. Uh, during the flounder season, please be expecting our recreational samplers. Um, please remember that complying with our sampling uh, and, and our surveys is a condition of your coastal recreational fishing license. But even more importantly, uh, providing the data we are asking for is critical to informing management down the road. Uh, it, we have to have the data uh, or, or else we wouldn't be out there asking for it. We are also planning some outreach. Um, so if you see staff, uh, other than our uh, normal MRIP samplers that you might run into. We may be out there talking about flounder, talking about management, uh, looking at people's fish and seeing, uh, talking about identification. So you may see us at boat ramps. You may see me at boat ramps. I will not be talking about identification because I'm not very good at that, but I still uh, will be out there participating. So that might be something that you're not used to seeing. Please be patient with us. Please be compliant with our regulations. Uh, and staff has got a job to do, and we would just ask that pe people, all people, please consider their role uh, in this fishery. Uh, the recreational role in this fishery has increased considerably, and we just ask people to do their part um, to, 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 to implement this amendment as this commission has directed. For the dealers, if you are going to purchase a southern flounder from licensed commercial fishermen, you're required to have an estuarine flounder dealer permit. They're free of charge, and you can get them in any division office. If you, have, if you have said permit, you are required to fill out and submit quota monitoring logs daily to report landings of uh, estuarine flounder while the season, commercial season is open. Whether or not you have any transactions that day, you are still required to report you have to report that you had no landings as well as if you had landings. Um, for us to adequately monitor this quota, it is imperative that dealers report in a timely manner. And if you do not, we will be issuing notices of violations and citations uh, for noncompliance with permit conditions. 
in order for us to manage this fishery, if we do not have uh, timely reporting, we will, we will not be able to manage these qu this quota. The window, because of the low quotas, the windows for our sampling will be very short. And so please be expecting to see us uh, in, your, um, in your fish houses more frequently than usual until the season closes. And to, to commercial fishermen, uh, as, you, as you're all well aware, the Division of Marine Fisheries has incidental take permits for Atlantic sturgeon and sea turtles. Uh, observer coverage is a compliance requirement of these incidental take permits, including anchored large mesh gill nets during the flounder season. And in light of the low quotas and the shortened flounder season, it is even more imperative that fishermen respond to observers to set up trips uh, on board for observations. On board observations are the most effective way to monitor the protective resources interactions as well as collect bycatch and discard data directly from the fisheries real time as they're happening. This onboard data is used in stock assessments, formulate management decisions. We use it in FMP development. Uh, we use it, we need it. It is critical to this fishery. This division expends a tremendous amount of effort to get trips set up with very minimal success or cooperation from the majority of commercial gillnet fishermen. I don't remember what the, uh, and Barbie may know it off the top of her head, but I don't remember how many calls we make to commercial fishermen with no responses. It would, it would blow your mind. Um, and really, this lack of cooperation, your fellow, the, the people that do cooperate, we appreciate those commercial fishermen. They cooperate with us on a regular basis. There's a lot of them that do, and we appreciate that. And their fellow fishermen should appreciate that too because those folks are the men and the women that are keeping this fishery open for the people that don't cooperate. Uh, and that's just the facts. Uh, I do want to add a note of caution. Um, if we do not get cooperation from fishermen and we see that that we are not close to meeting our observer coverage requirements. Uh, and despite what some of the things that you've heard, we do attempt to do this. I mean, that is our goal. These are our goals and we strive for that. Um, but if we're, we see we're not close to meeting our observer, uh, observer coverage requirements, I have the authority to close this fishery via proclamation. So just a, as a note of caution there. Um, again, my main plea is that we all have a role commercial, recreational, division, commission, we all have a role in this. The division is basically all hands on deck for these very shortened seasons. Uh, and we will be focusing on monitoring and managing this fishery as it is going on. Um, and I'm asking for everyone listening and pass it on to people that you fish with and that you know, we're asking for your patience and your support and your compliance. And I'm asking that we all do our part uh, and let's try and recover this fishery together. It is hugely important. We, we certainly cannot, um, cannot overlook that or understate it, really. All right, so are there any questions this far? Commissioner Blant. Oh, just a few comments here about um, the, speaking about the observer coverage. I think the industry has tried to come forward a few times to adjust some of this um, miscommunication from commercial fishers to the observer program and maybe tried to bring it to the table to discuss some alternative ways um, to try to um, get more compliance. So um, while it was just said that commercial fishers may not uh, return phone calls or this or that, most commercial fishers are either crabbing, shrimping, or doing something else, and that could very well be the case. So I, I would caution sometimes the way things are put on record um, because there are certain situations where there are permit holders that do get called. Um, they may not answer the phone, but they might not have any landings of gill nets for that entire year, and, and they might even not even set a net. So I think there is room for communication here. I think there is um, possibility to make positive adjustments to the observer program to where the actual observer program does not have to actually call the fishermen per se. And this is just an example I'm gonna throw out there. The fisherman that is gonna set a net might have to might be able to call in if he's gonna if he's gonna set a net and and, and or something of the like. So I think 
the, the leadership of the community has in the past tried to reach out. There hasn't been any um, real interaction or communication set up to try to adjust any of that. And, and this is a real talking point for me because, you know, gill nets are real. We do have to come in compliance. We do have these ITPs. We're not the only industry that interacts with, with uh, endangered species. There's, there's many more, many more. And so, you know, we want to get it right. And this is the guidelines that we were given at the time that the, that the observer program was implemented. And we haven't really been able to come back to the table and, and make any adjustments for the better. And I think that is, that is something that needs to happen because um, certain groups, people um, heard comments last night questioning the ITPs and, 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 and having reservations and, and all, all of this misunderstanding could be cleared up a lot. Um, a lot of this, 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 this um, major effort by people calling fishers that might not even be fishing could be cleared up a lot. And, and be better use of their time somewhere else. So I think this is a subject that needs conversation. Um, I think, you know, the, the industry needs to sit down with, with, with the observer program and, and leadership in the division to start hashing some of this out because this is, this is nothing new. This, this has come around and it's been said many times. And, and it, quite frankly, we, we all can communicate with each other and, and, and we can all sit down at the table to find a better solution. And, and to give confidence to the general public that we are doing the right thing and that, that interactions have been kept to a minimum. And especially, especially since these regulations for flounder and striped bass and all of this has come into effect and there has been significant decrease in the amount of days that, that set net fisheries, especially anchored large mass gill nets, can be used. And, and, and there, was a, there was a number thrown out at one of the previous meetings that we only got like 30 some days out of the 365 days to set this, to have set nets. And, and so that's the reality of it. So I, I just, you know, I would caution the way this is portrayed. This is a complex issue. Yes, you might have quite a few permits issued, but how many of them permits are actually actively being used in a certain year, in certain times, at certain times when they people are called. And so, you know, I just want to very, very much encourage communication on this issue moving forward and, and, and maybe industry being able to sit down with division moving forward to make adjustments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Blanton. Any other questions right now? Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Director. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Good. Okay. Thank you, Director. Uh, so a question here. I, I know the lack of compliance with the ITP and the phone calls you know, the, the, the return calls and scheduling trips has been a problem since the inception of this ITP. Um, I've had discussions with staff over the years on this regarding the Estrin Gillnet permit, right? So it's free. And fishermen, myself being one of them, tend to hoard permits when they're free because you never know. Maybe one day it'll be limited entry. Maybe one day you'll need it. Having this really large pool of permit holders, does that make it harder to get through to the people who are actually fishing because it's harder to... I mean, how do you handle that? Would it be, is there any way you could weed down that permit list? Because a lot of people are getting it. I mean, I had one for a year just because it was free, right? So, so do you see what I'm asking? Yeah, is, I mean, because has there been any discussion about charging an administrative fee for the permit in such a way that you really, making people think about, should I, should I, should I get this if I'm not going to use it? Yeah, th thank you for those questions and comments. We are um, looking at a type of call-in system as we are looking at renewing our ITP application, and we are having internal discussions about what is the better way to put the onus on the fishermen uh, because it really does not work very well when the onus is on the division to make contact with the fishermen. So, yes, we, we are looking into that. And I will say that I am very comfortable with the comments that I made regarding noncompliance and the fishermen not cooperating. And I don't mean to harp on that, but that's the facts. And we need to encourage um, more communication. And I, I totally uh, understand what Commissioner Blanton is saying. There is a lot of miscommunication out there about the ITP. Uh, but 
um, just simply answering our phone calls would be a great step in the right direction. But hopefully the call-in system that staff is working on and we're talking about internally, once we get our, our new ITPs, hopefully that will help with uh, some of this compliance and will really put the, the onus on the fishermen to, to let us know that they're fishing. Uh, and really the best situation is to have a situation where, you know, if you haven't contacted the division, you, you, won't, you shouldn't be out there. Uh, and so we're looking at something to, to, to be akin to that that would help us better manage compliance. Anything else? Just a quick follow-up on that. Uh, council's checking on this. I was always under the impression that any time you charged for a license, it had to be approved by the General Assembly. Council thinks possibly rulemaking could do that, but we're going to get a little clarity on that. D might know some history on that, anyone? So okay. for a license, that is correct. You have some authority to charge for permits through rulemaking, I believe. And it's it's capped, so you have to and you have to do the phys, you're going to have to do the physical analysis and go through the whole rulemaking process. So there is that ability, and it's it's quite complex. I think there was only one permit we ever tried to go through there, and it wasn't very successful. Now limiting permits would be very much like um, limited entry, so that would go back through the general assembly. But right. it's a tool out there. I always say, you know, limiting number of permits, number of licenses. You know, through a plan or something, if you have reason, go to the General Assembly and ask. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, just to clarify my comments there, if I, I mean, I'm trying to remember the numbers off my head, but with this free permit, I want to say there's maybe approximately 2,000, 1,800 permit holders. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, I think it's in the two, is it in the 2,000 range? Thereabouts. Yeah, I mean, it's not the exact number, but if I remember correctly, maybe less than 60% are actually fishing large mesh, right? So, I mean, that, I, and I look at this just from a pragmatic standpoint, is how do you weed down the people that are just going to get this free permit? Not as a way to do limited entry, but just, you know, and I know, you know, we've had the discussion about the administrative, you know, through the rulemaking process, administrative fee before. So, you know, that's where, just to clarify. Yeah, and I, I, I totally understand that because we've had the same conversations like how do we just get that list of 600, 500, 700, 800 guys and ladies that are fishing and not actually just getting the permit to have the permit. So it's definitely discussions that we're, we're having. Okay, Commissioner McNeil. Yeah, I mean, could you say if a fisherman's going to fish more than X amount of days and he's required to call in for an observer? So like every 10, 10 or 20 or whatever the number is, how many are – how many ever trips he does, yes, required to have an observer at least once. So that way he has to call in and initiate that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are all uh, viable options as we look to um, establishing some sort of system that, again, puts the onus on the fishermen. Um, Barbie, do you, just you can tell me no if you don't, but do you have off the top of your head the phone call data that we talk about and how many phone calls we actually make for a trip? All right. Hi, everyone. I look forward to talking with you soon. Um, so just so you know, one of the things that we do is we work with license and statistics section, and we distill all the EG and P holders for those that have fished over the last three years. So we don't call every permit holder. We call only those that have fished over the last three years. So we do narrow down that focus, and, and that's a good, a good question because it's certainly something that needs to be done. We, we make approximately 1,100 calls every year, every ITP year, to schedule trips. Um, and I cannot remember the numbers, but if you look in your annual and seasonal reports, you'll see that the number of return phone calls and the times that we schedule is really low. Yeah, and again, I, I don't mean to harp on that that issue, but it is an issue, and it's something to Commissioner Blanton's point that we will we'll communicate about, and we can we are certainly looking to try and improve 
on that and to increase compliance. Okay. Anything else on this issue right now? Okay, if not, Director. Okay, thank you. Uh, so moving on to talk a little bit about striped bass. Uh, shoot, striped bass, not that, not yet. Striped mullet uh, management update. Uh, at your last, last meeting, uh, staff presented the results of the 2022 striped mullet um, stock assessment uh, that indicated the stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. The terminal year of that stock assessment was 2019. And completing the stock assessment is really the initial step into to the fishery management plan review. And based on the results and in the interest of the long-term viability of the fishery, my plan uh, is to review this information with DEQ Secretary Beiser and request approval for the development of temporary management measures to supplement the existing fishery management plan. So basically, I would like to uh, request approval for development of a supplement. The current striped bat, the current striped mullet fishery management plan does not have any adaptive management built in that would allow the commission to immediately address the immediately address the new stock assessment results. Uh, so a supplement would be the best approach for doing this. Uh, you, you've approved plans. You've seen that we're kind of going in the direction of having adaptive management. We have it in striped bass. Whereas if we update our assessment, we immediately and we're overfishing we immediately uh, take F back to target. And we are trying to build this adaptive management into all of our fishery management plans so that we can act uh, in a more timely way. You can act in a more timely way, um, but we don't have that built into the current strike mullet a set of FMP, but we will be looking to build that in as we amend this um, FMP in the future. Uh, if Secretary Beiser approves the development of the supplement, we would bring you a draft at your November meeting. So uh, based on the preliminary timeline, we would expect if everything goes smoothly, which I have no doubt that it will, uh, we would uh, approve, you would approve um, that in, at your February 2023 meeting. That's just a preliminary timeline. And I want to just remind the commission that the striped mullet fishery, like many of our fisheries, is very diverse. The summer fishery, fall fishery, bait fishery, row fishery is, is all over the place. And a supplement is not designed to address all of these fisheries and solve all of the potential issues that need addressing. The FMP amendment is designed for that. So the supplement is just designed as a stopgap measure to get something in place to address overfishing while we are developing the fishery management plan for your approval. So this, just very preliminarily, our discussions internally have really been about a season closure. That, that has been, you know, one of the options that we have been, that we've keyed on in our internal discussions, which again are very pre preliminary and we just, you know, want to, to do this um, supplement to get management in place sooner rather than later. Now, if this commission says, you know, no, Cat, we don't want to do a supplement, then I need to know that now because when the, if, the, if the secretary approves a supplement, then it really falls squarely on the commission uh, to, it, she is approving it for the commission uh, to, to do. So it is squarely within this, this body's wheelhouse to do that. So unless there is objection to that approach, um, that is what we will what we will plan to do uh, and discuss this information with the secretary. And she has not. We have not discussed this with her at this point. Does anybody have any problems with CAP pursuing the possibility of having a supplement? First try. Yes. Thank you, Director. Um, would you mind giving any feedback on what your discussions are regarding what the supplemental management measures could? Um, or is it too early to ask that question? Um, it, it, it probably is. I mean, really, the only the m main things that we have discussed is a season closure, uh, which would just, I believe, our only discussion has been really just lopping off part of the season um, where for the row fishery. So again, th that would not address. It wouldn't address equally across fisheries, um, and, and there's lots of concerns about that as well. Um, that where there has been some discussions about. Uh, trip limits uh, and having conversations with fishermen that actually participate in these fisheries, not sure that that would be really a viable 
a viable option just to discard concern uh, would, would obviously be something that is that we would be con concerned about so really that has been you know we haven't had a whole lot of discussion about it but that's pretty much been what our discussions uh, have been and if we so I kind of struggle with this a little bit like do we ask for input you know what kind of options people would like to see here but I think really first we have to get approval to do it, which is the first step. We could bring back what we feel like are the viable potential stopgap measures. And then in November, when we bring it back, obviously, if the commission would like us to add things, um, we could do that at that point before we take it out for public comment. I don't We are not statutorily required to uh, have a 30-day public comment, but we, we, we usually... Um, do some sort of public comment and we will uh, take it out for public. That's just the way we like to do it and we would we would probably do that as well. So that's kind of the way I'm figuring this may go. Okay. Commissioner Rader. Uh, th thank you, Director. Would you re remind us how this interacts with the amendment that then would, the timing relative to the amendment that would then follow so that, and, and whether going forward with the supplement, giving your resources then affects the timing of the amendment? So, yes, sir, we, we've had those discussions as well, and our, we really discussed whether or not we should just put the amendment on hold, you know, while we worked on the supplement, but we think we can do both. So we are in the very early stages of amendment development. Our first, is, first thing that we will do is go out for scoping, where we go out and ask the public what they would like to see uh, in the FMP as we develop the amendment. And staff, please remind me when the scoping is slated for. So we already have that scheduled. I just can't remember exactly when, it, or I think we do. So this is something you'll hear from me about a little bit later today. Um, scoping will be the last week of September, first week of October. Um, and the, it, as the director said, it's imperative for this amendment that we have participation of all of the stakeholders. So that's something I'm really focusing on. Um, and the um, timeline should not be impacted at all by the supplement process. Um, I'm working diligently with the leads to get all of this in order um, and at the same time have the public be aware of the differences between the supplement, which as the director said is temporary action that may or may not be included in the amendment and then the amendment which is the overall arching what we want to see in the fishery. And so could you take that window then out to closure? So what, what would be the time course of the completion of the amendment and how do they interact? In other words, are there seasons? How many seasons would you expect the supplement to address in the different key parts of the fishery? You know what I'm getting at. So, yeah, and I think together? if we went with a season closure, uh, one season, Potentially two, depending on the timeline of the amendment, uh, we would we would impact with the supplement. Uh, the supplement would impact maybe one one for sure, maybe two. Um, there, we we've had these discussions about how long a supplement takes because it does still take a while. And after we met originally, I said, after the staff left, I said, "There's no way it'll take this long." And I went back and looked at the calendar, and for sure, it just does. I mean, in the meeting schedule, obviously, and um, so I think one season, maybe two, that we would impact with a supplement. And yes. just to add on yes. to that, um, your timeline, the timeline for mullet, um, will come to you with the scoping. Um, so. At the November meeting, currently, we are intending to bring you scoping. Um, so you would then have the timeline of what the optimal timing of that amendment would be for the division's plans. And you would also have the goal and objectives at that time, and then be able to give the commission's input on scoping. Okay. And, and I think just to that point um, that Corinne just made about and she spoke about it just a little bit earlier, it's just a tr really a struggle to try and make sure that the public is not super confused by those items going on the same track. And we, we recognize that there is a potential for that, but in my opinion, 
I think it's more important to get management in place sooner rather than later, and particularly since we're working on data from 2019, uh, and it'll be 2023 before we can potentially get that management in place. I just think it's it, it's the way to go, but I do share the concerns about the confusion for the public and really make an effort to try and keep that straight. And with proper education, maybe they'll learn better what we do and how we do things. So could be a good upside to it. Uh, Commissioner Roller. I just want to um, voice my support for the direction the director and staff is going on this. Um, it will have some confusion, but the stock is in bad shape. And this is the sort of necessary stopgap measure that the supplemental process was put in place for, correct? So it's, it's needed. And I think that this would hopefully prevent us from making even harder choices in the given the, the time frame of the amendment process. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Commissioner Bland. Um, strike mullet fishery is a very complex Make sure your mic's on. It's on. Is that okay? Strike mullet fishery is fairly complex. Um, and while I'm not saying I do not support some, so, some sort of supplemental action, I don't feel, feel like the supplemental action should get too far into the weeds. And, and I'm going to say this, um, that a seasonal closure based on a row mullet fishery is very one-sided, um, which is normally how it goes. However, those fish have probably spawned a time or two um, and, and you're catching the, the most mature fish um, at the time when you are row mullet fishing based on the size of the mesh of the net and, and the size of the fish that you're catching. Um, let's, I want to point out a few things about the fishery while we're sitting here talking about it for a few minutes, but, um, recreational fishers tend to use extremely juvenile fish that have not had the chance to spawn for bait, um, which creates a big ordeal about, um, maturity and, and recruitment into the fishery. And how 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 much how much of that juvenile fish has come out of the fishery before those fish have even had time to uh, enter the spawning the spawning stock spawning spawning stock biomass? Excuse me. Um, so that's one reservation I have. I want to point out that you know some of the new commissioners might not understand the fishery altogether, and so I encourage to um, educate yourself a little bit. Um, I have a couple questions. What would be the required reduction that you're looking to achieve, and when would the stock assessment be updated with new data? So I, I, uh, we have talked about this internally as well, and I think we're looking at a range that would um, address the overfishing. So I think it's between 20 and 30 percent uh, range of, of reduction. Again, we, we haven't talked about this a whole lot, except for the fact that we, we do want to pursue this, so we're going to have to get our thoughts together. But I think a range uh, out there that would address overfishing is what we would be looking at, it, it con, um, including. And then what was the second question? An um, update would like to the stock assessment oh. and data update, because you said you were working on 2019. So if, if, in, a, if in a reality... You update a stock assessment or redo a stock, stock assessment every five years, then then there's five years of data that's going to be missing. Um, and then there's a lot of questions I have about what data is being used within the stock assessment. I understand I've heard heard when that 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 some data might have been collected that's been left out. Um, that's a concern to me, and and that's why I say doing a supplement to me is is really sticky. And I I actually witnessed this with the Southern Founder stuff. And what happened was the division brought brought recommendations, and then the commission felt like their recommendations took precedent over that. And, and so you got in this 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 hamster wheel, and, and everybody started chiming in, and all of a sudden it was a great big mess. And then all of a sudden it was on the judge's desk, and so there was a lot of work done, a lot of time wasted, when all these people had all kinds of different ideas on how they wanted to manage something, and and, and so. With, with Southern Flounder being the example, 
it took us a really long time to get to where we were with Southern Founder because the supplement clouded everything up so much. And so, I, you know, I just caution, throw caution, and I wouldn't throw caution to the wind here. You know, it, it, it needs to be addressed very simply. It needs to be a measure that, a feel, not a feel-good measure, but it needs to be a measure that is, is, is going to be consistent with simplicity and, and that what could, could lead to reductions and allow some escapement of some mature, of some mature fish. And, and it doesn't need to get in the weeds of gear. It doesn't need to get in the weeds of, 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 of user groups and who's doing what and why and where just yet because this is a very complex fishery. A lot of people access this fishery, both commercially and recreationally. I don't think we have a good idea how, how much the recreational impact's having because we don't know how many people are out there throwing cast nets picking up two or 300 mullets that are this big, that, that, are, that are not even recruited into the spawning stock biomass yet. And so that, that's a big deal. And, and, and that's just, you know, trying to understand where this is going to go. I just, I just caution that we not get it too far into the weeds if, if, this, if we decide to move forward with this and, and keep it fairly simple and, and not make a big deal out of how, how large the list is and, and make a big wish list that, every, that, that each individual might have. And so those are my concerns um, moving forward with a supplement. Um, and and uh, there's, there's even more complex questions that I have that I don't think we have um, answers to, like has there been a tagging study done? Is this a coast-wide stock? It, what, uh, what, if it is a coast-wide stock, how much are the other states um, contributing to this? And so, you know, it just goes so much deeper, and a supplement should just should be kept very simple, in my opinion. And, and that's just based on the history of what I know about these supplements and, and how they've interacted, um, <laughs> how they've been implemented or tried to be implemented or built in the past and how they, the success of them, which, is, which hasn't been very well. Um, and so those are my concerns. And so that's why I say, what would the required reduction be? And when would, this, the, when would it be updated with new data? And, and then, you know, allowing the actual amendment process to, to move forward um, paral in parallel is, is probably gonna be paramount because we need a lot of questions answered because I don't think we have a clear vision on how many people are actually accessing this accessing this fishery, and the amount of um, fish that are juvenile that aren't getting a, a chance to spawn, versus um, how many fish are spawning, versus how many times those fish have actually gone out and spawned the mature fish that we're catching on the back end of the row fishery. Um, so it's just a lot in my mind about it, and I just I just encourage that we keep it very simple and try to um, come up with a decision, a majority decision, but keep it, keep it very simple and something that, that, that can be done and implemented without a lot of headache, if that makes any sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Um, a couple points of clarification. I, I do understand and appreciate the comments regarding the long ago flounder supplement. I do think it's fair to point out that that was a different circumstance. There was a stock assessment not usable for management, and the stock was in dire shape, and uh, it was trying to put a management plan in together, um, which when we're dealing with flounder is always complicated. Um, though had all of that been implemented, it is fair to assume that we may not be dealing with some of the, the uh, steep restrictions we have today. Um, though I do want to kind of go back to your comments regarding the recreational use of mullet. I think it's important to point out, because we have discussed this on the record before, that we have two species of mullet in North Carolina. We have a, a white mullet and we have a striped mullet. The white mullet are the primary bait fish. And since we have Dan at the table, I was, didn't want to put him on the spot, but he came up there to sit down. Do you have, uh, um, do you know what percentage of the recreational catch is white mullet versus striped mullet? So there was a study done by the DMF in the early 2000s that looked at that specifically. Um, and so that data was actually incorporated into the most recent stock assessment. So it's about 29% is striped mullet um, in the recreational harvest based on that study. Uh, to get to some of Commissioner Blanton's points about the amount of mullet um, harvested in the recreational fishery. So we did include that information in the most recent stock assessment. Um, 
then that's based on MRIP data and then the, the information from that the CastNet study that we did. So that is included in the stock assessment. We do have estimates of the recreational harvest. Um, and as part of the assessment, we also did sensitivity runs where we varied the level of recreational harvest uh, that was included in the stock assessment. So we upped it and lowered it um, to see what effect that would have on the model uh, results. Um, and it really has very little effect um, regardless of what the level of recreational harvest was. Um, Mr. Roller. Oh, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, just a couple follow-ups there. So about 30% of the recreational harvest of whatever people do with mullet bait or eat them is white mullet, or is striped mullet. Um, and our fishing license has a, uh, when you get your fishing license, it does ask you if you use cast nets or beach seines to help with MREP sampling, correct? So, um, what percentage of the overall catch is recreational? It's pretty low. Like uh, I can't remember the exact percentage off the top of my head, but it's le probably less than, it's less than 5%. Yeah. Okay. I think last time we said it was like less than 3% or 1% yeah, or something lot, like that. Yeah. So almost insignificant. Okay. Commissioner Blanton. Uh, d d let's, can I get some clarification on, on what you're talking about here? Are you talking about on, based on numbers or are you based on pounds? Because, and, and because that's a big deal. You know, you, you can take mullets that are this big and throw them all in a pile right there in the floor, and, and then you can take mullets that are this big, and you're not going to fill, you can, you're going to fill this room up, you're going to fill every room up, and still have the same number of individuals sitting in that pile as it is individuals this big filling up the whole building. So let's, let's just understand a little bit about more about what we're talking about here based on numbers or by weight. Then let's talk about the contribution that the little mullets are not contributing to the spawning stock biomass. And let's talk about the contribution of the row mullets and how many times they have actually gone and left and, and spawned. So th this, that's what I say, you can have discussions and it's absolutely pertinent that you have these discussions. But there's a difference between supplemental discussions and there's a difference between amendment discussions. And, and so you can easily get in the weeds when talking about wanting to manage something based on recreational or commercial or whatever if you don't understand, one, what you're measuring things in, or two, um, what numbers are being thrown at you based on how those units are being measured? So I just, I, can I get some more clarity on what you're talking about here? What's your question? Are we talking about pounds or individuals? Okay. So MRIB, uh, measure, it's using individuals, number of individuals is its, uh, is its measure. Um, most of the striped mullet that are are, or mullet that are, are harvested in the recreational fishery, they're using them as bait. So you're absolutely right. What you're getting a lot of the recreational harvest is those finger mullet. And so um, a lot of those are being used as bait and they're never being seen by our, our, our samplers. Um, we do have length frequency information from uh, various DMF studies and then minimal uh, information from actual MRIP intercepts. Um, so we have that length frequency information, and then we can apply a weight to that uh, to those lengths. So little tiny fish, really small weight. So you might be getting a large number of individuals that are harvested, but the weight is pretty low. Exactly, that's what I say. And so, just to, just to follow up, it's, all, it's 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 pertinent to understand the amount of individuals based on each fishery. Um, and how they're being used and how those individuals have contributed to the spawning stock and, and have they been recruited. And so I just, I just, caught, I just caution that, that this supplement, if it, is, if it is approved to move forward, we, we look at it in the most simple backstop approach that it can be and not dig into the weeds too far and let, let, the, let the digging into the weeds talk be left to the amendment. And, and that's, that, that's my concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other discussion right now? Uh, does anybody not want the division to start pursuing a supplement? I think you have the point of clarification. Yes. Is, is that going to take a motion? I mean, is it? I, I, I'm just no. trying to understand. No, they just want to make sure that 
they're I not mean, wasting their time doing a supplement that we right now know we're going to vote down or not approve. Is that? I think I'm just trying to understand. I mean, sure, you can bring you can bring the commission yeah. anything, right? But right. Um, I think it's for you know, it's hard to say that anybody's going to make a decision right now based on something they haven't seen, yeah. and so. That's why I'm asking point of clarification on on would it take a motion to um, create this this action or what? Yeah, you're just looking for just some direction from us that we think you ought to look into pers to pursuing a supplement. Is that it yeah. in a nutshell? Yes, sir. That's it. And I mean, I understand Commissioner Blanton's concern uh, if we do all this and then we and the secretary first of all, the secretary has to approve it. And then we develop this and bring it to the commission, and then you're not interested in a supplement. Um, I might be salty at that point, but, I mean, I'd get over it and we'd move on. But hopefully, you know, we just w want to make sure that this is so something that we're all kind of on board with that we want to pursue. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with your comments about not getting into the weeds on the supplement and the problems that we ran into with Southern Flounder. And we, we, we have no intentions of getting into the weeds. Is that good? Okay, is there anybody who does not want the division to look into a supplement? Okay, I think you have our endorsement to look into a supplement. Okay. Thank you for that, and, and we'll be putting together uh, something, um, some information to take to the secretary for her approval of that, which is our first step. So thank you all for that. <clears throat> and that's good discussion about, about strike mullet. Um, so well, moving on. I do have a, a number of speakers to bring up today, and I'm going to start with um, asking Deputy Director D. Lupton to give you an update on the federal economic assistance programs that staff has been working on. Good morning. Um, welcome to new commissioners. Um, I am Dee Lupton. I'm the division deputy director, um, and I'm going to be providing an update to the federal um, fishery disaster program related to uh, Hurricane Florence. Um, for some background, um, and as previously I reported to uh, some of y'all, um, in 2018, Governor Cooper requested the federal government to declare North Carolina a federal commercial fishery disaster due to uh, fishery disaster resources um, caused by Hurricane Florence. Uh, NOAA granted that federal fishery um, disaster declaration in December of 2018. Um, and that transpired a bunch of events. They had to do a study and we had to put together a spending plan. It took a while. They approved our spending plan last December 2021 for $7.7 .7 million of uh, disaster spending for associated impacts from Hurricane Florence. Uh, we initiated this program in March, um, and ap with applications, we opened up the application process, and they had to be submitted by um, April 18th. So how we went about with this program, um, it, it, only certain stakeholders could apply. Um, we, d we mailed 1,239 application packages to eligible licensed seafood dealers, ocean fishing piers, and the four hire operators that we had licensed with us. Um, bait and tackle shops um, were also, could also apply. We tried to call them and inform them of the relief program. We issued news releases. Um, we um, put application instructions and materials were also available on our website and at our offices. So we tried to get information out to those who were not, we did not have license holders for. Um, commercial fishermen and aquaculture operations were compensated by the state-funded uh, Hurricane Florence program right after the storm, um, so they were not eligible for this program. Um, we tried to hit all stakeholders. Um, the applicants had to d demonstrate a loss of revenue in the months of September, October, and November of 2018 um, relative to the previous three-year Revenue average during the same time period, the pre th basically the three um, previous years um, compared to what they had after um, 2018. Um, applicants had an option to claim loss of revenue 
and or damages. Um, some claim for both options, some claim for one or the other option. Um, so all final applications and appeals require a final determination before any funds can be issued because the funds will be allocated based on the proportion or the percentage of eligible claim loss in relation to all the eligible stakeholders in that category um, up to 100%. We can't compensate anybody over more than what they lost. Um, so we're just about complete with this program. Um, we received and preliminary approved um, all applications. We have, um, we're still waiting on one appeal, um, but that'll be it. Um, so I'm gonna go over some numbers real quickly. They're preliminary because we, we do have some outstanding items out there. Um, so when I say these people have been, these stakeholders have been approved, it's either they were approved for revenue or damages or both. It's hard to separate them real quickly. So seafood dealers and processors, we had 68 applicants. Um, preliminarily, the number approved is 63. Um, the assistance awarded to this group will be around $6.5 million dollars. They were the largest group that had the biggest impact according to the NOAA study. For higher fishing operations, we had uh, 26 applicants, 20 were approved um, for about $454,000. Fishing piers, we had five applicants and five were approved for around $349,000. And bait and tackle shops, we had four apply, three were approved for around $267,000. Um, like I said, we're waiting on, on an appeal and then we'll basically wrap this program up. Once we finish that, um, the information will be forwarded to our department, financial services, they do the check writing for us um, and they will mail it to the applicants. Um, so we're anticipating these checks to be in the mail in September. Um, so I hope this actually serves as the last assistance program update for a while. Um, I do want to go over to give you a big picture of what we've been doing the past four years. Um, really, since Hurricane Florence 2018, we've administered four economic uh, assistance or relief programs. The first one was the state appropriated Hurricane Florence Commercial Fishery Assistance Program that awarded over $11.4 million to 1,176 licensed commercial fishermen, North Carolina fishermen. Um, that was, uh, they were awarded in 2019. Then came COVID, <laughs> and there were a couple of programs the federal government implemented uh, through the states. The federal CARES One program provided over $5.2 million in assistance to 197 eligible commercial fishermen and marine aquaculture operations for higher fishing operations and seafood dealers and processors. We finished that program in 2021. The federal Hurricanes Two program, um, pro provided over $4.3 million to 265 eligible stakeholders. We uh, issued those checks earlier this year. And then this federally funded disaster relief program for Hurricane Florence will award a, around $7.6 million to around 91 stakeholders. Again, those are preliminary numbers, but uh, they're, they're pretty close. So that's a total of $28.5 million over the past four years, or really the three years that uh, we worked on. Um, it's a small number of staff who've been doing these programs. It's the same staff who does all these programs, um, primarily licensed statistics staff, um, some administrative and maintenance services staff, EIT help, um, Marine Patrols helped us do some verification, habitat enhancements helped us with verificate for some verification. But um, we've been doing this um, throughout COVID. <laughs> so I, I want to thank all the staff and I think they hope that this is the last program for a while too. <laughs> because um, we're doing everything else. Um, we hired a couple of temporaries, but really most of the analysis has to be done with staff who's familiar with the fisheries, familiar with the data and so forth. Um, so that's all I have for economic assistance programs. Okay, great work. Commissioner Roller. So just a few questions, Dee. Um, so when you gave the approved numbers for each category is that the total of the money or is those approvals higher than what was allocated to each category? Does that make, we had this so discussion at the last Maybe meeting. this will answer your question. Um, so money was allocated based on the federal um, economic um, analysis of impacts by mm -hmm. stakeholders. So we used their breakdown. Mm -hmm. 
to divide up the money. For two categories, we met 100% of the, of the need of, of the request. So um, I can't remember how much we allocated for bait and tackle shops, but they applied and they asked for money up to $267,000, and we were able to award all that. And there was some excess money left okay. over, so they went to the um, other categories that we did, had unmet needs, and we will still have unmet needs there. So which categories had the unmet needs? The four hire category, had uh, we met 100% of their needs or requests, okay. and the um, bait and tackle shops. Um, we had 100, um, we met 100%, meaning we can't award any more because we, that's all they requested. So, like, just or to, were approved. For. So, just to kind of, for, for my own thought process, they asked for 454 and for hire, but there was more money originally allocated. So you meant 100 percent. Yeah. So it okay, goes just back. And, that, and our plan has specified how that money would be divided up mm -hmm. if we met that 100 percent. Okay. Because no one can be um, made more than whole. Um, and you had to be approved. Some people actually applied, and they actually had an increase in income, but they applied for a loss of income. So, you know, and, and that's okay. You know, they were Fair enough. applied. So, I mean, you know, it's obviously the pandemic got in the way of this program because Florence was 2019, correct? And, um, you know, I was disappointed to see, like, the lack of higher applications because probably a lot of people that really needed that money may be out of the business by now. Um, is this going to help us be nor nimbler? Heaven forbid we have a bad storm again. I'm sure it's happening. You know, it's, say say <laughs> that again. So, like, is the, is our process with this going to make us more nimbler in the future in case we have another fisheries disaster due to a natural disaster? So, This federal program, I would say no. Okay. Because in reality, we were able to do direct payments with this program. If you read some of the Magnuson-Stevens Act on federal fishery, we're actually supposed to provide money that makes um, stakeholders more sustainable, which may be more like investment in infrastructure. I think CARES actually helped this program because we did direct payments and right on the heels of CARES, so they approved that because CARES was direct payments. But there was a thought that they may not approve direct payments, and um, it could be something else. I don't know, I'm, you know, investing in generators for dealers or stuff like that. I didn't want to do that, you know, because this, that would actually be very hard to administer. Um, so I don't, it, it does kind of lay the groundwork for future disasters um, because we've done it now. Um, other states who've had federal fishery disasters that have occurred before Hurricane Florence are still waiting for their spending plans to be approved. Wow. So um, the federal government, I, I would say CARES delayed this a little bit, but in reality, I don't know if it really did. <laughs> and the federal government's had a couple of um, congressional hearings about trying to speed up this process. Um, I don't know what's ever resulted in those. But, but just thank you for your diligence yeah. on this program. So. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Thank you and your staff I, for I all the I do have work. one other thing before I leave. Okay, great. Um, totally different subject. Um, so um, WRC is going to be updating their Alvin system for um, issuing boat registrations, uh, hunting licenses, fishing licenses, and some of those fishing licenses are cruffled. They've just awarded a contract. Um, so we will be working with them for the cruffle portion, you know, just making sure that all the requirements are captured in the new system. From a public standpoint, this should see seamless. It's all, you know, the programming behind it. Um, you know, uh, they, they do plan on rolling it out. It's a very aggressive schedule by July of next year. Um, you know, those who are sales agents, they may see a different interface. I don't know what it's going to look like, but um, um, the staff, that's been working on these economic programs are shifting very quickly and working with WRC on um, testing and, and stuff. We'll have a minor role in it. They're just keep, uh, but WRC is keeping us very well informed in that process. So. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Director, we're about halfway through the morning session. Why don't we take a 10 minute break before we continue on? 10 minutes back here at. Quarter till 11.
We got about a minute left. Please, everybody, be coming on back in. Do you want me to send them in? If you want to. Okay. I've done it before. Well. Director, the agenda is in your lap. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris Bat Savage, uh, who is the executive assistant for councils and serves as the director's proxy uh, on the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council. Uh, he is he's going to update you on their activities. And just as a reminder um, to some of the information that Laura gave during your orientation yesterday, it's really through these councils and commissions that we cooperate uh, with other states to manage our shared uh, migratory fishery resources in state and federal waters. So, uh, Chris, if you want to go ahead with your report. Thank, thank you, Kat. And uh, 
I welcome the new commissioners. As Kat said, my name is Chris Batsavage. I serve as the director's proxy on the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, in your brief materials, uh, you'll have the uh, you have the meeting summaries from the June Mid-Atlantic Council meeting and the August ASMFC meeting. Uh, as usual, I'll just uh, hit the highlights uh, from those meetings, uh, and when I'm done with that, I'll finish up with just an update on uh, proposed uh, rulemaking for uh, right whales. Uh, that impacts a lot of different fisheries and industries. So, while, I'm, while, I have, while I have the mic, I'll just go ahead and cover that as well. So. Start with the uh, Mid-Atlantic Council meeting, um, and in that meeting, I'll cover uh, the Recreational Harvest Control Rule Framework and Addenda. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council and ASMFC's Policy Board took final action on the Recreational Harvest Control Rule Framework and Addenda. Uh, the goal of this uh, action is to establish a process for setting regulations for summer flounder, scup, black sea bass, and bluefish to prevent overfishing or reflective of the stock status. Uh, appropriately account for uncertainty in the recreational data, take into consideration angler preference, and provide an appropriate level of stability and predictability in changes from year to year. These changes include a new process for setting recreational bag size and season limits and modifications to recreational accountability measures. The Council and Policy Board considered a range of management options and ultimately selected the percent change approach with an agreement to continue development of several other options for possible implementation by 2026. Under the selected approach, uh, managers will consider how recreational harvest compares to the recreational harvest limits and will uh, consider the most recent stock size estimate compared to the target stock size when determining whether recreational measures uh, should be restricted, liberalized, or remain unchanged for the next two years. These factors will also determine the amount of reduction or, or liberalization of harvest uh, that, that could occur. Uh, under this approach, uh, changes will be considered every other year when stock assessments are available. Um, the uh, framework and addendas uh, changes to the recreational management program will be used to develop the 2023 recreational measures for summer flounder, scup, and black sea bass, assuming that NOAA Fisheries approves the framework for federal waters management in time. However, the new process will not be used uh, for bluefish until that stock is declared rebuilt. Okay, so I'll move on to uh, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission meeting, and uh, first I'll cover uh, striped bass. Uh, the Striped Bass Management Board met to provide guidance to the Technical Committee on responding to the 2022 stock assessment if a reduction is needed to achieve stock rebuilding. Uh, just as a reminder for everyone, uh, direct ASMC management of striped bass in North Carolina only applies to fish caught in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the management action does not apply to the state's estuarine striped bass populations. The uh, 2022 stock assessment update is currently in progress uh, with ex results expected in October. If the 2022 assessment indicates there is less than a 50% chance of rebuilding the stock by 2029 and at least a 5% reduction in removals is needed to uh, achieve rebuilding, then the, the board may adjust management measures uh, via board action and instead of uh, developing an addendum, which would take longer to implement. The guidance provided to the technical committee includes methods for splitting the potential reductions between the recreational and commercial fisheries, changes to the recreational slot limit, a maximum size limit for Chesapeake Bay, and recreational season closures. The technical committee will provide the board with a set of potential options to achieve the reduction if, if one's needed, for consideration at their uh, annual meeting uh, later this fall um, alongside the, uh, the stock assessment results. The board uh, agreed that if a reduction is needed, the board vote to select final measures would occur at a special uh, striped bass board meeting held by a webinar um, sometime in December. The board also uh, at this meeting considered next steps for the draft addendum to uh, consider allowing voluntary commercial quota transfers in the ocean region uh, between jurisdictions that still have a commercial quota. The board discussed concerns about quota transfers raised by the plan development team, uh, and the board requested the plan development team to conduct additional analyses to um, address these concerns. Additionally, the board uh, added provisions to the range of options to consider allowing the board to set certain parameters for quota transfers each year. Plan development team will revise the draft addendum per the board's guidance, and the board will consider the revised draft addendum uh, document uh, for public comment at either their 2022 annual meeting in November or the uh, 2023 winter meeting. 
Okay, next up is Atlantic Menhaden. Uh, the Atlantic Menhaden Board reviewed the results of the 2022 Atlantic Menhaden Stock Assessment Update. Uh, the single species stock assessment update indicates that the stock is not overfished nor experiencing overfishing relative to the current ecological reference points that were developed from the multi-species stock assessment. Work is underway for an Atlantic Menhaden specific ecological reference point benchmark stock assessment, which is scheduled uh, for completion in 2025. The board also uh, approved dra draft addendum one to amendment three to the uh, Menhaden FMP for public comment. This addendum uh, considers changes to the commercial allocations, uh, the episodic, episodic set aside program, and the incidental catch and small scale fisheries provision. The options in the draft addendum are designed to align state quotas with recent landings uh, and resource availability while maintaining access to the resource for all states, reduce the dependence on quota transfers, and minimize regulatory discards. The draft addendum is posted on ASMFC's website, and the public hearing schedule should be posted soon with hearings taking place next month. And North Carolina has requested a uh, public hearing uh, to be held in Washington. Uh, the board is then scheduled to take final action on the addendum at the annual meeting in November. Okay, next I'll uh, cover Spot and Croker. Uh, the Cyan is Management Board reviewed the results of the uh, 2022 traffic light analyses for Spot and Croker. The traffic light analyses assigned uh, a color, either red, yellow, or green, to categorize relative levels of indicators based on the condition of the uh, fish population, which is the abundance metric, or the fishery, which is the harvest metric. The uh, traffic light analyses use uh, recreational and commercial landings for uh, the harvest metric and several fishery independent surveys for the abundance metric. States implemented uh, measures for management measures for spot and croaker in 2021 in response to the traffic light analyses that, uh, that indicated that both species triggered at the 30% red threshold. Uh, at this meeting, the board agreed with the Spot and Croker Technical Committee's uh, recommendations to maintain the current management measures in 20, for 2023 due to missing information from fishery independent surveys over the last few years and the lack of additional concerns in the available data. Okay, and as promised, I'll finish up with uh, information on the right whale vessel strike reduction proposed rule. Uh, NOAA Fisheries uh, announced a proposed rule to modify the North Atlantic right whale vessel speed regulations. Proposed changes would expand the mandatory speed restrictions of 10 knots or less in designated areas of, of the ocean to include most vessels between 35 and 65 feet in length and broaden the spatial boundaries and time into the seasonal speed restrictions along the U.S. East Coast. The proposed rule would not apply to vessels that are less than 35 feet long. The uh, following are the proposed boundaries of the seasonal management areas that would impact North Carolina. Uh, so from Wilmington to north of Kill Devil Hills, uh, the proposed uh, uh, area would be from November 1st to April 30th. From Wilmington to north of Brunswick, Georgia, it would be from November uh, 1st to April 15th. And from north of Kill Devil Hills to Cape Ann, Massachusetts, uh, which is basically Gloucester, Massachusetts, uh, November 1st through May 30th. Most of the areas uh, in North Carolina extend to 20 nautical miles offshore and the area north of Kill Devil Hills extended a little farther offshore than that. The proposed rule will also create a dynamic, uh, a dynamic speed zone framework to implement mandatory speed restrictions when whales are known to be present outside of the active seasonal management areas. Uh, north Atlantic right whales are approaching extinction with fewer than 350 individuals and fewer than 100 reproductively active females remaining. Collisions with vessels are contributing to the species uh, continued decline and changes to federal uh, vessel speed regulations are needed to further reduce the likelihood of right whale deaths and serious injuries. Changes to the existing speed regulations are uh, essential to st uh, stabilizing the uh, ongoing right whale population decline and to prevent the species extinction. Public comments on the uh, proposed rule must be submitted by September 30th. Uh, an information webinar will also be held uh, next Wednesday, August 24th, from uh, 6 to 7.30 p.m. to answer questions about the proposed rule. And uh, we can provide information on submitting comments or participating in this uh, information webinar to anyone who is interested. And that, uh, that concludes uh, my update. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Commissioner Roller. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion this morning regarding the, uh, the proposed rule for the um, uh, for the right whales. How does that apply to vessels greater than 65 feet? 
they they are they already have speed restrictions. Um, I think they're 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 more focused in terms of um, like around the ports and if uh, if whales are detected in that area, they have to go ten knots. Um, but uh, I think this proposed rule, if I understand it correctly, is going to broaden that, so they'll also be be covered in this. I think the the, the big one is though that uh, you know vessels that were less than 65 feet uh, were not limited to the 10 knot speed limit, uh, but now they will at certain times and locations. So you know we discussed it at the South Atlantic, and I mean this proposed rule came out since the last meeting, but the data that has been presented to us regarding the boat strikes of right whales, I mean, it's a lo mostly smaller vessels, if I'm not mistaken, and there's a lot of data on it. Isn't that fair to say? Yeah, listen to the information webinar on Tuesday, and yeah, they, you know, I, I, it, it's across the board. There's certainly documented cases of larger vessels uh, hitting, hitting right whales, uh, but they also had uh, documented cases of boats between 35 and 65 feet um, uh, hit, hitting right whales, and actually they had a uh, document, documented case of a boat as small as 17 feet hitting one, but uh, they found the, uh, the, 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 in terms of getting the greatest risk reduction, um, you know, it was that 35 to 65 foot range uh, would, would, uh, would cover that. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Any other questions? I got a couple real quick. Um, how many breeding age females did you say they were? Uh, less less than 100 reproductively active females remaining, okay. uh, 350 uh, total in the population. Okay. Um, how are they going to police the speed? Has, have they given, it looks like it's going to be a number of boats that are out there, it looks like it's going to be a, a challenge for them to do that. Yeah, um, I don't know the details of that. Um, you know, I, you know, I suspect the Coast Guard is probably trying to think about how to do this. Um, as you know, vessels I mean, greater than 65 feet are required to have AIS, which is kind of a satellite tracking device where you can you know, um, you know, track the, the speed of the vessels, uh, but boats less than that don't, don't, aren't required to have that. So yeah. um, I don't know the details of it, but, uh, yeah, and, and I suspect uh, comments will probably be submitted you know, from you know, the Coast Guard and, and other enforcement folks on, on the, uh, the feas feasibility of, of that. Do you think they might make boats 35 feet or larger have AIS? I think that was mentioned. You know, I think they're thinking about all options right okay. now, and you know, kind of going back from listening a couple of nights ago to the to the webinar and reading the proposed rule. I think they're they're kind of looking at that idea. I I'm not going to say for sure yes or no uh, on that. It's not part of this proposed right. rule, but uh, you know, some way to try to you know, monitor the speed of, of all these other vessels is probably going to be needed, uh, you know, in order to, you know, cut down on the, the risk of, uh, of uh, hitting, hitting the right whale. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Commissioner McNeil. Yeah, just a couple follow-ups to that. Um, what is, since the rule is already in effect for vessels over 65 feet, I did look at the map and saw the areas that are, they are mostly around the ports right now. Uh, what is the penalty for that if they are in violation? I don't know what what the penalty is for that. Um, don't recall that being mentioned. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. And then I also wonder what the penalty for turning the AIS off is. So I might Because I know a lot of boats have that turned off. Um, so I'd just like to look more into that. They do during a big rock, I know. Anyway, anything else? All right. Thank you very much. Director? Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> so now I'll, you'll get an update on, on the happenings at the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council from Trish Murphy, uh, who is the Executive Assistant for Councils and serves as the Director's Proxy. Trish? Check your green light if it's okay. You're just soft spoken. Uh, 
Oh, okay. Now, <laughs> it was real. Okay, it needed to be greener. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that sounds much better. Uh, so, uh, Snapper Grouper, um, the council is continuing discussions on Regulatory Amendment 35. And what this amendment is doing is it includes reductions in catch levels for red snapper that are required to end over fishing and um, uh, rebuild the stock. And also looks at um, this, this uh, amendment will also look at developing management options to reduce discard mortality for both red snapper and, and kind of going at a holistic approach of, a, of addressing discard mortality for all the snapper grouper species. Um, Management options as a whole are including gear uh, modifications, seasons, and area closures. Uh, the councils also discuss the need for more outreach and education on best fishing practices to uh, uh, improve survival of releases. As you know, red snapper, the uh, majority of mortality, fishing mortality is from dead discard, so really trying to concentrate on uh, improving releases that they'll be alive. Um, so some of the things that we're talking about is descending devices, proper handling, and other ways to improve that survival. And um, I just want to bring your attention to, we recently just uh, had a YouTube, uh, Jesse Bazette, our webmaster and videographer extraordinaire, uh, went out with Steve Poland and Kevin Amen and did a really nice demonstration of how to use descending devices. So if you all haven't seen it, please Please look at it. It's really, it's really good. Um, I think it's on our YouTube channel or at least Google Descending Devices and DMF. Um, the other big thing that's going on with the South Atlantic Council for North Carolina is we are continuing to discuss modifying recreational dolphin limits uh, through Regulatory Amendment 3. Um, this is um, in federal waters. Um, also, at the same time, NOAA Fisheries has begun to uh, work on a management strategy evaluation for uh, dolphin as well. And the goal of this is to provide an index-based management procedure that can provide more robust analytical support for catch levels and, and management for the fishery. Now, the Council has prioritized this collaboration uh, with NOAA and will be assisting them with stakeholder meetings that will be held in the fall, and this will help um, inform the development of Amendment 3. So in the meantime, uh, options in Amendment 3 that are being discussed include the minimum size limit uh, of dolphin to be along the entire coast. For those that don't know, uh, North Carolina up to Maine, we do not have a size limit, whereas uh, South Carolina to Florida is 20 inch. Um, they're also looking, we're also looking at modifying recreational bag limits and vessel limits, and also whether to prohibit um, the captain and crew for having uh, to be, retain a bag limit on there for higher trips. Um, so this amendment can impact our uh, fisheries here in North Carolina, our recreational fisheries, and particularly our, our uh, for higher fisheries in the north. So... Um, we will be discussing this uh, amendment again in December at Wrightsville Beach, so North Carolina. Um, so it's going to be real important that we get our fishers there to provide public comment um, just because of these impacts. Um, and, um, you know, Florida has already reduced their, uh, they have made some reductions in their state waters. And, you know, there may be, a, there's options in there to kind of be like uh, Florida. So it is going to be real important that our fishers are there to make public comment. Uh, going back to snapper grouper, snowy grouper, and uh, tilefish amendments 51 and 52 are approved for public hearing, and they will be scheduled early September via webinar and during our September meeting, which is in ja uh, Charleston. Uh, the snowy grouper amendment is setting overfishing limits and acceptable biological catch and annual catch limits and uh, sector allocations to end overfishing and continue to rebuild the stock. A golden tile, it's not overfishing. Overfishing is not occurring. but it So it revises the uh, acceptable biological catch, total annual catch limits, and sector allocations that are going to be based off that stock assessment. 
And in blue line tile, uh, the amendment is looking at shortening the uh, recreational season and also um, bringing down the bag limit to uh, two fish. And this is to address overages that um, has been experienced in the uh, recreational sector for blue line. Uh, Coastal Migratory Pelagic Amendment 34, which addressed the king mackerel, that has been submitted, formally submitted to NOAA. It was submitted August 5th, and uh, this amendment had been approved by the council in its March meeting. And I just want to let you guys know also that since this really doesn't uh, impact North Carolina, but um, I thought would, you would be interested, um, NOAA Fisheries disapproved the Coral Amendment 10. The reasons that were given was that it was not consistent with the Magnuson-Stevens Act in minimizing fishing impacts on essential fish habitat, and it did not minimize bycatch. Uh, the council will have an opportunity to address the comments and revise the amendment based on this input, but I think this is very rare that this happens, and so I just wanted to kind of let you know that this, this happened with South Atlantic. Um, so our next meeting is going to be September 12th through the 16th in Charleston, South Carolina. So that's all I got. Great. Questions? Commissioner Roller? Thank you, Chair. Um, as with some discussion with staff and the director, I'd like to bring up a few issues here and potentially make a couple of motions. Um, the first is, first of all, um, Trish and I came on the council about the same time. And uh, I just want to let everyone know she's doing a wonderful job representing North Carolina and North Carolina interests, and I'm proud to sit next to you. We make a good team, along with Mr. Griner. Yeah, uh, they're obligatory seat. So I want to give a little bit more background on the dolphin issue. Um, I know we've discussed it here before, but it, this is really important to North Carolina. Um, I do give the state of Florida and the Florida uh, Wildlife Commission, who is essentially DMF and the MSC, as well as WRC all combined, they go to bat for some of the needs of their fishermen. And South Florida fishermen are really upset. Dolphin is a very important fishing or fishery to them. And they're not catching them like they used to, right? So, and we've heard from them over and over again. Um, the last amendment process, which wrapped up before I was appointed to the commission, but again, it was something I followed and was part of. There was a lot of finger pointing in North Carolina. You know, you guys are catching all of them. You guys don't have minimum size limit. There's a long line fishery up there, which, by the way, doesn't really exist. Um, and the commercial quota is quite small in the dolphin fishery. Um, and a lot of us in North Carolina didn't appreciate some of that, you know, kind of this, this phantom blaming of, the pro blaming of things on us. Um, and what the Florida has done is they have decided in the state, and they do catch dolphin in state waters in pretty good numbers in Florida, um, more so in North Carolina. They have decided to implement a 30 fish bag limit in state waters. And what they are doing through this new amendment is asking us to continue, like Trish said, to apply this potentially up throughout the entire uh, Atlantic coast, as well as implement a size limit um, North Carolina northward, where it doesn't currently exist. Now, our fisheries are very, very different than South Florida fisheries. First of all, there isn't really any science to indicate that there's any trouble with the stock. It's very likely a climate issue. These fish are moving farther north. They're not in. This, they're not sticking around like they used to. But the reductions proposed by Florida have almost no reduction to their state fishery. Something like less than one percent, if I'm not mistaken, right? But they will have a huge impact on our offshore charter fleet, which is very different than the Florida charter fleet. Now, at the same time, I do respect their position because they've got their charter fleet coming and saying, "Hey, please do something." But what they're asking is going to have a disproportionate effect on North Carolina. Our fishermen travel 40, 50 miles. When they need those Baylor dolphin, those small fish, they are very important to that fleet. And we can look at a limit of now 54 fish and say, hey, that's a lot. But when you're on a charter that costs $3,000, nine fish per person really doesn't go as far as you think. And so when it comes to the charter fleet, this would have a disproportionate impact. Now, if we continue going forward with this, it, it presents the council with some really difficult decisions that they have not been comfortable doing so in the past. First of all, um, having different bag limits for different states. That's something the council has not wanted to pursue in the past. Or having different bag limits, recreational, private recreational versus for hire. And that's something that the council and current sitting members have exposed um, um, they haven't been supportive of. So 
I don't think this is good for North Carolina. And um, what I would like to do is, again, we've done this um, in the past, is um, I'd like to make a motion that we put, f we, that this commission write a letter um, to the South Atlantic Council. Hold on, let's see if we can get this motion up. Can. Should I explain it first, I'm, I'm, or do we well, want to? Well, well, whatever you want to do. Yeah. Okay, I, I, and that, that may help help it because I'm, I'm I'm very flexible for how we want to do this. But um, I would like that the commission write a letter, or the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission write a letter to the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council, stating that we are supportive of the current regulations and do not believe that you know reducing the bag limit or adding a, a size limit just stating it would be disproportionate to impact to our for higher fleet and we don't support going forward with that or something to those to those to those alliance chairman okay yes tom could you just repeat that as yeah she's they're typing okay. it make sure they get it all like you want it um that we are supportive of the current management measures under the last amendment um thank you Is that the motion as you made it? Yes, um, but do, we should also state to a degree that we um, don't believe the current proposed measures are equitable to the North Carolina for higher fleet, so in, or just North Carolina recreational fisheries in general. Is that, looking at council here, so, okay. so. Right. is that Trisha? Do you believe? I'm looking for guidance, so. No, I, th I think that I think that's very clear. Director, I would just say, can we be specific to what? Can we name the last amendment so that we know exactly what that is? Yeah, it's, uh, Amendment Ten, correct? Yeah, and this is, I believe, amend I I was trying not to use the numbers because it's going to confuse. It confuses me. It's going to confuse everybody. So um, I think it was, it was Amendment, amendment 10. Ten. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do not believe. Let me suggest just a grammatical change where you got. After Amendment Ten and that, put as that. Would you accept that? Good, thank you. Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay, is that the motion? That you care to make it? Um, unless anyone has any suggestions, if, Director, well, we'll, we'll are you, are first, you okay first with off, this? this is this is your motion. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm looking for suggestions. This impacts all of us here, and you know I want everyone to be okay with okay. it. So so the, so you haven't really actually made this motion yet. This is what you're thinking about making the motion. This is the motion that I can I will endorse this motion. But okay. I am looking for I'm just being okay. for conversation. I, I'm just trying points. to follow. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Rules. This is the motion I am making. But if I am would love to have some discussion. And okay, well, be, we'll have okay. the discussion after we have a second. Okay, all right. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second, Commissioner McNeil. Now discussion. Thank you. So this is uh, basically encompasses what I was going for, but like I said before, if there is any other way in which we would like to address this, I'm very amicable to, to that in discussion. Okay. C Commissioner... Raider, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, totally sympathetic to what you're trying to do, uh, Commissioner. I'm interested, and in, particularly in the context of um, the stock having been assessed and not being determined to be being overfished. What I'm wondering is if there's a way to consider a response that isn't just no, it isn't just a no hell no kind of response. In, in other words, is there a um, a conservation response that could, and, and I think the thing that might be interesting is to to iterate, to actually state in this that we are we believe that the science supports that what Florida and other southerly fishermen are seeing is a climate response as opposed to a stock condition response because that that generates a different set of outcomes. So if you're looking at the same number of fish, more or less available across the range and beyond to the north, then the way that people access it, you know, in other words, it doesn't help them for people to take fewer up here. So, as opposed to your, the letter simply saying, we don't think you should, you know, keep it like it is, but, but, but the developing amendment might want to consider um, other responses to climate shifts in the population distribution and abundance of the species or something like that. 
so, so, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I think that is a very good way to put it. I think it's also important, and I offer this for conversation purposes, that, you know, we just hashed out this last amendment. It, it just became law. And Florida was just upset that they didn't get as much as they wanted, so now we're doing an entirely different process. When the last process did address some of those concerns, one of the problems with Dolphin is it is an international stock, and we're not able to assess the entire population. So I think what we're doing is, is that, and I mean, if you wanted to offer something like that as an amendment, I would also be supportive of that. Um, I just don't want to get too much into the weeds for it. And I don't really view this as, as a, a no, hell no. I, I just view it as kind of a support for the last amendment and the last process we went through. So, I mean, if obviously, if science indicates that we need to have greater reductions, I would not be making this amendment. But that was not prevalent in those issues. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Ryder. Yeah, I'm fine with that, uh, Commissioner Roland. It just depends. It, um, I think the, it might be more productive, generally, to to say and you know to have an and here somewhere that we do not believe that. Pro How do we say? It? Maybe you have a better idea. Um, I was thinking we could address the climate concerns in the letter. I'm not sure. I mean, we could probably say something about it, but I, I think we can definitely, in, in the letter that is sent, we can address uh, the, the climate change impacts. I mean, there are some the vulnerable vulnerability analysis that's been done. I don't know that's been published, but we've seen comment. You know, we've seen presentations on it that show that it had a you know climate was going to have a high impact to dolphins. So. Um, we can maybe pull from some of that and add to the, the letter itself. I, I don't know, unless you just feel strongly that needs to be re reflected in that um, in the, the motion. I mean, I would just leave the first sentence like it is, and I'll, I will support that um, and suggest that we say, additionally, we uh, support further assessment of climate and other impacts on these stocks and the way that they're prosecuted under subsequent amendments or something like that. Um, I, I would, that, I think that, that's brilliant, really. So um, if I would accept that as a friendly amendment. Okay, will you accept that on your second, Commissioner McNeil? Yeah, I'll accept that, and okay. that's really where I wanted this to go because I think that, I mean, it's hard to, um, to show support and scientific data that climate change is causing this, but we're seeing it with a couple other fisheries too, right now with the white marlin. Um, so I think focusing that on a climate-driven direction is probably the way to go with this. Okay. I, I think I just, if this wasn't reiterated before, I just want to point out that the reduction in harvest to Florida, like I said, was later less than 1%, right? Yeah. Um, and in North Carolina, it really doesn't affect private recreational anglers. It just impacts the for hire fleet. Mm -hmm. For the most part. Okay. Any other discussion on this motion? If not, let's do a roll call vote on this. Yes, sir. All right. Hold on. Get everything up here. All right. Okay. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Thank you. And we need to strike Ms. Gardner from there right now because she is not a commissioner. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. We will... I will, I will write with a lot of help from staff a letter to the uh, council. Okay, Commissioner Roller. Um, I have a couple more. First of all, I'm happy to help on that. I've already could get, said I would. <laughs> so, um, okay. So I have two more issues I'd like to bring to the uh, the commission here. Um, one doesn't really have a spot 
but I think that this is a good place to discuss it. It's more of like a data gathering request. And one, I just want to bring up for discussion and see if there's any interest in discussing it. First of all is, this is, I don't know really where to describe it, but it's been a fishery that I've been involved in and one that I've been kind of involved in advocating for. It's our false albacore fishery. So this is, just to give some background, false albacore are a small tuna. They're an offshore fish or nearshore fish. And depending on who you talk to, you're going to get a lot of different opinions about them. You know, they are an extremely important recreational fishery in North Carolina, particularly inshore. We have a huge, uh, particularly in the southeast part of the state, we have lots of fishermen who target them. Um, fly fishing, light tackle, they're one of the reasons I got into the fishing industry in general. Um, they're not a fish that people eat, right? They are edible, and people do eat them. Um, there, there are commercial markets for them for food, and there also is a big, uh, there is a bait market for them. But to give a little bit of a background, um, you know, in, in addition, you know, when you talk to offshore fishermen, people can get annoyed with them. So depending on the crowd you're talking to, you know, you get kind of different opinions on this fish. But there's a lot of effort on them, and there's a lot of trips. And they're, they're really big to, you know, really big economically important fish, not just North Carolina, but from Florida all the way through Massachusetts, right? So they don't have a home. No one manages these fish. And it is a scary fact because there is nothing to protect these fish. Um, in 2011, the South Atlantic Management Council opted to remove them from their complex of managed species for what was at the time sound justifications under the law. Um, at that time, I reached out to our council members, including Matt Curran, who was previously the chair of the Marine Fisheries Commission here, and I asked him his opinion on this. And he said, well, this is why we're doing it, but don't worry. We're talking about it at the commission, uh, or you know, the state's talking about it. We're going to put some basic measures in place, and so on and so forth. And I expressed my doubt that that would happen, and it hasn't. Um, the next issue where this came up was on one of the really true groundbreaking fisheries management plans ever put together, in my opinion, was uh, Mid-Atlantic Fisheries Management Council's Omnibus Unmanaged Forge, Forge Fish Amendment. I'm getting that name wrong. But basically, they looked at all these unmanaged forge fish species and said, we're going to cap, and I know, I know I'm going to get this kind of wrong. I'm looking at Chris. But, you know, we're going to cap these fisheries, that if they're going to get any bigger, we have to have science in place, right? Um, False albacore is part of that discussion, and it was on the docket up until the end where it was removed for reasons based off it didn't fit the um, analysis, right, of what a forage fish was, even though they are forage. This has come up at the South Atlantic Council other times. Um, the state of Florida and the, and the Florida representative, uh, Jessica McCauley, said the states are better to manage them. Um, this commission has a white paper that was put together in 2017 that shows the landings. Now, this is, this is where my concern is. You know, a lot of our fisheries are going catch and release. We're seeing shorter seasons. We do have an expanding commercial fishery on these. And there's nothing wrong with that. We have, we have a huge bait fishery that's being developed across the coast. Um, we're hearing a lot of concern from Florida fishermen out of it. Um, but everyone points different directions. You know, which way we want to go. They, they can do it. They can do it. And I'm, I, I want to start a conversation here so maybe North Carolina can be a leader with this unmanaged fish and try to do something about it. And I'm not, and I, I want to be very, very clear. I do not think the commercial fishery is a problem, and I do not think this is fishery is unsustainable as it is today. I just want to start talking about getting out in front of something instead of always trying to put out wildfires, right? And we don't have a lot of opportunities to do that. So, and I'm not making a motion, but this is what I'm going to ask in a motion. Um, and I'd like to hear some discussion, hopefully. Um, is I would like to ask staff to update the 2017 white paper and come forward with some really basic ideas of what a sort of unmanaged fishery could look like. Like I'm talking a, a commercial catch limit, maybe a trip limit, or a threshold for recreationals in which a bag limit would have to be put in place so that if it reaches that point, we would have to have some sort of management put into place. I know we'll hear concerns that this is a highly migratory stock found in many states, and if North Carolina were to do something on the state, it, we wouldn't get a big benefit coastwide. We are the second biggest state of landings next to Florida, and we're very close to Florida. So if Florida's not willing to take this up, someone's got to. And I just want to kind of, I don't want to draw a line in the sand. 
I just want to start the discussion. I want to say that these are really important fish. And just because we can't eat them doesn't mean that they're not worthy of more scientific gathering and looking at managing in the future. And talking to Mr. Poland here, you know, our discussions regarding this is we're easily looking at 10 years out on having enough data. And that's a long time. They're sitting ducks. There's nothing to stop a huge fishery from developing. Does that make sense? So. Comments on the suggestion? And this is not a motion for action. Okay. This is data gathering. Okay. So. Commissioner Rader. Uh, even though I wasn't involved here in North Carolina, I was involved with the South Atlantic at the time, and I thought the activity by the Southeast Regional Office of NIMS to remove fish from management units was was in error and uh, and actually damaging in terms of precautionary management as times move forward so i would i'm I'm going to support when you this motion when you make it and uh, and I wonder if it, there's a need to be clear about whether there are other species from among those have, that have been similarly removed from other management units or are not yet. Yeah, it's just so that we have a, I as ignorant, you know, have a better understanding of whether this is a, perhaps this is the most needful, but are there others where we ought to be thinking about an instrument that might create I mean, there used to be a, a category for um, for statistic for data collection and statistical tracking only that was widely used in federal fisheries. So I'm just wondering if there are other such things we ought to be tracking. Do you have an opinion, Commissioner? Uh, uh, thank you for that, Commissioner Rader. Um, I do. Um, I think that I like the idea of starting with this species because. I think you'll be surprised at the positive comments you hear about it, right? But if you really want to get technical, I mean, there's several unmanaged small tunas out there. There's Atlantic Benito, there's Blackfin tuna, there's Skipjack, fish that are harvested, some because they're very good to eat, but really don't fall under any management um, on any protocols, right? So yes, I, I, I think that that's a bigger discussion. Um, but what I'm also trying to do here is staff time is limited. And we have a really nice white paper, and I think it would be very easy to update, right? Do you see where I'm going with that? But I, I really appreciate the direction you're going there because that is absolutely what I completely agree with you. And again, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, Mr. Chairman, but uh, my belief is that these guilds of uh, coastal migratory pelagics are going to change, continue to change through time in their relative distribution and abundance. And so being r ahead of the curve there requires us to be aware of and track the way that that's happening. And so I, would lo I, I will support your proposal to use false albacore as the canary for how we might think about it and also that we then work with staff to think about what the options might be for the role of this commission in the state of North Carolina interactively working with the ASMFC and the other regional programs and for that matter with NOAA and maybe we can use the various climate related investments that are underway including the scenario planning investment to be able to think about collectively how people ought to respond and don't get me wrong I'm not arguing that that's a reason not to do this now I think I think those are paired and tandem strategies and I will support okay. Commissioner Roller so Absolutely. Um, and my hope is that once we gather this data, we can have a discussion whether or not we would like to go forward with some sort of management, whether it's rulemaking or it's something that we take to the councils or the ASMFC and say, hey, this is what we want to do. Who, who's with us? So I just, I, I, I want to reiterate, I want North Carolina to be a leader here. So. Okay. How do you want it to proceed at this point? Um, I move that we ask staff to update the 2017 fall Salvacore white paper. And to bring some very simple, um, don't say simple, um, <laughs> I'm trying to word this out, um, and to bring some recommendations. Basic. To bring, what was that? Basic recommendations. <laughs> Base, ba to bring basic recommendations as to what capping this fishery at its current state would look like, such as a commercial trip limit, uh, or maybe just a quota. And, you know, I thought, I'll, you know, and just pause on the motion, but 
I, uh, I thought a lot about this and had a lot of discussions like, well, why wouldn't you recommend a recreational bag? People don't really keep these fish very much, occasionally for bait currently. And sometimes if you put a target on a fish, like you say, hey, let's, the bag limit's five, people will start killing their limit. So we may not want to do that. Um, however, if harvest, you know, I think there's, there's ways to look at that. If harvest reached a certain level, you, you'd have to do something like that. Do you see what I mean? I think, is that, is that the kind of, is that, is that clear direction? So. Yeah. Um, so because recommendations is sort of a specific term, um, and, and it may be your intention, um, uh, you may use something like frame potential management options or something like that, um, just as a suggestion. That is an excellent suggestion, Laura. That's why we pay you the big bucks, right? Um, I really, yeah, to frame potential management measures, or management options, options. Options will be better. Um, for for future for future mm -hmm. considerations, that would cap that would that would look at keeping the fishery as it currently is today, or with or within some sort of you know does that make sense to include things like um, a Why commercial? Why don't just say for future consideration? Period. Oh. Okay, and we'll. Hash out the minutia as we develop all this. Okay. okay. All right. Is that your motion as you made it? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Is there a second? Oh. No, second. Commissioner, okay. Commissioner Rader seconded. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, yes, Commissioner Blanton. If, if there's no estimate of abundance, then how how do we how, you know and I understand your your point I'm I'm not I'm not against what you what you're asking but you know as a commercial fisher I'm concerned one my one concern is that if you have no measure of abundance how do you even gauge what 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 it is that we're contributing to the stock and whatsoever and if federal fisheries have turned this fish loose um, you know it it seems a little more insignificant and maybe this this could be extra work for the for the division to have to do and it's sort of painting a target on the commercial fisherman's back you know by doing something like this because you know I, I just don't see the point in, in all this extra work and and so with the lack of data, with the lack of things, it's just such so, such a feel good thing, because there's no 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 way to measure it, and, and so that was that be my one concern. Commissioner Roller, I think I can address that. Um, the idea is in I, I I understand where you're coming from, and I and I and I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, can can I just add before he comments? Sure, Sorry, I don't sure. mean to cut you off. I really don't. But like if if and so this this is my justification for my comment. If this fish is caught as a bycatch in a, say, a Spanish mackerel fishery or whatever, and, and it somehow comes to, to be a thing that there's a quote on it, then it's just another fish to cut a commercial fisher off. When we, do, when we lack the data to even understand the abundance and what effects we're having, and so that's where I, you know, I hate getting into the weeds of things when there's really, is there a need? And, and so we're not even qu answering the question if there is even a need. And, um, you know, that's where my concern falls. And, and, and so, you know, I just wanted to add that to my comment. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Roller. But your comment is my concern because we've never been able to assess the species. We don't have the data to do it currently. And the whole idea behind that is to say, let's not let this fishery expand overnight when we're chasing it from behind. And I'm, my hope is that this starts the discussion of that we need to have more discussion about managing some of these underappreciated and underutilized fisheries. Um, the commercial fishery, and this isn't just a commercial issue, I mean, this is a really popular recreational fishery, but I will point out there is a big bait market for them, right? And it's grown a lot, and you'll see it in the data. Um, you know, we've gone from 50,000 pounds of landings to a quarter million. So, and the Florida landings have increased a lot too. And it is variable, right? They're a highly migratory species. Um, but I, I understand your point, but that's kind of what I'm getting at because 
it may take too long to get the science and data before it become a problem. And that the fishery is important and sustainable as it currently exists, because they are abundant. Uh, yes. And so my reason for seconding is a profound belief over years watching fisheries management develop that fisheries management as crisis management is the wrong way to think about our job together. And that this is an opportunity to begin working with staff to imagine what the management framework options are for anticipating and preventing those kinds of crisis management systems, uh, so responses. And so I, I, that's the main reason I supported you, Commissioner Roller. And so I think it's, it's an important addition if we can together help make sure the staff have the resources that they need to begin expanding their already complex mandate to begin thinking about this. And I think it's especially important today, given that we already know that the circumstances in offshore are changing rapidly and that we should anticipate more of that. And so having a more facile or, or quick response, not having to wait, and, and I don't mean necessarily jumping automatically to capping everything, but to understand what the array of options are that we have in our quiver working with staff to be able to anticipate problems before they develop will be really critical to our role. So I, I continue to support that despite uh, Commissioner Bland's statement. Commissioner Cross. Tom, I wonder if you would just uh, accept a small uh, amendment because when I read this, it makes me believe that we're going to do some management option, period, for future consideration. If we could put if needed behind the consideration, because we may, we may get in this white paper and not need, we may find that we don't need anything. And I just, you know, if needed would make me feel a little more open-ended about it, I guess. So. Well, I, I think that for future consideration kind of encompasses that, right? Okay. Commissioner Bland. I just want to ask a question of the division. Is this something, I mean, is is this something, I mean, can you chime in on, on your opinion? And I know it's been a short, short time in here, but, you know, or do you have the, the, the ability to, to take on another species, the time, the, the effort, the even way to, to even start gathering data in any kind of ways other than, I guess, the fishery um, dependent data, um, but, you know, surveys, you know, just can you just offer a little more comment on this and, and what we're really trying to talk about here? Because, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to create another issue for commercial fishers if there's no reason to create another issue for commercial fishers because I feel like the commercial fisher has the biggest target on their back. And so to create that, and that's my, that's not, that's my number one concern. And, and I'm not saying, I'm not against conservation. I'm not against um, um, any of that. But if, 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 if other management agencies, even above our management agency, has, has, has deemed this, this fishery, um, and, and I'm, 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 I'm very uneducated at the present moment on, on the reasons they dropped all of this, um, you know, it, it, why do we need to consider picking it up and, 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 and potentially in the future putting another burden on the commercial fisher? And so could you offer a little more comment, please? Thank you. Yeah, and I, we've talked about this um, with Commissioner Roller, and we've talked about it a bit internally. So we do, um, we do think we have time to update the information paper and just look at the data. Uh, I'm interested to see what the data shows uh, and then go from there, really, because that's the first step. We have to look at the data and see what it, what it says, um, and we don't know what that might say. And certainly we, we are willing to, to update that. And the difference between what we've got, and this is uh, something that staff has pointed out, so what we currently have is an information paper. It does not contain any rulemaking or management uh, suggestions that would go for rulemaking, which would be the only avenue that this commission would have would be rulemaking. So if in the, ultimately in the end, if the commission decides they want to move forward with rulemaking, we would, we would create an uh, a, uh, issue paper and that would go uh, through the hoops of public um, review and those types of things, AC review, or that's what the recommendation would be. And it would, would be for rulemaking. So what we will do is update the information paper and 
capture some broad uh, management uh, things to consider, and then the commission can certainly go from there, and we will we'll follow that direction. But yes, I think we I support doing this for for sure. Okay, All right. Yes, Commissioner Wright. So I, I was heavily involved in that process at that time, and so following the the federal process, and so following the. 96-97 law, there was a, a pretty profound movement, including by the South Atlanta Council, to add lots of species into the management units. And we all supported that because they were done in the context of the ecological systems that we were supposed to be uh, managing. But then when the, the 2007 Act was adopted, it required a lot of sp very specific responses, species by species, um, within management units. And so there was a strong push coming out of St. Petersburg <laughs> to to uh, take things out of management units, and they they took. I forget, do you remember how many many dozens of species that were dropped that time? It, it, largely because of the duties under the 2007 amendment to the Magnuson Act that were required to be fulfilled, and so I, I actually thought that was a pretty serious mistake. But. Okay, anybody at St. Commissioner Roller? Just one quick comment. I just want to say that before I brought this to the commission, in all fairness to staff, I discussed with Mr. Poland, Director Rawls, and the chairman. So, and we all, and they all told me this would be a decent time to discuss it. So, yes, Director. Just one other comment to um, to uh, Commissioner Rader's point uh, about some species being removed and. I think Commissioner Roller alluded to this earlier. There are other small tunas that probably do need uh, addressing and, and maybe potential management, but certainly need consideration. And I think a lot of it does boil down to resources and just the ability to be able to, to pick anything else up, not just at DMF, but also, you know, council and commission, other commissions as well. So I think it's a, it is a real thing, uh, but certainly we we feel like we do we do have time to, to look at this and and we're interested to do that okay great anything else on this motion all right there be none i'll call for the roll call yes chair commissioner cross aye commissioner blanton aye. commissioner huggins aye. commissioner mcneil aye commissioner Rader. aye Commissioner Roller? Aye. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. Thank you. And Chairman Bissell? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay. And did you have something else? Yeah, one more issue. I know this is a lot, and we're taking a lot of time on this. I love the discussion, y'all. Um, so I don't know if this is a room for motion, but I just kind of want to have some on-the-record conversation about this. So, um, And there's a lot that comes into this. So in the South Atlantic, we have three federal for higher permits. They are dolphin wahoo, they are coastal migratory pelagics, that is Spanish and king mackerel, and if you're fishing south of South Florida, Cobia, um, and then also grouper snapper complex. Um, those have reporting requirements, right? But North Carolina is unique because we are the only coastal state or territory without a joint enforcement agreement with National Marine Fisheries Service. And as someone in the for hire industry, um, I see a lot of series, but you can go online and look at the list of permit holders. It's public information. It's on their website, it's, uh, Southeast Regional Office. And there's a lot of people in this industry that don't have those permits. And it's a concern of mine for, for a lot of different reasons. First of all, that's, I believe that's underrepresenting North Carolina recreational fishing um, in general in some of these, you know, quota managed fisheries, right? Um, it's underrepresenting the hire fleet. Um, and it's also underrepresenting some of their geospatial data. For example, through the reporting, um, you know, as wind becomes an issue. And I'm hearing from some of these uh, NCFA affiliate groups who are very opposed to wind. And, you know, regardless of how you feel about offshore wind, it's coming. And it will impact fishermen. And so I look at these permits, and I've raised these concerns for years. I just believe that North Carolina is in a unique position that disadvantages our fleet because there's no real enforcement of them outside of a federal officer since we don't have joint enforcement. And I don't want to hash out that conversation, but you know, looking in proclamation, we require some of these other federal permits for, for commercial fisheries. And I just wanted to have to see if there's any comments regarding if there's any way 
in which to enforce these permits. Because I, I know that might be a little controversial, but when it comes down to it, it is jeopardizing our fishing fleet. And I'm looking around if anybody. Okay. So. Director, would you like to comment on that in any way? Yes, sir. I, I certainly will. And we can look into this a little bit more, but we have just had some very, just based on our, our conversation with Commissioner Roller about this issue, had some very um, preliminary conversations with staff and obvious, and we do require these federal permits through um, our proclamations for King mackerel, Spanish mackerel. So we do, we have precedent for that and we could do that. Um, one of the concerns that we have is just the staff, the Marine Patrol staff to be able to enforce this. And th these permit requirements would have to be enforced on the water and no question. And so I think that puts us in a, in a, really a no-win situation in this particular, uh, for this particular thing. But we, it would certainly be something we could discuss more uh, at the staff level and then um, maybe come back and, and, discuss, and talk a little bit more about it if, if that would be uh, something that you'd be interested, Tom. But like I said, we've just had a few discussions about it and uh, talked with Colonel Witten about it, and he may have some additional comments that he would like to make. But really, we're kind of on the ropes with, with that or would be it just we could do it but then the enforcement of it it's just not something we could probably do at this time I, I understand that but at the same time we do require those other federal permits and my object isn't to have a you know a large-scale enforcement of this at a lot of levels but just to have something there um, I also think outreach could be a big part of this particularly at our license renewal uh, uh, potential fishermen need to know and I know it when you start talking about permits and Federal government, people get frustrated. They're not expensive. They are open access. But um, again, it's just my, you know, as someone who's been in fisheries management, you know, from the advocacy side, now the rulemaking side, it's it, 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 it scares me looking looking at the underrepresentation of our fishery, right? And so that's that's where really where I'm trying to get at. And I'm, I'm trying to look for anything, and I would love to hear comments from y'all on it. Yeah, and to follow up with that and talk about the underrepresentation, I think that is a great point and, and something that, you know, fishermen should be interested in because as we move forward into the future, it's going to be even more critical that the representation is, is, is really, you know, what really is happening in the real world. So we, we'll certainly, I'm certainly glad to talk, take, talk this over with staff some more and um, bring it back and, and talk about it a little bit more if you'd like just to have some more detailed discussions because we've just had very few uh, comments since our meeting with you last week or earlier this week I think it was I don't even know what week it is okay <laughs> okay right okay director back to you are we with Trish you done one quick comment <clears throat> and I'm sorry Mr. I'm talking too much uh, not a bit Ms. Murphy so I was involved pretty heavily with in the Gulf of Mexico with trying to minimize uh, discard mortality in bottom fish, and for quite a while. And it's it, the entanglements are interesting. One of the is that one that they found dramatically was that bottlenose dolphins, particularly, are really good at learning those kinds of behaviors and following boats around and uh, and stripping fish being descended back to the bottom. And so it, it's amazing how I mean it seems odd that you get a lot of benefit from descending fish but you don't always depending on those kinds of responses and so all I'm suggesting is I know you know this but there are lots of other things too what the captains told us when, in our process was that some really simple things like gear alterations or even depth differences above a reef make a tremendous difference in the catch makeup and I know you all everyone who's an active <laughs> fisher person knows that as so I'm just want make interested to make sure that that full range of responses and for that matter including communication among captains of all in all sectors about where high bycatch is being developed that actually was the main strategy in the commercial fishery that was used off california to avoid the accidental catch of species for which um, uh, um, there, were, there was zero allowable take or very very limited so-called bottleneck, bottleneck species in those, that, those complexes so just uh, so that a full array of responses to improve more uh, to reduce mortality can be considered. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming. Anything else for Trish? All right. Thank you so much, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Um, so, 
Moving on to climate change scenario planning workshop Ooh, update. Uh, so Laura Koblanski attended this workshop and she is going to give you an update. Hello again. Microphone placement is very important for our online listeners. So I'm just going to make sure I've got that. All right, so thank you, Director Rawls, and thank you, Commission. Um, so back in June, I was selected to participate in um, the East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning Workshop. Um, so this is a joint initiative between the Atlantic States Fishery, um, Marine Fisheries Commission, the New England and Mid-Atlantic and the South Atlantic Fishery Management Councils and also NOAA Fisheries. So the initiative is a multi-year effort to explore how climate change might affect fisheries on the U.S. East Coast um, and to identify the consequences um, for the future of fisheries management and governance. So since July 2021, the Scenario Planning Workshop um, has engaged with hundreds of fishery stakeholders, gathering views and opinions on how climate change has affected and may continue to affect fisheries on the East Coast. So the Scenario Creation Workshops was the continuation of that effort. The scenario um, workshops uh, were held June 21st through the 23rd in Arlington, Virginia, and I, along with 74 other stakeholders and support staff from many different states and disciplines, took part in this um, three-day workshop. So the participants were divided into groups of about eight people. We sat around at tables, um, and <clears throat> we stayed in those groups pretty much for the whole working session. So the object of the workshop was to develop um, a small number of divergent, plausible, challenging, relevant, and memorable stories that outline possible conditions facing East Coast fisheries in the next 20 years. The participants were very diverse. Um, just as an example, at my table that I sat at, um, we had a NOAA stock assessment scientist, a head boat owner, a commercial fishery advocate, a recreational guide, an environmental advocate for an NGO, an anthropologist who specialized in fishing communities, and a state manager, that was me, and um, also a commercial fisherman. So the, uh, the represented stakeholder groups were very expansive, and it was a great opportunity to sit down with different kinds of people to have these discussions. So I spent three days at the table with my fellow participants, and despite any differences we may have had in regard to current fisheries management um, and governance, we were able to come together and have um, a very productive discussion and develop a number of possible scenarios. So during the workshop, there was one word that came up over and over in our discussions, and that was adapt. Um, it came up in discussions uh, by individual fishermen, in management actions, and also in governance. So by the end of the workshop, it seemed uh, clear to me that um, everyone at the table recognized the need to work towards fishery management and governance that provides for adaptation for all stakeholders as we move um, into a more uncertain future. So overall, it was a very rewarding experience for me personally. Um, I feel like I gained uh, a lot of insight into many of the fisheries, and um, I, I really look forward to seeing how what the outcome of that um, initiative is. So with that in mind, um, these workshops uh, were only the first step or one step in the initiative. So I won't go into the entire process, but there is a report online and I did provide you with a document in your um, briefing materials. So um, the uh, sort of end product of the initiative, what they expect to have at the end, are a set of scenarios that describe different ways climate change might affect the future of East Coast fisheries, a better understanding of the, of the challenges and opportunities facing fisheries management, a set of near-term and long-term management priorities to help um, achieve fishery management objectives under a range of different future conditions, and also policy recommendations for broader governance changes that improve our ability to adapt to future scenarios. So um, a list of data gaps, research priorities, and monitoring needs for changing conditions, 
and finally a framework for ongoing conservation and idea generation for all stakeholders to use. So all of this information um, and much more is available on the Scenario Planning website, um, which is housed on the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council website. And if you're interested, I do encourage you to go check that out. They have all of the documents, um, and they actually have posted a report um, from the Scenario Planning workshops, um, and that process is continuing. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions to Laura? Oh, thank you, and <clears throat> sound like a really interesting workshop. Oh, that's, okay. Director? Thank you, Laura. Uh, now I'd like to ask, um, wait, make sure I'm on the right spot here. Oh, yeah, Owen Mulvey McFerrin to come up and give an update on the shellfish lease program. Uh, Owen is our shellfish lease and aquaculture program coordinator. Thank you, Director Rawls. Today I will be discussing a few important updates on the shellfish lease and aquaculture program activities since your last meeting. And because we have some new commissioners, I will provide a little more background information as well. <clears throat> the division administers the shellfish lease and aquaculture program for the purposes of managing the cultivation of shellfish and other species for both, oh no, okay, for both inland and upland aquaculture facilities within the state of North Carolina. The North Carolina General Assembly supports shellfish aquaculture and encourages shellfish aquaculture development in ways that are compatible with other public uses. They establish standards that provide for the leasing of public bottom for the cultivation and production of shellfish and gave rulemaking authority to the Marine Fisheries Commission to set standards to develop and improve on the cultivation, harvesting, and marketing of shellfish for commercial production. In addition to state regulations, shellfish leases are also required to meet federal permitting standards. Staff continued to implement mandates and recommendations from the 2019 Shellfish Aquaculture Bill and subsequent legislative studies, including the User Conflict Study and SEAs in Moratorium Areas Study. For the User Conflict Study, the amendments to three of the 11 shellfish lease rules resulting from the User Conflict Study are automatically subject to legislative review during the 2022 legislative session. The effective date of these rules will be August 23rd, and Catherine will be providing more information on that later today. Staff are working on continuing corresponding efforts to implement the rule amendments, including developing a cumulative impact policy and the new shellfish leaseholder training program <clears throat> that emphasizes user conflict reduction strategies. For the shellfish enterprise areas, the shellfish aquaculture bill addressed SEAs in two ways. It allows the secretary of DEQ um, through de authority delegated to the DMF director to establish SEAs in compliance with existing shellfish lease statutes and number two, it requested that SEAs in moratorium area study to develop the feasibility of allowing SEAs in moratorium areas currently closed to shellfish leases. As a reminder, SEAs are where state agencies are technically the applicant and perform the shellfish lease siting themselves, including the environmental and public trust suitability review and acquisition of federal permits. States then sublease smaller parcels within the SEA to shellfish growers to then make the process more efficient on the back end. Staff met with other states who have similar programs to help develop an implementation plan for SEAs in North Carolina. This year, staff are working on the Bogue Sound pilot study to gather stakeholder input on SEAs in general and SEAs in moratorium areas. We met with the local municipalities surrounding Bogue Sound earlier this year to provide background information on shellfish leases and SEAs. Based on feedback, from these meetings, DMF hosted a virtual event in early summer to present more in-depth information to all members of the public. Staff are summarizing all the feedback into a final report that will include recommendations on the feasibility of SEAs and moratorium areas in North Carolina and any additional resources required to implement. Once the final report is completed, staff will incorporate the methodology used for the Bogue Sound study to study additional areas where SEAs could be potentially viable outside of moratorium areas, for instance, Pamlico Sound. This will be a more comprehensive undertaking because we will need to involve shellfish growers and other stakeholders in this process. We formed an interagency aquaculture work group with staff from the agencies in charge of managing aquaculture activities in North Carolina. So this would be the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And began developing a North Carolina interagency aquaculture policy as a comprehensive approach to challenges of the present industry and to better plan for the future. 
The policy addresses issues affecting both in-water and upland aquaculture facilities, provides clarity to existing regulations, and provides more efficient coordination with the aquaculture management agencies to ensure consistency across authorities. The Shellfish Aquaculture Gear Management and Storm Preparedness Plan developed by DMF in collaboration with North Carolina Sea Grant and other partners was included in the 2022 Shellfish Lease Application Package. DMF partnered with the National Sea Grant Law Center and the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services and received funding from the NOAA Sea Grant Program to form the State Marine Aquaculture Coordination Network for uh, state aquaculture managers and extension personnel from Virginia through Texas and hosted an internal workshop. The workshop provided a networking forum for state aquaculture coordinators and regulators, state extension personnel, and federal regulators. It also promoted efforts to compile regulatory information across state aquaculture programs and help program administers, administrators learn from each other's experiences and challenges on a variety of topics, including user conflicts. Next steps are to secure long-term federal funding and expand nationally to include all U.S. coastal states and then meet annually to update the inventory and all other pertinent information. We provided information pertaining to the issues surrounding potential floating structures on shellfish leases at your last meeting. In short, at the request from the shellfish growers, the Division of Coastal Management with direction from the Coastal Resources Commission were researching potential avenues for allowing working platforms on certain shellfish leases in North Carolina, including the rulemaking process and or through the CAMA permitting process. After discussion at their February 22 meeting, February 2022 meeting, the CRC agreed that before they consider any regulations for floating aquaculture structures, input was needed from the State Attorney General to determine if aquaculture is considered a form of agriculture and therefore exempt from CRC regulation. To date, there has not been a determination made. However, this issue is on the agenda for the September 15th CRC meeting to discuss. Uh, this year, in 2022, the shellfish lease application period closed on August 1st. We received a total of 85 applications with 44 for water column and 41 for bottom leases. Finally, we recruited for and hired two new positions that were included in the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, these include one biologist and one technician. And that concludes my report, Chairman Bidwell. Questions or comments? Got one real quick one. Um, I heard WRC was part of the process somewhere along the way. What is their role in what you were talking about? They're involved in permitting upland aquaculture facilities. Okay. Okay. Good enough. All right. Anything else? Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm, uh, what was, you said upland aquaculture facilities? Yes. What, what, is, what is that? Um, so th that would just be an aquaculture facility that's not... Um, in, it'd be different from like a shellfish lease, which is in a coastal estuary. Upland is anything that's removed from the water body, an out of water system. Yes, go ahead. Um, oh, and I was going to comment on the permitting process just because I've been through it several times now. And I would add, when uh, I'd make a recommendation when you're sending out the renewals, mm -hmm. AOPs, and everything else, if you can send the renewal, the, the copy of the prior application, to a lot of these people, that would be massive in helping them out, filling out the new one because it changes, but they can get a lot of their information from the prior prior application. That would help expedite a lot of this stuff. Sure, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. One more comment or question: uh, When you say out of the water body, so if somebody was in, say, Dare County with an aquaculture operation that wasn't in the water body. WRC would have a role somehow in that. I can get back to you on that. I, so I, yeah. I obviously don't work for WRC, so I'm not right. entirely sure what their um, what their involvement with that would be. Yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in what their involvement would be with something like that. Yeah, I can get back to you on that. Right, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Yes. And this is not necessarily today because we're obviously running behind, but. Um, I'd, ap I'd appreciate a briefing at some point about it, the progress in the federal waters offshore aquaculture process, since I know that NOAA in the past has pushed that pretty aggressively. Just Well, if you have any comments now, that'd be great, or quick comments, or otherwise in the future, a, a briefing on where things stand and how that, whether and how that interacts with North Carolina aquaculture. Colonel, so I can answer your question. Okay. So species-specific also is what they 
tilapia and that type of stuff, um, hybrid striped bass. Um, we are in the process now of working with WRC and Department of Agriculture to have one application so that um, it's not as confusing for AOP aquaculture operations for the different organizations and different species and that type of stuff. So that's where WRC comes in comes into play. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay. Anything else? Thank y'all. Okay. Director. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Colonel. So now I'd like to ask uh, Ann Deaton uh, to come up and give you an update on the Coastal Hab Habitat Protection Plan implementation. I've got a PowerPoint to pull up. Turn the mic towards you a little bit, too, if you would. switching between the motions so it just takes a second for the screens to come I think it's uh, working on it so while it's trying to come up um, I'll just introduce myself for the new people um, welcome I'm Ann Deaton I'm with the habitat and enhancement section and uh, I'm work on the coastal habitat protection plan um, so thanks for being here I can just verbally go over this if you want me to. Laura, well, I'm glad you got those fast HDMI cords. You buy that from the gas station, that's what you get, yeah. That's interesting. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> okay, so um, we've been trying to give you an update on the implementation progress on the 2021 amendment of the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan at each of your meetings. So um, thank you for having me, Chairman Bizzle, other commissioners. Um, I'm going to try and make this quick because I know you're hungry. Um, so first, since we do have some new people, I was just going to briefly go over a little background. Um, so the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, we call it, tend to call it CHIP as their acronym. So think fish and chips because it was put in place because of the fish. Um, so the Fisher Reform Act of 1997 required that the CHIP be drafted by Department of Environmental Quality divisions that are involved have authority over habitat and water quality management. So this included not only Division of Marine Fisheries staff, but also Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership, Division of Water Resources, Division of Coastal Management, and Division of Energy, Mineral, and Land Resources. That last one they do a lot, but um, they're in there because of stormwater runoff and sediment control. So this arose at the time of the late 90s due to a lot of concern about um, estuarine conditions. Fish stocks were declining. There were fish kills, algal blooms, increasing shellfish harvest closures. So the statute required that the three regulatory commissions that manage habitat and water quality work together um, to implement the plan and to approve the final document, which had to include recommended actions. Um, it also states in the statute that the recommendations must be implemented, unlike some other planning documents. So that was um, very um, supported by people that had the concerns. 
So the purpose of the plans was long-term enhancement of coastal fisheries by addressing habitat more quality needs. So these plans are updated on five-year cycles, and the first one was completed in 2004, the end of 2004. And at our November commission meeting, um, the 2021 amendment was just approved. So there are some documents in your briefing material. Um, one is a sheet that describes the chip process in more detail. And then there's a, a, a two-pager that just summarizes the amendment for you really quick. Takes it down way small. <laughs> so I encourage you to look at that. Um, so just briefly, the, um, this plan um, includes five issue papers. And just like in FMPs, if issue papers are where management options are discussed and, um, and, and raised. So um, this, in, this amendment is a little different than others because there's a lot of focus on water quality improvements. We felt after a lot of discussions with core members that it is the root of everything since water quality affects the condition of the other habitats as well as the fish. And so we also made a change to include the recommended actions within the issue papers instead of having a separate implementation plan document to sort of make it more actionable. And um, it also includes some recommendations for rulemaking just like fishery management plans do as well. So we were very happy that we had the support to do that because we were hearing that the plan needed to have more teeth. So um, with that, the, the five issue papers you can see there, one is focusing on SAV protection and restoration through water quality improvements, which is the number one cause of the decline of SAV. Wetland protection and enhancement through nature-based solutions like putting in living shorelines, doing wetland restoration, buffers, um, improving environmental rule compliance, improving our wastewater infrastructure to prevent sanitary sewer overflows, and putting in place some good habitat monitoring so we can assess trends. And so because a lot of these recommended actions involve a lot of collaboration with more than one agency, we held a kickoff meeting in June. So the plan had been approved, but the purpose was just to get everybody back together and review what actions that you know we needed to, to start working on, make sure everybody knew what their responsibilities were and the timeline. So the meeting was also just an opportunity to make sure all the other divisions were on board and supportive. Um, we invited Secretary Beiser, who was there, several of the division directors, and others that are involved from the divisions on working on these plans, and some of the CHIP Steering Committee. And so for the newbies, CHIP Steering Committee is a subset of two commissioners from the three commissions that are involved. And so they were kind of like our, our, working, our working team. But because we've had a lot of turnover, especially Marine Fishery Commission, we're going to need some new commissioners on that committee. Um, we need two, two new people to consider if they'd like to be on this very interesting and rewarding <laughs> committee. We, we plan to have one by the end of the year, so um, somebody will be in touch. Um, so what have we done um, since it got approved? We've been working a lot on habitat assessments, so there's a large group working on some putting in place some wetland monitoring and that's being done um, in support or in coordination with the South Atlantic Salt Marsh Initiative. So we have a lot of support there through other agencies and the Department of Defense as well. Also, the division has been working on its pilot project of a new method of mapping the shellfish habitat. So we're finishing up. They selected 10 sentinel sites to try and map with drones. Um, so on the right, you can see a typical intertidal shellfish reef. Shellfish reef. Um, and so with the drone, they can go out in one day, and we have selected areas, so not the whole creek, but 100 acres, and they will map that in a day quickly. It's very high resolution, and then they can um, take that back to the office, and they put the imagery into GIS uh, program and they can delineate roughly um, the intertidal oyster reefs and the salt marsh 
And then they will just go back into the field with those maps, make refinements, and they do some additional um, sampling in the subtitle areas, and then they'll sample all of the different strata. So this is sort of a resulting map. This is Hewlett Creek. The different colors, it's hard to see, but they all have um, letters for the different um, classifications of shellfish strata that we have. So we're really um, excited that this could be a great way to more rapidly reassess certain areas so we can look at the trends of those, those areas. And then we've also been working a lot on that SAV issue paper. So there's been a lot of monitoring this summer. We monitored along with our partners at APNEP, as well as some volunteer uh, research groups, as well as retired scientists, all helped um, uh, sample core sound for SAV. And then we also were fortunate to get a, a North Carolina government intern who helped us in Pamlico River sample the low salinity grasses at 10 Sentinel sites there. So we're plugging along with a lot of extra effort from a lot of people because we don't have those dedicated um, habitat sampling positions yet that we hope we get one day. Um, and then there's also been some work on, uh, on the Im implementing water quality measures that are regulatory. And I think when we talked in November, I think Mike asked me, what do you think is the most important recommended action in this? And I, and I said, this one, the one to implement light penetration standard for SAV. Because light penetration is affected by runoff, as well as other things that get into the water, but nutrients and sediment. And so I'm very happy that the Division of War Resources has taken this seriously. They've been meeting with a group called the Nutrient Criteria Development Plan Scientific Advisory Council. It's a mouthful, but they did have a meeting in July, and at that meeting, they agreed by consensus to recommend to the EMC to implement light penetration standards as they were specified in the CHIP. So they'll be meeting again to finalize up the rule standard language, um, and it's expected to go to the EMC in spring. So we're really happy about that. And then I just wanted to point out that improving that water quality for the SAV, we felt like it was the most important because SAV is sort of the canary or an umbrella species. You know, it is the most sensitive. So if you can improve conditions for the grass, you can improve conditions for the shellfish, for the juvenile fish, for really everything. So we're excited that this is helping with the fishery management plan needs. So in our fishery management plans, we have... Um, uh, recommendations about habitat and water quality as well. And then those usually get, you know, sent over to the CHIP folks to kind of deal with. And so by having these actions in this amendment of the CHIP, it will address multiple um, management actions in, in multiple fishery management plans. So, for example, the blue crab had to improve habitat and water quality. The bay scallop. I mean, SAV is critical. It's the most critical habitat for uh, bay scalp, red drum, and shrimp in the last FMP that just went to you had things about um, improving and protecting the, the seagrass. So there, there are many more, but um, we're happy that this is just going to be um, very positive and interactive and, and will help more than just the habitat. Um, and then we did have a recommendation in there about forming a public-private partnership. And I, you probably remember that. And the idea was to bring in a broader group of people that are maybe supportive and others that are maybe on the fence and not sure and educate them and get them excited and on board so they can spread the word, the outreach, but also to actively give them a task. So, you know, based on their expertise. So we've started working on this by a core group of, of DMF, APNEP, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, and North Carolina Coastal Federation. We've been meeting. We've planned um, a water quality summit, and that's going to be October 19th. So you may hear about that. And the purpose of that is to, to really invite a broad group of people, see who's interested in helping in this effort, and then... Um, get ideas, too, at that meeting for what they want to do. So that's, that's going on. 
And then um, last, I think you're familiar, there's a lot of coastal resilience efforts going on right now. So because of that governor's executive order 80, the, the plan on the left, Climate Risk Assessment and Resilience Plan, was formed, it has a lot of recommendations. There's a Natural Working Lands Action Plan, and there's a group that DCM has staff over of the Resilient Coastal Communities Program. That's a big grant program that's giving out money to local communities that apply to do things to improve their resilience. And so a lot of the actions in the CHIP are also geared about improving resilience. So we've been meeting with their staff and trying to ensure that they include CHIP recommendations, or at least the concepts of it, into their programs, like into, into criteria. To get your grant, you have to include nature-based solutions to reduce your runoff. You have to include repairing your wastewater pipes that have been bursting right next to the creek, you know, or moving them out. So things like that. So Jacob and I mostly have been meeting with staff from those organizations. And so that's all I have for my update, unless there's questions. Right. Thank you. Any questions? Commissioner Schell. I just have a comment that I would absolutely love to be involved and offer my services because the marsh is my wheelhouse and I'm there almost every day. So I would love to help out. Awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. You know, the questions, comments. I've got two myself. Um, I can first, firsthand support the, the idea that clear water grows SAV. We've got a lake at my hunting camp, and the water is crystal clear, and the vegetation has overtaken it. So uh, water quality is, is a real issue. <laughs> How often do you all remap with the drones on these areas? On the intertidal oysters? Yes. So it is a pilot project. So right now, they we picked what we thought was manageable, 10 sites. It has taken us two years. This, the staff that does it is Owen's staff. It's the shellfish okay. leasing and mapping crew. Um, so it it's took them like a year and a half to get 10 sites done. So now the idea is we're going to revisit those sites, see if we need to drop some, add some. And we're not sure how, how frequent we should do it. Maybe every two years. I okay. mean, oysters don't change that rapidly, right? right? Um, and see what's manageable. Okay. But, so the key is spread them out, get different types of oyster reefs, and then and, and repeat it so we can look at the change. All right. Sounds good. Anything else about it? Commissioner Shell? Um, with the drone footage, I notice after every big storm, the marsh changes on me. And after dredging, the sandbars change. It all changes frequently. But definitely after storms, I would. I know it's hard to staff that. But yeah, jumping on that afterward would be a great comparison. Well, after Florence, Noah, I think it was Noah, did great imagery. And like Core Sound, they flew right after it. And they had imagery from before. And they showed the differences in... There's like, I forget how many, how many inlets were punched through there initially, like 15, Dorian, sorry, yeah. Yep, yep. I'll look at that, thank you. Yeah. Okay, anything else? Yes, Commissioner Wright. I know you know that I'm interested in this, but uh, in, uh, in the upgradient habitats, particularly for anadromous species and particularly for river herrings, I'm just wondering what programs currently are in place to track trends and adequacy of those habitats. My personal opinion after a lot of years out in those fields is that an awful lot of the tiny creeks, wooded creeks, uh, and not only those that had been previously blocked by culverts, but also by active forestry and other things are continuing to, to be degraded. And I just wondered if there is a way to extract a net uh, habitat adequacy related to river herring. I was going to bring it up later about the Herring plan, but it, it strikes me that our idea of what SSB is for that blueback herring stock may well be overly optimistic based on the inventory of such habitats. Just wondered if you have any comments. I have to say, we've kind of gotten stumped with the river herring because we did some, sur there were surveys done looking at obstructions and culverts, and it was like the river herring weren't, they just weren't getting up to even the first culvert. So the culverts weren't the cause, hydrology was the cause, or maybe it was the natural flow at that time. But it seems to be a flow issue, and nobody's really been able to tackle that that I know of. 
if we can just put that into the queue for other things to develop, because it really gets complicated when you, I'm going to sound like a broken record again, when you think about climate change impacts, again, mm -hmm. with net annual precipitation not, change, not projected to change much, but an increasing proportion of that in events, that changes the salinity regime, and then where within the basin um, different species reproductive action would be expected to occur. And so trying to manage for past conditions is going to be really hard when you don't have that inventory. And, you know, preaching to the choir, but I'm just really interested in us thinking as we go forward about how we can think about what, how to address some of those questions. We do have a nice salinity database um, and maps that we put together as part of that, the jurisdictional boundaries between wildlife and DMF using multiple programs and um, I can you weren't here then but I'd be glad to share those with okay, you because we, we talked about it I'd like to do that 30 years I think mm -hmm. okay anything else from anybody not and thank you for your work and very thank important you. stuff um, we've had a lot of good discussions this morning and done a lot of good things and it's pushed our schedule on down a little bit. Why don't we go ahead and break for lunch? It's 12.30 and be back here at 1.30, ready to go. Um, Laura, one of your assignments was to tell us where was going to be a good place to eat. Where would you find? Longhorn Steakhouse is right across the road. <laughs> I highly recommend you run over there because they get back in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that was cheating. Okay. We'll see you all back at one hour.
All right, take your seats. Cell phones off or at least don't vibrate. Let's see, all the commissioners are here. Staff's here. Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for waiting on me not to eat my lunch. <laughs> <coughs> okay, let's see. Oh, we are at the, finished with Ann, so we're getting ready to move into the ITP overview. So I'm going to ask Barbie Bird, to, um, who is our Protected Species Program Coordinator, to come up and give you an overview of the incidental take permits that the division has. And as Barbie is coming up and getting everything squared away for the presentation, I just wanted to make a, a few comments about the Protected Resources Program and uh, including our observer program. And I'm breathing heavy because I walked and not because of the topic, <laughs> but it could be either one. So the, the Division of Marine Fisheries has had um, Endangered Species Act Section 10 permits um, for the anchored estuarine gillnet fishery since 2000. So we have basically been in the ITB, ITP business, like it or not, for over 22 years. And these ITPs and this program in, as a whole has been one of the most difficult things that, that I have ever tried to deal with. And when I was the Fisheries Management Section Chief, this program came over to fisheries management. The misinformation and really blatantly disingenuous comments about this program uh, has plagued this division for over 20 years. It really has been very difficult. The most re recent approach is to cast as much bad light as you can on this program as a potential way to get rid of gill nets in this state. Uh, this is two separate issues. Getting rid of gill nets is one management issue, and the ITP is another issue altogether. The Division of Marine Fisheries has entered into these current ITPs, really, as a result of a lawsuit. And this lawsuit was filed by people who know turtles, understand turtles, and had concerns about statewide takes of sea turtles uh, in the anchored large mesh gill net fishery. The, and, and Barbie's going to talk about a lot of this, but the ESA um, allows certain levels of takes that are incidental to otherwise lawful activities. And currently in the state of North Carolina, anchored gill nets is a lawful activity. The, the, the ITP is really the way this is supposed to work. It, it is the vessel for permitted takes. We do not consider these ITPs or the observer program a bad practice or a failed program. There is no denying that this program has issues. We've had them from the beginning. It has challenges. We still have the same challenges in 2022 that we had in 2020. And Barbie's going to talk about that and the challenges that we face, but she's also going to talk about the fact that these challenges are not just North Carolina challenges. They are challenges that practically every observer program has. So the only way, and we've talked a lot about this over the course of the day, the only way I know to battle misinformation, and a lot of it in my opinion is very willful, uh, is to stick to the facts about the ITP. The observer program, what they are, what they are not, what they do, what they do not do, and what the challenges are. Because, I mean, we have to talk about the challenges as well. So we totally understand that and respect that conversation, and we're more than willing to have it. Barbie Bird joined the Division of Marine Fisheries in 2020 with over 25 years experience dealing with marine mammals, sea turtles, the ESA, ITPs, and observer programs. So we are very, very lucky to have her as a subject matter expert. So she, that's what she is here today to do, is to give the facts. And her presentation will cover some of the components of the ESA, a history of our ITPs here in North Carolina, and what they currently include. So I'm on shush up and turn it over to somebody that actually knows what they're talking about. So Barbie, thank you for being here.
including me, because um, now I have eaten. So, um, you know, many of you have read my commission memos uh, before, but I haven't had the opportunity to talk with um, any of you, really, um, until today. Um, so I'd like to provide just a brief introduction of who I am and where I've come from. So I've been at the division, as Kat said, since January 2020. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the biological supervisor of the Protected Resources Program. And that program houses the Observer Program, but it also houses a Marine Mammal Stranding Program for the Central Coast and Inland Waters north of the New River. Um, before that, um, I've been involved with research on marine mammals and sea turtles for over 25 years in California, Hawaii, and the U.S. East Coast and in Gulf Coast from New Jersey to Louisiana. But most of my time has been focused on North Carolina. I worked at the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NOAA Fisheries, for over 18 years in Beaufort. And while there, I worked on a various um, research projects related to stock assessments of bottlenose dolphins and understanding the characteristics and rates of bycatch of both uh, bottlenose dolphins and sea turtles in fishing gear. While there, I oversaw the Federal Alternative Platform Observer Program, which was in partnership with the Northeast Fishery Observer Program. And that program specifically targeted small gillnet vessels in North Carolina state ocean waters. Um, I also um, contributed to a best practices document for observer programs and marine mammal bycatch estimations for the European Union countries. And then before coming to the division, I've collaborated with division staff for a long time um, since 2001, so the year after the first ITP. All right, so let's stop talking about me. So as you know, the division has two current incidental take permits, or ITPs, under Section 10 of the Endangered Species Act. One is for sea turtles, and one is for Atlantic sturgeon. The sea turtle ITP expires in August of 2023, so as a result, we've been working and consulting with National Marine Fisheries Service to submit an application for a single incidental take permit that would cover sea turtles and sturgeon before the current sea turtle permit expires. But as we move forward in this process, we thought it would be really helpful to provide some background and context for what, as Kat mentioned, what is an ESA Section 10 incidental take permit. So let's start with a broad view. So as we all know, humans impact the environment in a variety of ways, and there are state and federal laws that have been developed to reduce the neg negative impacts of our activities on the environment and the species that depend on it. And one of those, of course, is the Endangered Species Act, and I'll be focusing on that. So although the ESA prohibits takes of listed species, the Act contains several provisions that allow a certain level of takes that are incidental to otherwise lawful activities. And so what do we mean when we say take? So as um, the ESA defines take, it is the, um, it's defined as to harass, to harm, pursue, to hunt, to shoot, to wound, to kill, to trap, to capture, or collect, or to attempt to engage in any such conduct. But incidental take is an unintentional, but not necessarily an unexpected taking. So what are these provisions that um, authorize takes that are incidental to these otherwise lawful activities? So there are um, two main sections that I'll talk about today that are really mirrors of each other. One is the section seven of the ESA, and it includes what is termed a consultation on federal actions or actions with some sort of federal connection that might affect an ESA listed species or its designated critical habitat. So where appropriate, biological opinions are prov um, provide an exemption, exemption for this take of incidental species, of listed species, and then the appropriate federal agency, whether it be National Marine Fisheries Service or the Fil uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, depending on the species, they can issue a biological opinion for the action. And this action, and that includes this biological opinion, has a goal of analyzing the impacts and minimizing possible adverse effects on the particular listed species. So section 10 of the ESA is a similar process, but it's for non-federal action. So they're really mirrors of each other. And rather than a biological opinion, the federal agency may issue incidental take permits, or ITPs, that 
we say all the time. But it has the same goal it, of minimizing possible adverse effects on particular listed species. So in each case, a biological opinion with an associated and still take statement or an ITP may be provided only if the proposed project or action will not reduce the likelihood of survival and the recovery of an ESA listed species. So issuance of an ITP is also a federal action and stay with me here because this gets really confusing. Um, so for National Marine Fisheries Service to provide us a Section 10 permit or any Section 10, 10 permit to anyone, that is a federal action, them giving or providing that ITP. So one agency, one office, I guess, within National Marine Fisheries Service has to consult with another office in this case, National Marine Fisheries Service, on the federal action of providing us the Section 10 permit. So it also undergoes the Section 7 biological um, opinion. I'll talk about that again with that sink in a minute because it's confusing for sure. Okay, so let's talk about some examples. So as mentioned, Section 7 consultations occur on actions that are performed by or funded by federal agencies. And there are a variety of activities here, um, shown here that have Section 7 biological opinions. And all of these authorize some level of takes of ESA listed species. So an example that's kind of local that you might know about is there is a biological opinion on recent dredging operations off North Carolina. And this is for beach renourishment conducted by the US Army Corps of Engineer and Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management, or BOEM. So in this example, the Corps of Engineers and BOEM consulted with National Marine Fisheries Service to estimate the level of interactions for several listed species, including sea turtles and um, sturgeon, two species with dredge operations. This consultation also included plans to monitor the interactions during these activities and to develop mitigation strategies to lessen the number and the severity of those interactions. So I wanted to pause a moment on this example fisheries regulations because it's nuanced and confusing. And so I, I just felt it was really important to walk through this slowly. So fisheries that are managed by federal actions, such as federal regulations or federal permits, not ITP permits, but other types of permits, they must undergo a Section 7 consultation if any takes are expected. And oftentimes these result in biological opinions authorizing those takes. So I felt it was important to walk through some examples. So National Marine Fisheries Service, as we know, per, um, requires turtle excluder devices for the US South Atlantic and Gulf Coast shrimp trawl fisheries. They also um, require specific gear modifications in the Virginia pound net fishery to reduce sea turtle interactions in both of those fisheries. And those regulations were implemented by the federal agency National Marine Fisheries Service. So, a Section 7 consultation had to occur for those fisheries. Similarly, any regulations that are a result of federal council FMPs must also go through a Section 7 consultation. And then another recent example is um, pier type structures that are constructed with federal funds must also undergo, undergo Section 7 consultations for takes of ESA listed species and hook and line gear. So a recent example, a local example, is the remnant of the Bonner Bridge. So this was funded in part by federal funds and has a biological opinion for the incidental takes of sea turtles and manta rays from recreational hook and line fisheries. And then a final example that I alluded to earlier is the Division Section 10 incidental take permits. So again, for NEMS to pr provide a Section 10 ITP to an, um, an entity, it also has to undergo a Section 7 consultation within the agency for it to be um, approved. Okay, so let's talk about Section 10. So this process really is the counterpart to Section 7, but it's for non-federal actions that have the potential of takes. So this process requires an application for the ITP that includes conservation plans to monitor, minimize, and mitigate takes of listed species and otherwise lawful activities. Current Section 10 ITPs include electric power companies in at least three states, 
research sampling activities in three states, and fisheries in two states. So Georgia's ITP is for the incidental take of short nosed and Atlantic sturgeon and their commercial shad fishery. Um, currently, South Carolina is in consultation, uh, I shouldn't use the word consultation because then it sounds like it's a section seven. They are talking with National Fisheries now to apply for an incidental take permit um, in the South Carolina shad fishery. And Massachusetts is also talking with National Fisheries Service about a section 10 permit, but I'm not sure what fishery. So DMF has had a series, as Kat mentioned, we've had a series of ESA Section 10 permits for the estuarine anchored gillnet fishery since 2000, so for 22 years. And the original ITPs covered just the large mesh fall flounder gillnet fishery in Pamlico Sound, but the spatiotemporal scope of the ITPs has changed a lot over the years. And both, a lot of that is because more information that's been gathered by observer programs, both state and federal. So let's talk about the beginning. So the genesis of these ITPs began in 1999 when there was a marked increase in sea turtle strandings in southeastern Pamlico Sound. And preliminary data indicated that this increase in strandings was due in part to incidental takes um, in the fall gillnet fishery for flounder specifically. So as a result, the division applied for and received an ITP in 2000 for the fall fishery in southeastern Pamlico Sound. And part of that ITP required observer coverage. And observer data from that year really highlighted that it was the deep water portion of that fall flounder fishery that was responsible for most of the takes and certainly for most of the mortality of those takes. So in 2001, the division applied for and received another ITP. And this conservation plan closed the deep waters of Pamlico Sound. It established shallow water areas where the fishery could occur and it created inlet corridor closings to protect sea turtles migrating of estuarine waters. Then between 2002 and 2012, the division received two multi-year ITPs with evolving conservation plans based on information gathered largely from the observer program. Um, at the time, the division had sought out funding opportunities to observe gillnets outside of the spatiotemporal scope of the fall flounder fishery, including observations of small mesh gillnets, but these observations were limited based on constraints and funding. So in the summer of 2009, the National Fisheries Service Southeast Regional Office in Florida provided limited funding to have the alternative platform observer program that I managed at the Beaufort Lab conduct observations in and around lower core sound and back sound. The documented takes from those observations, takes of sea turtles specifically, uh, led to a series of conversations between the division and National Marine Fisheries Service since those takes were not authorized per the current ITP um, that was just the fall flounder fishery in southeastern Pamlico Sound. So the division began these conversations with National Marine Fisheries Service about applying for a statewide ITP. And before the application be, could be com completed, the, um, February, the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic filed suit against the division and the North Carolina Marine Fisheries Commission on behalf of the Karen Beasley Sea Turtle Rescue and Rehabilitation Center for violating the ESA by allowing gear to be used that had unauthorized takes of sea turtles. In May of 2010, a settlement agreement was reached to minimize sea turtles across the state while the division worked um, on a final application for a statewide ITP. In August of 2013, the division received the current sea turtle ITP, and this ITP includes measures outlined in the settlement agreement to minimize sea turtle take statewide. It established take thresholds and required observer coverage of anchored small and large mesh gillnets statewide for spring, summer, and fall. In July 2014, the division received the current Atlantic Sturgeon ITP, and it included many of the same provisions of the sea turtle ITP to minimize Atlantic Sturgeon take statewide. Um, it established authorized take levels of Atlantic Sturgeon and extended observer coverage of small and large mesh gillnets into winter. Um, the initial application for this ITP was prompted by discussions with National Marine Fisheries Service based on their intent to list the Carolina distinct population segment as endangered under the ESA. 
So that's the history. So over the years, the scope of the ITPs, you know, they've widened to include all seasons, large and small mesh anchored gillnets, and all estuarine coastal waters and Atlantic sturgeon, where they really started out just as a sea turtle focus. The division ITPs, like other ITPs and Section, section 7 biological opinions, include actions to monitor, minimize, and mitigate incidental takes. So let's walk through these um, components because they're really important in the conservation plans in these ITPs. So for the division ITPs, this monitoring includes an observer program. Um, as I mentioned previously, you know, historically funding for the observer program was difficult um, to come by. This is kind of before my time, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, observer, observer program is, is not um, an inexpensive program. But in 2015, the North Carolina General Assembly established the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund through statute. And the monies for this fund come from an increase in um, the division's commercial fishing license fees. And by law, fully funds the division's observer program to fulfill obligations of the ITPs for sea turtles and Atlantic sturgeon. So the next part of the conservation plan is to minimize takes. So data that are collected on observed trips have been used to develop gillnet regulations during an ITP period and in subsequent ITPs. Um, that, and these regulations are intended to reduce the number of takes and increase the survival of the takes that do occur. Regulations included in the current and previous ITPs um, include the deepwater flounder gillnet fishery in Pamlico Sound being closed, closing of a sea turtle hotspot around back and lower core sound to large mesh gillnets during periods of high sea turtle abundance and reducing gillnet effort and thus take levels in terms of net length and soak times. The ITPs also include this adaptive management approach whereby additional regulations can be implemented quickly when incidental takes are approaching authorized levels. And, and we've done that quite a bit over the years. So a recent example is the closure of management unit A to gill nets due to the estimated um, dead takes of Atlantic sturgeon approaching that which was authorized in the ITP. Mitigation measures are based on um, biological needs of the covered species. And so these are really designed to offset the impacts of the takes from the covered activities to the maximum extent practical. Examples include Outreach activities for, um, for interactions with protected species, um, providing sturgeon fin clips for genetic analyses, maintaining acoustic receivers, and providing those acoustic detections of sturgeon that are tagged by outside researchers, and the supportive actions to enhance habitat, such as the chip that Ann talked about earlier. All of these things um, help to offset the impacts of these takes. So Section 10 ITPs, like Kat mentioned, they are a process, just like Section 7 biological opinions are a process for federal actions or those with federal connections. And by having and applying for ITPs, we are complying with federal regulations. The division's ITPs come with challenges and benefits, as we all know. And one of these challenges is observer coverage. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon um, at all for this to be a problem with um, observer programs was certainly something that we are trying to address. So there is a subset of fishermen. They take our calls, they call us, they schedule trips, they report um, interactions even when we're not on board. But unfortunately, this is a small subset. Um, outright refusal is um, incredibly rare, but avoidance seems to be common, and some of that uh, information about avoidances in the memos that I've provided to you, at least since I've been here. So in response to this challenge, we're in the process of developing a call-in system. And, and Mike mentioned something like this earlier. Um, this would require fishermen to contact the division before they plan to fish. So then fishermen would be randomly selected of whether or not they have to carry an observer and this is very similar to NOAA's observer program that covers the scallop fishery. And we've had discussions with the, the program managers for that um, industry-funded observer program. And we're working with the Department of Environmental Quality at um, their IT to explore both an online and an automatic voice response system. 
and we're consulting with the division management to make sure we're prepared to enforce the requirement when fishermen don't comply. And we're, when we're a little bit further down the road and we have more information from IT, um, we plan to have um, regional meetings with commercial fishermen to talk about the nuances of that program and really get some input on um, some of the ways that we feel like that would work best. All right. So in addition to observer data being used to minimize the incidental take of sea turtles and sturgeon, there are benefits to these data. So as was mentioned earlier, you know, fisheries dependent data that are collected during onboard observations provide a valuable source of data. And then I have to wear my glasses so I can see this is this part is really small. I don't want to get this wrong. Hold on. Um, so, you know, we collect data on catch, bycatch, regulatory discard information. Um, these data are used in stock assessments and helpful in the development of fishery management plans. Observer data provide a better understanding of the fishery overall, and um, they provide information on targeted and non-targeted catch, and they really allow the division to stay ahead of changes over time to both fishing practices and catch composition. And finally, as mentioned before, observer data do inform the adaptive management approach that is used during the current ITPs to maintain takes under authorized levels authorized by the ITPs. Let's see, hold on. Um, so I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, we've provided the email up here for the observer program, and there are several people that have access to this email to help make sure that um, we are able to respond to your inquiries um, quickly. Uh, as a reminder to all of the commercial fishermen in the audience or listening online, um, we'll be reaching out to you to schedule onboard observations for this upcoming southern flounder gillnet season, and we appreciate your cooperation to ensure that we meet the observer coverage requirements that we need for the ITPs. Thank you. Questions or comments? Commissioner Rollo. Um, could you touch a little bit on how small mesh was included to be an observed fishery? Because, you know, it was my understanding in the previous ITPs, um, we didn't observe small mesh until the 2013. Is that correct? Could you touch base on the history of that a little bit? I can, with the caveat of I, this was before my time here. So, so if I say this wrong, you get me? <laughs> Make sure I get this right. So um, for the statewide ITP, we didn't really have a lot of observations of small mesh gear. But we had a couple of observations of, of four, some, somewhere between four and five inch. And one of the things that National Marine Fisheries Service really likes in the ITPs is being able to model the total take, not just the observed number, but a total take. And so by including, this is my understanding, so by including the four inch as the definition of large mesh for the sea turtle ITP, it enabled um, the division to model that total estimated take. Um, and so that is why um, we started providing that difference in definition of, of small mesh versus large mesh that really was different than um, what had been considered large mesh before and certainly not consistent with our trip ticket program. Is that what you're, is that, does that ring true? Because yeah, I wasn't here at the time. The, you're, you're, you're getting to, actually, you, you actually got into my follow-up question, which was always a bit of confusion with people because the ITP defined large mesh differently than our state fisheries did, right? So that led to a lot of confusion. But currently speaking, what large mesh fisheries does the observer program observe under the ITP? The large mesh? Yeah, so what, what fisheries under the ITP's definition gotcha. are you observing? Does that make sense? Like, do you have the anchored gillnet, large mesh for flounder, and what else? And the American shad fishery. So it's in the, and that it's mostly the album model, correct? Uh, yes, that's true. So how many weeks a year is that now? Is that four weeks, five weeks? How many? Not so many. so I guess it's, it's, I mean, when we started this process, these were, we had a lot more striped bass, and we had a much longer American shad fishery with that co co coinciding with the striped bass bycatch fishery, and our flounder fishery is nearly year-round, and now we're looking at a few weeks, right? So. Um, one more question. Um, so when we look at this new Collins system, which I think is brilliant, 
because a lot of my frustrations have been listening to fishermen openly talk about how they get around taking observers and it kind of makes me angry. Um, is this going to be something that's going to be enforceable? Like if I were to say be a large mesh fisherman and I didn't call in and I was found with nets in the water, I would be in violation? Is that where you're going to for? Well, like, I mean, we're working with Marine Patrol to make sure that we're able to enforce that requirement. So but what I'm getting at is with a call-in system, if I'm going to fish tonight, I call in, I get some sort of confirmation. That way, if Marine Patrol is patrolling and runs into me, and I can't prove that I didn't call in already, therefore I'd be in violation. Is that where you're going with that? Sounds pretty good to yeah, me. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. And we are having, like I said, we're still having those discussions about what exactly the call-in system will look, will look like. But certainly, I mean, it's, it's important that we're able to um, comply with these ITPs, and it's very difficult with the level of cooperation that we're currently getting to do that. So the call-in system hopefully will be a, a huge help. We'll see. Is there a reason why you don't call the hail in hail out program? Hell no, I don't know the reason. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments? Not. Thank you for your presentation. Right. Very informative. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Barbie. Director. All right. Let's see. Okay. Moving on. Talk about DMF staff, which is my favorite thing. DMF does have an internal employee recognition program where staff can nominate their fellow employees for various awards. Uh, this quarter, we awarded two Division Certificate of Excellence awards and two Humanitarian awards. Uh, these awards go to staff members who go above and beyond their normal assigned tasks to get the job done, and certainly our division would not, uh, would not be what it is without the extra hard work of these folks. So our two Division Certificate of Excellence awards were given to Yan Lee, who is one of our stock assessment scientists in our fisheries management section. And the other one was given to Jennifer Harrell, who is an administrative assistant in our Marine Patrol section. And our two humanitarian awards uh, were given to Officer Eric Smith of our Marine Patrol and Debbie Manley, our administrative specialist in our fisheries management section. So we thank those employees for their extra hard work uh, here at the division. And Mr. Chairman, I have just one final thing uh, to talk about, and this is not my favorite topic. Uh, in fact, sometimes I feel like just crying about this topic, um, but I want to talk about uh, Deputy Director Dee Lupton, and this will be her last um, Marine Fisheries Commission meeting as she is retiring uh, from the division, effective December the 1st, with 30 years of service to the state of North Carolina and its citizens. This will be her last MSC meeting, and she started with the division in the summer of 1989 as a summer intern. And in June of 94, she was hired full-time as a fisheries biologist and came a, became a biologist supervisor in 1995. In 1999, she was named section chief for the license and statistics section, and she helped coordinate implementation of a new commercial fishing license, and more recently, which isn't really even recent anymore, the coastal recreational fishing license in 2007. She has developed and implemented, or helped develop and implement the Fisheries Information Network, or our FIN uh, network, which is one of two databases that we use daily at the division. And she worked her way up the chain to become the division's deputy director in 2007. And she heads up the day-to-day -day operations of this division, and she supervises eight section chiefs who oversee over 300 employees. Dee has held this position for 15 years. She, and I know she's gonna hate this, she was the first female deputy director and is the longest serving deputy director that this division has had. And those of us that work closely with Dee uh, recognize and value uh, her knowledge uh, that has come from years of extremely hard work and dedicated service. So Dee, on behalf of the Division of Marine Fisheries, I cannot thank you enough for your service to the department, the commission, the division and the citizens of North Carolina will miss you, but we wish you uh, the best in your well-deserved retirement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
D, on behalf of the commission, I think I can safely say that we all appreciate your, the work you've done, your dedication, you just being here. You've been one constant over the years that you were here. And that gave us a bit of a, a feel good to know that you're here and, and doing what you could do for the resource. And we thank you. We're going to miss you. Just don't be a stranger. I, I do want to say thank you, Kat, for everything. and. It is. It's been 30, 30, over 30 years of being in fisheries. Um, and I think my very first commission meeting, I was a bio one. Well, not the very first, but one of the first. I came up with overhead projector, projections from the trip ticket program so we could close down the Noose River due to Fisteria. So <laughs> that was a very, my first introduction to really tackling a tough subject. <laughs> And I think uh, Doug's dad, Mr. Ed, was sitting on the commission at the time. So, but I appreciate all the kind words, and uh, I may be a stranger here. <laughs> at least once a year. Just stop in to say hey. <laughs> but thank you, and wish you a lot of enjoyment in retirement. Okay, uh, you are you done with your? Yeah, I, I just will say that. D retires on December the 1st, and I hope we can get in the building on December the 2nd. I hope we can figure that out. But thank, you. <laughs> thank you, D. And, Mr. Chairman, what you have been waiting for all day, that wraps up my director's report. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, moving on to our standard commercial fishing license eligibility report and set eligibility cap. Captain Garland Yop, please come up. Green lights on. Can y'all hear me? Yes. I'm uh, Captain Garland Yop. I'm the chair of the Standard Commercial uh, Fishing License or Scuffle Eligibility Board. I'm also joined by, and I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> I'm Brandy Salmon. I'm the section chief for the License and Statistics section. So just just moral support. <laughs> no, she's the heart and soul of what I'm <laughs> what I'm reading. So um, thank you for the opportunity to come speak. Uh, today I'm here to give you a short presentation about the scuffle eligibility uh, pool determination that the Commission makes uh, each year. Um, give you a brief overview. Eligibility pools for an individual who does not hold a standard commercial fishing license but wants to purchase one, uh, wants to purchase a license through the Division of Marine Fisheries. They can apply to receive the license through the eligibility pool process. The application goes before board which determines if the applicant is qualified based on criteria set out in rule. Session law 1998-225, section 4.24, part of the Fisheries Reform Act established uh, the Scuffle Eligibility Board. This law also requires the commission to adopt rules to govern the operation of that board. The commission rules are found in 15A NCAC uh, 030.0400, and they set the requirements for eligibility board operation, the MFC setting the eligibility pool cap each year, and in 030.0403B, the application process for the eligibility pool and eligibility criteria. This chart shows how the number of available licenses are determined uh, for any particular year. The temporary cap for licenses was set at the number of valid endorsements to sell as of June 30th, 1999, plus an extra 500 for the eligibility pool. And that it brings the total to 8,896, less the number that were issued or renewed the previous year. You'll see in this slide uh, what was renewed in 2021-2022 uh, license year was 5,549. Um, we also had seven uh, licenses that were not yet issued. And uh, that is because individuals approved in the spring March 2022 meeting have until June 30th 
um, of the following license year of 2023 to purchase their standard commercial fishing license. So that brings the total of available uh, license for 2022-2023 to 3,340 that are available. Considerations uh, from 2021-2022 license year. There were 43 standard commercial fishing license applications received, 33 were approved, seven uh, pending, uh, nine denials, one tabled, and that was a 27% decrease in applications from the previous year. The, the one tabled, just a brief uh, explanation, we're waiting on feedback from our attorney about uh, issue with a corporation, so we're waiting to hear back. Um, and denials can come from a few different uh, areas. They can come from simply not, in, not meeting the eligibility requirement criteria, incomplete applications, licenses that are under suspension or revocation, and violation history. So there's different ways that denial can happen. This graph, um, you'll notice, is eligibility pool data for the last 10 years. On the left-hand side, the vertical column is the number of licenses that are available for any particular year. The bottom line uh, is your license year. The green line on this graph indicates the number of licenses available, and the blue line indicates the number of licenses that have been approved by the commission. Uh, from 2012 through 2016, the commission approved the total number of licenses available. The last four years, the commission has set the number to 500 licenses available for the pool. And that brings us to uh, the action item. Um, it's set to vote for the commission to vote to set the number of scuffles in the eligibility pool for the 2022-2023 license year uh, from the available license. And a reminder, the number of licenses available are 3,340, and uh, the last four years you've set it at 500, which has been adequate for the number of applications received. Questions or comments? Uh, Commissioner Bland. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to offer a motion. Uh, please do. Uh, I'd like to set the elig eligibility, the license cap at 500 for the eligibility pool. And I, if that's not the right language, I'll entertain. I think it is. Yeah. I'll second it. Yeah. Second by Commissioner Cross. Any further discussion on this? If not, roll call vote, please. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Shellam. Aye. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Thank Motion you. passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. Okay, we'll skip our lunch break and go right on into the fisheries management plan review. Brandy? Well, she probably want another lunch break, don't she? <laughs> I'm not trying to say anything. It says, it says, <laughs> our new commissioners, I know y'all have never served on a board like this. <laughs> okay. So I get to reintroduce myself for the second time. 
Back to back. Um, So I am Brandy Salmon again. I am the section chief for the license and statistics section. Um, And then to the right of me, I've got Lee Paramore, who is our northern district manager, who is in the fisheries management section. And then on the far end there, we've got Steve Poland, who is our section chief for our fisheries management section. Um, So we are going to talk to you all today about the annual monitoring of fisheries management plans known as FMPs. So there are a lot of details and a bunch of people um, collectively working in the background, um, but we'll just stick to one slide's worth, um, and that'll just give you an overarching flow of data as it moves through the division and then to the MFC. Um, So the first step is to collect the data. Simple, right? Um, Step two um, involves the analysis of the collected data and then updating the FMPs. And then finally, the last step uses the FMP updates to inform management decisions. So we'll commonly refer back to this slide um, throughout the PowerPoint to remind you all kind of where we are like in the process. So now I'm going to briefly explain what data we collect, how we collect it, and then how we store and process that data here at the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, So there are two types of data that are collected, so biotic and abiotic. So what in the world does that mean? Um, Biotic data is data that we collect from living things, and then abiotic data is data that we collect from non-living things. So there are so many different variables of data that the division collects, um, but a few examples of biotic data include things like lengths and weights, the age of fish using their otoliths or their ear bones, um, sex, genetics, and diet. And then for abiotic data, um, that includes things like gear types, water temperatures, and water samples, Um, socioeconomic data, uh, fishing effort, and habitat. So now that we know what data we want to collect, how do we go about collecting it? So there are two types of methods that we use, dependent sampling and independent sampling. So dependent sampling means that we rely on or depend on others or the fishery to provide us with data or the opportunity to sample. Um, So independent sampling means that we can independently go out and do the sampling and collecting ourselves without that reliance on others or the fishery for the data. So um, some examples of programs and surveys that collect dependent data are the quota monitoring program, the observer program, and even the fisheries economics program. So a few surveys that collect independent data are the juvenile trawl survey and the red drum long line survey. So a lot of the independent surveys at the division are referred to as programs. Um, So um, they're assigned a specific number for that program, too. So for instance, the independent gillnet survey is known as program 915. So of course, there are a lot of other programs and surveys that aren't listed. Um, So if you're interested in more information on our sampling projects, then please reach out to me or to Steve Poland. So now that we know what data we want to collect and we know how to collect it, but where does that data collection go? So um, the details get a little nerdy, but we're going to stick to the basics. Um, So the data gets entered into a database. So some databases are division owned, which are like the biological database, which we refer to as the BDB, um, and then the fisheries information network, which was mentioned earlier, FIN. Um, So other databases are hosted by other agencies, such as ALVIN, um, which is hosted by WRC for recreational license sales, and MRIP uh, is also hosted by NOAA for recreational catch and effort. So then the data is reviewed and then edited, and then we look for any mistakes or errors using quality assurance or quality control measures. And then once all of those QAQC checks are complete, then the data is officially stored as final and is ready to be used. So now I'm going to hand it over to Lee Paramore to talk about the annual FMP review. Okay, um, thank you, Brandy. So I'm going to build on information that Brandy provided to show you how the data collection and analysis leads to our annual FMP review. Um, guidance criteria set by the commission require that the division report um, the status of FMPs to the commission at the first business meeting after July, which is obviously this meeting here in August. So each year, the annual FMP reviews are done for um, our 13 state managed species or species groups. And we also have an additional 21 species or species groups that are managed by either the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission or one of the federal management councils. 
As Brandy mentioned, the FMP annual reviews for each species are informed each year um, by new data that are collected by the division. Each year, division biologists, um, they work very hard to update the annual FMP reviews, and they include the most up-to-date information from the previous year. Um, so when we produce this in August, we're updating through the previous calendar year. Um, each species report includes important information um, that is used to help inform management. Each spring species leads review available data for the species. They perform um, analysis. Um, they provide the results um, through the most recent year in graphs and tables that are included in each of the reports. This allows um, trends in landings and trends in monitoring and surveys to be reviewed. Staff also provide the most recent stock assessment results. And while we don't update stock assessments every year, um, we usually do it around every five years, um, we do look at the trends in landings and the surveys that are provided in the FMP reviews um, to provide additional information for each species. Um, finally, after a thorough update and review of the data each year, the division staff review the and assess management um, based on the most current information. Any recommendations or changes noted are highlighted and provided to you um, in this presentation each year. So the annual FMP review is available um, all the time on our website. Um, I think you also got it in your, in your mail out um, on your tablets. Um, so you can look at it. Um, what's on our website, click on the fishery management plan link and you have instant access. Or you can go to a 700 page document that Steve's holding up. Um, this slide provides a screenshot from our webpage um, for our fishery management plans. You can see that there are three links in blue in the center of the page under the fishery management plans. If you click on the first link, which says 2021 FMP review, August 2022, that's this big um, document that Steve's holding up in electronic form, so we save the trees. And it's a compilation of all 34 FMP updates for both the state managed species that I mentioned, as well as the, um, the ASMC and federal managed species in addition. Um, so this includes all 34 FMP updates in one document. Um, here we see the cover page of this big, very big, large document that Steve's holding up. <laughs> um, we always provide this update to you at your August meeting. You have access to the report, as I said, anytime year round from our division website. And it's a great um, resource, and we're going to go over some of the things that are available to you in this. And both staff and hopefully you as commissioners and the public can use this as any time they want from our website. So for each of the FMP updates um, in the annual review, each species update um, has the same exact layout. This includes the history of the plan for that species, the management unit for that species, the goals and objectives of that individual plan, a description of the stock, including um, the biology of the species, the most up-to-date stock status, as well as a description of the fishery, which includes um, commercial and recreational fisheries landings data. Um, and then they also have a summary of key regulations. Um, they include a monitoring program um, information that provides detailed trends on surveys data for each of the species. Um, we also include each year an up-to-date research needs section um, along with the management strategy section. And in this section, you can um, have a short summary of how the FMP applies and how it's managed through the FMP, each of the FMPs that are written for this, these species. Finally, for the 13 state managed species, um, any needed recommendations um, on the need for the next FMP review are made and based on the update of the data and the information provided in the annual review. Um, just going back to our website, just to kind of get you a little bit familiar with what you see when you go online, um, you can choose to look at the individual species as opposed to the large document that we have on the table. Um, so for, to do that, you would just click on either the second bullet or the third bullet, the blue links that are provided on the page. And these would provide access to either the state managed species or the federally managed or interjurisdictional species. Just for an example, where I've put the red arrow here, we're going to pretend that we're clicking on the state managed species. And when you do that, you're going to see a drop down. And this provides just the first um, seven of the 13 um, state managed species here. So now as just an example, we're going to explore some inform information that's available in the FMP update um, using blue crabs as an example. So just pretend we click on blue crab. 
then we're going to see this drop down. And um, <clears throat> if you click on the blue link, you'll be able to open up the, the shorter, just species-specific FMP annual update, which typically is about 15 or so pages. Um, the text below the link here is what we call our web blurb, and it provides a quick summary um, for the species of interest. Here, in the case of blue crabs, it provides information on stock status. Um, it provides the most recent management action taken through the FMP. A very important note here is that it provides contact information for the species lead. So if you want to reach out to one of our staff um, who are experts on the particular species, you have direct information to contact them and certainly encourage you to do so if you have questions. Um, clicking on the blue box that's shown on the screen will open the annual FMP update for blue crabs. Um, I previously covered each of the sections um, that are included in each of the FMP updates. So here I'm just going to provide some examples of data that are synthesized and summarized by staff each year. I'm using blue crab as the example. While the layout of each of the FMP updates is exactly the same in terms of the sections, the data provided in the tables and graphs for each species is unique and based on information that is most pertinent um, to that fishery. So here, just as an example, um, we see some pie charts for blue crab from the FMP update. And they show landing summarized for each year for the year 2021, which would be the most recent year that would be included. Um, the figure on the left shows blue crab um, landings by gear type. And the one on the right shows um, blue crab by um, the crab type or crab stage. Here we clearly see that most of the harvest occurs from crab pots, probably no surprise to you, um, as the primary gear. And on the right, we see that most blue crabs are harvested when they're in the hard crab stage. But you can also see other gears, as well as pillar crabs and soft crab harvest in comparison. Here we have just another example of a graph that provides annual blue crab landings occurring from 1987 to um, 2021. Um, FMP updates will also include recreational harvest um, and release information when available from the recreational fisheries. Of note in the graph for blue crabs is a declining trend over time, um, with the two most recent years, 2020 and 2021, being um, some of the lowest landings we've seen in the time series. And we don't always necessarily consider this to be a, a bad sign, but when we've seen a decline in blue crabs, both North Carolina, Virginia, and some other states. And I'll show that some of our indices are also showing a decline in blue crabs in recent years. So we try to look at the whole picture when we're looking at these, at these FMP updates. Um, not provided here, but in each of the FMP updates are graphs that provide um, on the size of harvested species across both the recreational and commercial fisheries. So there'll be some length distributions and th that type of data also provided. So for each FMP update, um, data collected through the North Carolina Fisheries Independent Surveys is provided as well. Um, for each species annual FMP update, the surveys that contribute to tracking trends in that species abundance are included. So some surveys track juvenile abundance, while others may attract adult abundance for a species. Each is important to understanding the health of the population. Um, the blue crab stock assessment uses inputs from several fishery independent surveys. Um, these include for North Carolina, our estuarine trawl survey, our Pamlico Sound survey, as well as our juvenile anadromous trawl survey. In the graph above, um, you will see uh, the male and female recruit for juveniles males on the left and females on the right. Um, and this index is provided from our estuarine trawl survey. Um, like landings of note here are the low values at the end of the time series with the lowest values in 2020 and 2021 for both males and females. In the graph um, shown here, um, the male, this is for the male and female fully recruited. So this would be your larger legal size blue crabs. Um, this index is provided from our fall anadromous trawl survey. In contrast to the previous slide, this provides um, this survey provides an index for the larger blue crabs. Um, the index itself is more variable from year to year um, and really has no apparent trend. Um, again, values in 2020 and 21 do decrease over what we've seen in more recent years. So now that um, you've been provided with an example of um, the type of information available in the blue crab um, that is available to you to the annual FMP reviews, Steve will now talk you through the highlights um, for our key state species and some high points for 2021. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Lee. Um, so Randy and Lee covered what types of information we include in 
FMP updates, um, and you'll hear me flip back and forth between FMP updates and um, FMP reviews um, because these documents are um, reviews of the uh, FMPs annually, um, and um, we are required by statute to review these every five years, but we just do it all at one time and we um, provide these FMP updates on an annual basis. So, um, Brandy and Lee, you know, covered the types of information included in here and how they're structured. So now I'm going to highlight the uh, utility of these updates for informing um, the management discourse and how we at the division use these to monitor the fisheries and make recommendations um, to you on management under these FMPs. And I'm just going to point out a few key species and trends that we feel uh, we need to bring to your attention today. Um, some good, some, you know, um, we, we might have a little concern over. All right, <clears throat> so today I'm going to be summarizing uh, just state managed species for federal and interstate fisheries. Uh, Chris Bat Savage and Trish Murphy, who you both uh, are, you know, who both addressed um, the commission earlier, uh, typically cover uh, the species um, for federal and um, interstate plans. Um, however, the division does provide FMP reviews of these species, and uh, we include these every year in our annual fishery management plan review document. Uh, these FMP reviews, um, they're really an invaluable reference document about the uh, latest status of fisheries in North Carolina. And as Lee mentioned, they include information on current and historical trends in landings and discards, uh, also summaries of various uh, fishery monitoring programs that the division administers, and a detailed summary of management strategies adopted by the Marine Fisheries Commission through your fishery management plans. So in practice, the division uses these annual reviews to evaluate the current state of the stock relative to uh, landings and survey data, um, if it's available, to consider if any changes to management or monitoring are needed. This can range from modifying the timing of stock assessments and assessment updates, uh, if information suggests that this may uh, provide better and more timely management advice. Um, this information can also be used in adjusting the timing of FMP reviews and uh, FMP development if an emerging issue necessitates uh, more immediate action, or if management should be adjusted in the moment following the adaptive management measures included in many of the fishery management plans. And um, just a quick note on adaptive management. Uh, these are measures that are um, predetermined in fishery management plans that the MSC adopts. Um, and these include a list of actions and or frameworks uh, that typically empower the director to utilize proclamation authority to adjust management in more real time. These adaptive measures uh, essentially just specify what the variable conditions are that the director may use their proclamation authority to address um, and what those actions uh, may be. So um, they are prescriptive in nature. All right, so now onto the plan reviews. I'm going to highlight a, a few notable trends from some of our state managed species and talk a little bit about um, how we have responded or plan to respond to uh, what we're seeing. So first, um, I want to highlight blue crab. Lee did a good job walking you through the blue crab FMP review, and I just wanted to expand on a few things um, that he did point out. So the North Carolina blue crab stock was last assessed in uh, 2018, and it was determined that the stock was overfished and overfishing was occurring. Uh, the MFC adopted Amendment 3 to the blue crab FMP in uh, 2020, which included measures to address the overfished and overfishing status of the stock. And these measures included implementing a uh, five inch minimum size limit for mature female hard crabs, uh, closed harvest period, um, prohibiting the harvest of immature female hard crabs, and a 5% uh, cold tolerance. This amendment also included adaptive management measures, which provide the director of PROC authority to implement measures to achieve sustainable harvest um, as informed um, by the stock assessment or subsequent stock assessment update. So over the last few years, we've heard from numerous uh, fishermen and dealers um, <clears throat> uh, about blue crab and how the numbers um, appear to be down across the state. So it is worth noting um, <clears throat> that the number of trips um, have remained consistent over this time. And as you see here on the figure on the left, which is showing uh, landings 
Um, so with uh, consistent effort, we're still um, seeing a decline um, in landings. Um, so uh, I at least wanted to point that out as far as uh, fishery dependent information we have that, um, you know, a, a decline in effort is probably not the fact, a factor uh, contributing to these reduced landings. So this is corroborated by our uh, numerous uh, division fishery um, independent sampling uh, programs that show declining landings and abundance of crabs. Um, so over here on the right, this is our uh, female juvenile index of blue crabs. And Lee pointed this out too um, when he was walking through the FMP. But you also see a uh, decline um, in the last uh, couple years as well. So given this information and the concerns raised by stakeholders, uh, we've decided um, to move the assessment update up in the schedule and begin work on uh, an assessment update for blue crab uh, this year. Uh, this should provide the director and the Marine Fisheries Commission with the best available information to consider uh, which actions may need to be taken um, in the future to um, address this stock. All right, next, uh, we're on to base scallop. So Amendment 2 was adopted in uh, 2015, and it set abundance thresholds for opening the base scallop fishery. And these triggers are based on annual sampling that the division um, does uh, every year. Um, and uh, based off of this sampling, and it forms um, season and um, trip limits um, based on area if the trigger uh, to open is met. So after many years of not opening uh, the base scallop fishery, um, it has opened the last two years um, in Core Sound. And this picture here, this is uh, David Skinner, one of our technicians out of the uh, Central District Office. And this is from sampling done last month in Core and Back Sounds. Um, so uh, seeing promising numbers of base scallops uh, in those areas. And um, again, like I stated, the division continues to monitor uh, the base scallop abundance in these areas, and uh, we'll continue to follow the base scallop plan if uh, those triggers are met and um, open that up. And I just wanted, um, you know, to really point out base scallop because this is an example where um, management and adaptive management in the plan, um, you know, kind of follows through. So in that plan, these triggers were established, the division monitors, and when those triggers are met, uh, the fishery opens. All right, next, I want to move on to uh, estuarine striped bass and specifically the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River stock. Um, you're slated later today to take final action on Amendment 2 um, to this fishery management plan, but I wanted to highlight a few trends in uh, fishery independent data um, for you. Uh, but before I do that, um, just real brief history on the stock. So the most recent assessment for the stock was completed um, in 2020. Um, and indicated that the stock was overfished and overfishing was occurring. The uh, commission adopted a revision uh, through adaptive management in uh, Amendment 1 in November of 2020, which dropped the total allowable landings for the stock from 275,000 pounds to 51,216 pounds. And this was in an effort to rebuild the stock. Since that time, fishery independent data from DMF and WRC surveys um, it's not really painted a rosy picture for the stock. So as you can see, um, over the last three years, the juvenile and adult abundance of striped bass in the management unit um, has not increased. So over on the left, uh, this is data from our juvenile um, index for a striped bass. And over on the right, this is um, from the WRC's um, electrofishing survey that they do on the spawning ground. So. Uh, both of these independent surveys are um, you know, showing declining trends, um, not only in juvenile, but adult abundance of uh, striped bass in this stock. So this has raised concerns um, you know, with managers and division staff, and we've decided to update the assessment again with information uh, through this fishing year. So we anticipate that the assessment update will be completed in time for your November 2020 to business meeting, um, and we'll bring that to you um, and provide you a presentation on those results, and then um, you know, have a discussion on um, any response, um, if needed, um, based off the results of that updated assessment. So before we move on, I'd also like to highlight one obvious issue with some of the monitoring data that you see here um, on this graph, um, the one on the right. 
um, and you'll see an upcoming slide. So due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and subsequent quarantine orders and executive orders, sampling for many of our surveys uh, was disrupted during 2020. And this resulted in holes in many of our survey indices uh, just due to the inability uh, to get out and sample. All right, next, uh, we're going to move on to uh, speckled trout or uh, spotted sea trout. The last stock assessment for this species uh, occurred in 2015 and indicated that the stock was not overfished and overfishing was not occurring. Uh, current management of the species is still following the original FMP adopted, adopted in 2012 and a supplement to that plan, uh, which was adopted in 2014. And the plan included adaptive management for the stock following cold stuns, uh, where the director um, may close the fishery until the following spring if a significant cold stun occurs. So the last such event occurred um, early in 2018, the first couple days of 2018, and the director at the time made the decision to close the fishery uh, based on the adaptive management framework um, and uh, information provided by division staff uh, following our internal cold stun um, management protocols. So as you can see from the figures above, uh, adult abundance of spotted sea trout, um, as inferred from division uh, independent gillnet surveys, indicate that the stock responded uh, favorably to this management. And in some cases, um, relative abundance is measuring higher than um, ever measured in these surveys. <clears throat> um, just like with base gallops, this is a, another example of where a fishery management plan with appropriate adaptive management measures uh, can be used to respond in real-time stock conditions. All right, lastly, uh, I wanted to touch on southern flounder and discuss briefly uh, what information the division has on the current condition of the stock. Uh, Director Rawls has already provided you with a brief update on management of the fishery for 2022 and reminded you about the needed reductions in harvest to rebuild the stock. I just wanted to um, take a minute and highlight uh, the current survey data that we have um, for the stock. So anglers across the state have uh, commented to us on the increased abundance of flounder in our waters, and, you know, this is really, you know, it's not expected, um, not unexpected, excuse me, um, and it's a good sign of stock recovery. Um, we're also seeing more flounder in our juvenile and adult surveys. Oh, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> for the species, but unfortunately, COVID-19 did not do us any favors for southern flounder management. Um, COVID-19 uh, occurred about the time uh, flounder management under Amendment 2 was being implemented. So by all indications, the flounder stock is responding favorably to management, but uh, due to gaps due to uh, COVID-19 um, issues with the sampling and some of our key surveys makes our ability to infer rebuilding uh, more difficult for this stock. But nonetheless, uh, the division intends to begin an update on the Southern Flounder Coastwide Stock Assessment in uh, 2023 uh, with a target of having at least three years of survey data post um, the COVID interruption. Um, and we will provide uh, this information um, once the assessment is uh, updated to the commission. And this will hopefully provide a more accurate measure of um, the rebuilding progress for the stock and kind of where we are relative to um, our rebuilding timeline for that species. So uh, that's our presentation. And real quick before I hand it over for questions, I just um, you know, want to thank everyone for hanging with us. I know this was a little longer presentation, but uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, you know, we presented this information to you. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge all the division staff that work uh, to put these review documents together. Again, it's you know over 700 pages, and it does take a uh, you know a fair amount of our time to put this together. Um, but this not only includes just the species leads um, in the fishery management section, but numerous staff from across many sections in the division um, you know contribute to this either you know directly um, you know by analyzing uh, the indices and helping with report writing or indirectly by just being out in the field and collecting this information or working in other sections that, um, you know, collect information on, you know, landing statistics and uh, socioeconomic information. Um, and if you have specific questions about any of the species or information included in here, uh, please reach out to the species leads. I know everyone has a list of current species leads um, in their briefing materials, and it's also on that website. And 
please do not hesitate to call them or me if you want to talk about anything. And lastly, um, the division website has undergone an extensive redesign um, with the goal of making this information more accessible to you and the general public. And I will say uh, with the utmost confidence that the current design is light years ahead of the previous website. And kudos go to Jesse sitting back there in the back. Uh, he's our current web developer and he's done a fantastic job of, uh, you know, uh, getting the website updated for. So with that, um, for Brandy Lee and myself, we're happy to address any questions. Questions or comments? Commissioner Roller. Quickly, um, is there any preliminary data on the juvenile abundance for striped bass this year? I'm looking to Charlton um, for this. You can go ahead and speak. And that's important to note. I mean, that data right there is still preliminary. So these FMP updates, um, it's published this year, August 22, but it's with data through um, 2021 because that's the most recent day or most recent time frame that we have data um, QA and QC'd and considered, you know, publishable. So. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? Uh, yes. Mr. So I've Ryan. wondered, uh, looking at uh, fishery uh, performance in other places around the world, whether there are co COVID-related or value chain-related you know, disruptions that are apparent <laughs> in the responses, either in fishing effort or in yields or in values or other, any of that stuff. So do you have a handle yet on those kinds of questions. You know, there's, a, there's a, just to yeah. clarify, there in some other some places there actually was a considerable reduction in effort that came from you know, intangibles, and I just wondered if you'd seen anything like that. Yeah, just in general, I mean, there are certainly some fisheries that uh, we did see reductions in landings, but um, it did seem like a lot of those landings were recouped, um, you know, pretty quickly. As far as um, you know, any impacts to, you know, the economics of the fisheries or supply chain issues or values or anything like that. I might actually look over to Brandy to know if, you know, you've got any information on that. Or, or even the other way around. I mean, you know, as you can imagine, people are, you know, are at home instead of in the office and therefore they can dip a line, right? So I just wondered yeah. if you'd seen anything like that. So, and, um, and we just, you know, put a bug in my ear too, but we did see uh, increases um, in recreational effort, um, especially in 2020, and um, not only in uh, efforts um, estimated by MRIP, but also in um, certain license sales, um, Cruffle license sales. Um, and uh, I mentioned that because we did discuss that at the federal level a little bit too, um, because we saw similar trends, you know, um, across the board with, you know, people weren't going long distance to vacations or they were sticking around home and, you know, buying fishing licenses and, you know, getting into fisheries and boat sales, I know, um, went up to. I know uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, um, they recently, um, or within the last two years, have uh, published some of that economic information on how the fisheries responded, um, you know, post-COVID or during and post-COVID. So, yeah. Okay. Anything else from anybody? Any idea why the base scallops have increased where we've been able to have two seasons? Uh, any factors changed or what can you that be attributed to? I really, you know, that's a difficult species because it's more of an annual crop. And, um, you know, we, we do that sampling um, quarterly, um, but then we use the October sampling period as the period that... Um, we evaluate relative uh, to the cr trigger. Um, our base gallop biologist, you know, isn't here right now. Um, but I I've heard um, theories that have ranged from, um, you know, more SAV, more habitat, and uh, more saltwater intrusion, you know, in those areas that have created, you know, more favorable conditions for base gallops. Um, and maybe just a general across the board, just, um, you know, increase in, uh, 
you know, habitat quality, you know, in those areas. Because it is, you know, if you saw it's specific to, you know, core and back sound, these are more of our low, you know, populated areas. I mean, we're still not opening up in, you know, areas like around Wilmington or anywhere like that. So that, that probably contributes to it. But, I mean, as far as like a single causal factor, you know, we don't know. Okay. Good enough. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Thank Very you. informative. Great work. All right, we'll move on to our fishery management plan. Korean flora, our new Korean language expert. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I am Corinne Flora. I am the Fisheries Management Plan Coordinator for the division. Uh, for those that are new, you will see me at each one of your meetings um, talking about our fisheries management plans. Um, I work with all of our biologists and um, help build this giant book every year. Um, and Important people that Steve left out of his thank yous for this are um, Debbie Manley and Caitlin, um, who go through this entire thing and make sure the formatting is correct. And that is a uh, thankless job. So <laughs> they are like my favorite people because they make sure that it actually looks good. Um, but I am here today to give you an overview of the status of our fisheries management plans and to review the draft FMP review schedule for 2022 through 2027. There is a corresponding memo in your materials um, under the fisheries management plans. And there is an action item today during this presentation, and that is to um, adopt the 2022 River Herring FMP review as the five-year review for the plan. So today I'll go over the status of our state FMPs um, beyond what Brandy, Lee, and Steve have already communicated with you. Um, and then I'll go over our draft review schedule. So you've already heard um, a lot about our annual review. Um, so now I'm going to bring it into 2022. As Stephen Lee pointed out, that is 2021 focused. So now we're going to jump to the current where we are. Uh, just take a moment to note a couple of species um, with our base gallop, as everybody now knows. That's going along well, so that will continue management until the review schedule comes up. Uh, the red drum continue to meet their management targets, and uh, stock assessment is currently underway through ASMFC, um, and so that will be um, moving along until um, that stock assessment has been completed. Kingfishes. Uh, those continue to meet their triggers, or not triggers, their targets, and uh, management continues with stock condition reports through your annual FMP review. So I'm going to touch briefly on the three fisheries management plans that we com completed during the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Management changes were not required for the North Carolina fisheries management plan for interjurisdictional species. Therefore, the 2022 information update was adopted as the five-year review. The fisheries management plan for interjurisdictional fisheries, for those that are new, is our state plan that focuses on adopting management approved by federal councils 
and the ASMFC that is appropriate for North Carolina. Uh, the information update for this plan is available on the division's website. Um, and the staff worked really hard on this one to make the update more public friendly uh, with the document linking to appropriate federal and ASMFC websites where the public can receive more information um, as well as working to clearly state management roles of um, all involved in these plans. So then we have the hmm, shrimp FMP Amendment 2. Um, we continue to work on implementation of Amendment 2. Um, the majority of implementation has worked through um, director's proclamation on closing the area, additional areas in the state. And we are working, um, as Ann Deaton went over with you, on some of those habitat areas um, and SAV mapping. And those are going to um, inform the adaptive management of the shrimp plan. And finally, we have Southern Flounder, Amendment 3, because we all have to talk about Southern Flounder at all times. And the Southern Flounder FMP fully is available for you on the division's website now. And I'd also like to point out that there is a information, informational pamphlet for the public that takes that large 200-page document, condenses it down to five pages, and um, gives an overview of our recreational and commercial fisheries, gives um, an idea on the um, identification of the different species and some other important information that we pulled out of the FMP to help communicate better what's in that big document with the public. So, now I'm going to cover the annual FMP review. Um, the division uses the review to inform the schedule, which the DEQ secretary approves annually. Per general statute 113.182.1D, each fisheries management plan must be reviewed at least every five years. This five-year schedule sets forth the order in which the division will address each plan. And for the 2022 fiscal year, we have six FMPs on the schedule, which I'll be reviewing. So the Estrin Stripe Bass FMP is our jointly developed plan with the <clears throat> Wildlife Resources Commission. And this covers more than one stock in North Carolina. In May, the MFC voted to send Amendment 2, including your preferred management, to the DEQ secretary. The secretary reported progress to the appropriate legislative bodies for review. Today, the division's straight pass leads will update you on the progress of the plan, and you will have the opportunity to vote at that time on adopting Amendment 2 to the Estrin Stripe Bass Plan. The striped mullet stock assessment indicates that the North Carolina stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring. To address the stock status, the division is beginning work on Amendment 2 to the plan, and the division will hold a public scoping period for Amendment 2 September 26th through October 7th. We will have three in-person meetings during this time, one of which will be a hybrid of a virtual and in-person meeting, and that is to allow as much accommodations for the public as possible commenting on this fishery. Additionally, an online questionnaire will be available during that entire two-week period. Scoping is the best time for the public to inform the content of a plan. This is the beginning of our work in considering what goes into this plan and gives us the full amount of time during the plan in order to consider the management strategies that go into them and management options. And so if we have it from the beginning from the public, we can really address what the public would like us to look at. Um, we need the vision 
on the future of this fishery from the stakeholders. And so we really encourage everyone to take the time during the scoping and come talk with our staff. Um, we will be available at each one of the scoping meetings. There will be a presentation and then public comment. And at that time, we'll also have some breakout sessions where people can talk one-on-one -on -one with our staff and really let us know what they think about the fishery um, or how what part of the fishery is important to them. The stock assessment for spotted sea trout is continuing with the schedule of the spotted sea trout FMP review. The 2015 assessment indicated the stock was not overfished and not experiencing overfishing. The current assessment uses a biological year instead of a calendar year and includes data through February of 2020. The division will be holding a peer review workshop later th um, this month and it will be here, it'll be in the back back there. Um, so it's not hard to find. <laughs> um, and the public are welcome to sit in if they're interested in the stock assessment process. Um, they won't participate, but if you find that interesting, you are welcome to get all of that data. Just, it's a lot. <laughs> so um, feel free to look on the division's website for more information about that workshop. So there are two FMPs which will begin review this month. Those are hard clam and eastern oyster. Division staff will be evaluating the current fisheries and the stocks prior to beginning the FMP and the public scoping process. Um, the public will likely hear more about these FMPs um, in 2023. And finally, for the 2022-2023 uh, FMPs, we have the uh, FMP for river herring. Uh, Amendment 2 was approved in February of 2015 and continued the moratorium on river herring harvest. In 2017, the stock assessment indicated the stock remains depleted uh, under Amendment 2, considerations of allowing harvest are dependent on female catch per unit effort and relative mortality targets over time. These triggers continue to not be met. Considering this, there is no need for management changes in the River Herring FMP. Therefore, the division recommends that the Commission consider adopting the 2022 FMP review of river herring to serve as the five-year review of this plan. The 2022 review would then serve as an information update with no management changes. So before I continue with my presentation and wrap up, um, I can take questions on river herring and um, we, or if there are no questions, um, you all have the opportunity to um, act on your action item to um, vote on adoption of the 2022 River Herring Information Update. Questions or comments? Yes. Rather than go through all my thoughts about River Herring, <laughs> which are way more than you guys want to hear, um, it seems to me that not this time, but by the next time, we as a group need to consider the implications more thoroughly than, than we've been able to to date to the aggregate effect on water quality and habitat that limits the spawning stock biomass of the, this, these, uh, particularly blueback herring. And I really think that alewife is a done, is a done deal in North Carolina. It will be moving pass in the southern end of its thermal range soon. It's not more than a minor species now. But it, it, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about how climate will affect the overall population. So I really think, I felt bad at the time we adopted, frankly, the 20, 2007 plan as co-chair. I felt bad about it. I thought the triggers together were too 
challenging for a variable species of that type, given the interannual inter variability in recruitment, and that really something more needs to be done. I don't think we could, there's anything to be done today, but I really think at some point we have to come to the to terms with what the future for river herring is going to be in North Carolina. And it's going to be more complicated than traditional single species stock assessments. Again, I think that's a comment, not a, not a question. <laughs> okay. And I apologize for it, but no it's, problem. it's been on my mind. That's no, fine. But hopefully, um, some of the actions that um, the new update to the chip is putting into place will um, really touch on some of those concerns. Um, that's that's really what the chip focused on this go round. And um, yeah, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> Other questions or comments, Commissioner Bland? Yeah, I think Mr. Raider's comment about our wife was pretty interesting. Right then, about feeling like we're at the lower end of its range. Um, that's something new to me, but it it's always been bothered me just a little bit that that we lump our wife and blue back together because it seems that our wife are fairly prevalent still and maybe even more so a little more so abundant than they were at one point based on um, a small you know the winter small mesh gillnet fisheries. Um, <clears throat> And it is concerning to me that we can't have somewhat of a bycatch um, instead of creating discards of the owlwife species. Um, and I say that based on places like Maine who have a actual owlwife fishery that's, that's executed every year. And, and, you know, they have done the habitat work to take down dams and stuff like that so that, that, that these fish can access what was once um, blocked off, you know, spawning grounds. And, and I think they've seen abundance actually go up, you know, quite a bit. And so, you know, it, it, it kind of bothers me that we don't get to talk about this and we're just kind of leaping over um, some conversations of concern especially now that, you know, it, there's been a couple of issues that's been brought up on River Heron, and <clears throat> it's been spoke about, by, you know, the, by the fishermen in the Alma Sound region, region for years now of why, you know, we can't have, you know, a 100-pound bycatch, 50-pound bycatch, um, because the two species are, 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 are very much so different in, in, in biological comp uh, Composition, you know, that they're, they're different species. The, the species that the owl wife, um, the size net that we're catching them in, does not catch a blueback heron at all. And if it does, it's one or two, very rarely just lipped in. You know, I mean, you, you just might see one or two a year um, in, in that net. And so I think we, you know, need to be a be a, more, a little more attentive to what's going on in our fisheries instead of just kind of um, <clears throat> jumping over things like this because it is a little more important to, to take some discards and, and, and maybe turn them into a bycatch type of fishery. And, and um, I feel like we need to do a better job of that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Not the chair will entertain a motion to um, adopt the North Carolina River Herring 2022 annual review to um, serve as the five year requirement. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Roller, Commissioner Rader. Any other discussion? Let's get us up first. Is your motion as you made it? Commissioner Roller? He ain't looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> he trusts the staff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other discussion on this? If not, roll call vote, please. Yes, Chairman. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Aye. 
Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Shellam? Aye. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Corwin. Thank you all. Um, and before I move on from River Herring, I'll just um, touch a second on Commissioner Blanton's comments. Um, there is currently a stock assessment underway through ASMFC on River Herring. Um, and in the past, um, North Carolina management has been based on blueback due to some data limitations, um, but they are looking more at the um, alewife data. Um, so uh, that is something that um, the ASMFC um, stock assessment is looking at. And then also um, that portion of things also um, falls under our, um, this is one of those plans that does jointly fall under um, the state and ASMFC. So we have a state plan and we have that interjurisdictional FMP. Um, so a lot of um, what you discussed is the things that fall under the ASMFC end of um, items and um, are things that we address on with them on that end. Um, so just wanted to clarify that for, um, especially for the new commissioners. So before I wrap up, I'm going to take a look at our schedule. Ooh, Laura, can you flip? <laughs> Um, so this, is, which will be up in a moment, is our schedule from 2022 through the um, 2026 fiscal year. And after um, today's meeting, the schedule will be sent to the DEQ secretary for approval. Uh, we have reviewed the FMPs, which are currently under review for this year. Um, in 2024, the Red Drum Plan will begin review um, coinciding with the completion of the ASMFC stock assessment. And then following that in 2025 um, is when the um, full review uh, for the five-year review of blue crab, bay scallop, and kingfishes will approach. <clears throat> Commissioner Blanton. Um, just a little background talk on blue crab um, and then just my own personal, I shouldn't say personal, my own um, interactions with the fishery. That's my main fishery that I fish in. And, and, and so um, do you anticipate moving that blue crab up at all based so, on any update? Um, because... There is even concern out of the fishery from the fishermen, mm -hmm. okay? So I think when it gets to that level, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious because I know this schedule can change, will change, subject to change based on the divisions, uh, you know, concerns, and I'm just wondering if there's possibly any anticipation that that will move up. So currently, um, as Steve said, we did... In, in the last amendment for blue crab, it said we would do an assessment update in 2023. Um, due to our concerns, we're moving that up and we'll do the assessment update. Um, and then we have the adaptive management that's built into the plan. So depending on results of that update will allow us to bring management prior to the plan being fully open with adaptive management. Just to follow up, yes. um, uh, and I don't, I'm not asking um, for you to answer this if you don't have the information right <laughs> off the top of your head. But but with the adaptive management, um, and I, and I'm trying to think back of when we finalized the plan because I was part of it. Before adaptive management in the blue crab plan is put into place, the 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 the, the, the commission does get to chime in on that adaptive manage, management strategy. Am I correct on that? Yes, as well as the shellfish crustacean. Right, we get to choose. You know, more. What I'm saying is, other plans of adaptive management is more more to the, dis, the discretion of the director and and what all it prescribes more generally. But but the blue crab stuff gets to come back to the commission more so, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. I just wanted some clarification. 
Um, yes, the, the blue crab plan specifies that the shellfish crustacean committee will um, assess any management um, and of, of course that will come back then to the MFC um, and that the, the reason for that is that we left it a little bit open um, to be any management that would meet the reductions that we need. And you're lucky because that was the one I worked on. <laughs> so I'm familiar with that. That's very near and dear to my heart. That, that, <laughs> a blue crab is very near and dear to my heart. I, I've, I've, I've done it for a long time. Yeah. All right. Okay. Are you? Um, so that wraps up what I have. Uh, if there are any other questions on FMPs or what's going to be coming up, any I can other take questions? those. Th okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your report. Okay, moving on to, and I'm not going to break for a break. Uh, if anybody needs to step out, just pick a good time to do so. We're a 10 minute break usually ends up being 20 minutes, so we'll run a little bit behind schedule. So we'll keep on. So uh, let's move on to Amendment Two of the, to the um, Estuary and Striped Bass FMP. Charlton, Todd, Nathaniel. Joe. Yeah. All right, Corinne's already got that up there for me. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, greetings to our, our new um, commission members. Um, my name is Charlton Godwin, and with me today are, are Todd Mathis here and Joe Freshendler sitting back behind us. Todd's in the um, Washington Regional Office, and Joe's in the Cape Fear Regional Office. Um, so today we are here to present you with the timeline uh, for Amendment 2 and a brief overview of the Marine Fisheries Commission's preferred management options for Amendment 2 to the North Carolina uh, Estuarine Striped Bass FMP. And I do just want to re remind the Commission that Estuarine Striped Bass FMP is, is one of our few uh, FMPs that's jointly developed by biological staff from the Wildlife Resources Commission and the Division of Marine Fisheries. Um, so at the uh, May business meeting, the Marine Fisheries Commission selected its preferred management. Uh, draft Amendment 2 was forwarded to the Secretary of the Department of Environmental Quality, who notified the Joint Legislative uh, Oversight Committee on Agriculture and Natural and Economic Resources uh, and the Fiscal Research Division on the progress of the FMP. Uh, the Secretary, Secretary did receive one comment uh, from state legislators, which you have in your briefing book. Uh, today, the Commission will have the opportunity to vote on final adoption Amendment 2. Once approved, the Division will implement the uh, Amendment 2 management. So again, I want to remind the, uh, the Commission, uh, this FMP is a, a little you know, different than our other FMPs in that we have different management for the different uh, striped bass stocks in the different river systems throughout the state. So again, we have a spawning stock in the um, Roanoke River. Um, that inhabits the Roanoke River and, and Albemarle Sound, and then we have some spawning um, stocks in the Tar Pamlico River and the Noose, and then the Cape Fear River. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a, a draft amendment two contains three sustainable harvest issue papers. Um, one issue paper that deals with the potential to use hook and line in the striped bass commercial fishery, and an information paper about the history of striped bass stocking in North Carolina. Um, Appendix 2 in your FMP focuses on Aramore Roanoke, or AR, stock, as you will see it abbreviated, while Appendix 3 is focused on the striped bass in the Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers, and Appendix 4 is focused on the Cape Fear River stock. And then Appendix 5 addresses uh, the potential to use hook and line as a commercial gear. All right, so uh, just transitioning the next slides, we will review uh, the MFC's preferred management that was chosen at the May business meeting. And again, um, you know, if you've got your decision document, um, you can follow along with that um, for the recommended management strategy for each option in the issue paper. And I think those are going to be on the, the back page of that decision document. So um, I just want to point out on these slides that I have included the preferred management strategy the commission voted on and approved at their May meeting is going to be in the black font. 
Uh, but I also included, um, we also included uh, in gray font the other options that were available for that particular issue. Um, so the first option we will review is contained in Appendix 2, which deals with the Elmore Roanoke striped bass stock. The commission preferred management was to continue to use stock assessments and stock assessments projections to determine the total allowable landings, and you will see that abbreviated as uh, TAL, um, that achieves a sustainable harvest for the AR stock. Um, it should be noted um, that uh, if we don't, you know, if we don't see some improvement in the stock abundance, and especially with uh, spawning uh, annual spawning events that monitored through our juvenile abundance index, um, that future stock assessments uh, may very well indicate a complete moratorium is necessary. As uh, Steve mentioned, our last stock assessment um, indicated a pretty severe reduction in harvest from around 250,000 down to 51. Thousand pounds, which is pretty much the lowest um, total allowable landings we've ever had on the Airmore Roanoke stock. So, for option two um, in that um, in Appendix Two, uh, the Marine Fisheries Commission approved two A, which is to continue to manage the commercial fishery uh, in the Airmore Sound area as a bycatch fishery, and that simply means that striped bass harvest occurs while targeting other fin fish species, mainly American shad, in the spring, um, to a lesser degree now. Uh, southern flounder in the fall, um, and so basically that just means that striped bass cannot be greater than 50% by weight of all the other fin fish species landed in that trip. So we just really want the striped bass quota that's available to be harvested while they're um, persecuting, you know, prosecuting other uh, large mesh gillnet fisheries as opposed to targeting uh, just striped bass. Uh, so next, the next issue that was in Appendix 2 is accountability measures to address what happens when the towel is exceeded. Uh, the Commission voted on Option 3D. If landings in any fishery exceeds their allocation, then all landings in excess will be deducted from that fishery's towel the next calendar year or until the overage is paid back. So for Option 4, size limits to expand the age structure of the stock. Uh, the Commission voted on 4C and 4E, which is uh, in the Elmore Sound Management Area, or again, ASMA, you'll see that a lot, um, is to implement an 18 to 25 inch harvest slot for the commercial and recreational fisheries. Um, and just for the benefit of our new commissioners, currently we just have an 18 inch minimum size limit in the Elmore Sound with no, with no upper slot. Uh, in the Roanoke River Management Area, uh, they're going to uh, be recommended to maintain, um, the commission voted to maintain the current harvest slot limit of 18 to 22 inches, uh, but with a change to now no fish greater than 22 inches. Previously, um, you could, there was a provision in the Roanoke River um, to where you could harvest one fish uh, that was above 27 inches, but um, the commission voted to just go with the 18 to 22 inch slot in the Roanoke River. So now moving on to option uh, five in that issue paper, which was gear modifications and area closures to reduce discard mortality. The commission chose preferred management to continue commercial harvest with striped bass with gill nets and recreational harvest and catch and release fishing uh, in the Aramal Sound and Roanoke River management areas, including on, on the spawning grounds, and to implement a requirement to use non-offset barbless circle hooks when fishing with live or natural bait in the inland waters of the Roanoke River uh, from May 1st through June 30th. Um, so the harvest season closes in the Roanoke River uh, April 30th or when the quota is, is met. Uh, but after the harvest season closes, there is a pretty significant um, catch and release fishery which occurs up there. So this would um, aim to uh, reduce some potential, you know, reduce the uh, release mortality when using live or, or natural bait. Um, and finally, for the Albemarle Roanoke issue paper, um, we have had adaptive management in the striped bass FMP for uh, quite many years, uh, and part of that adaptive management, or that adaptive management includes, uh, you know, the following, uh, the use of peer-reviewed stock assessments and stock adept assessment updates to recalculate our biological reference points, um, which also, um, we also recalculate the total allowable landings that will keep us at our, where we want to be with our fishing mortality estimates. Uh, stock assessments will be updated at least once between benchmarks. Uh, and again, um, you know, our, our last stock assessment projections uh, resulted in a, a very low tile of 51, 52,000 pounds. And again, if we continue to see recruitment um, that is really uh, poor and uh, continued reduction in the, uh, you know, abundance of our nine plus fish, a spawning moratorium, a harvest moratorium very well may be a, a, a reality in the future. 
So if uh, fishing mortality, which uh, you will see us abbreviate as F, uh, exceeds the fishing mortality target, then we will reduce the tail to the F target. Again, this is one of those adaptive management measures where uh, we uh, do the stock assessment, calculate the tail, and, and if it needs redu reducing, we simply come back with the commission to tell you what that new, new quota is. The ability to open and close harvest seasons in, in areas uh, to keep landings below the tail. Uh, and also to require gear modifications and area closures to reduce striped bass dead discards. Um, and so that does it for the AR stock and the Arbonne San Roanoke River issue paper. And it doesn't want to advance. There we go. So moving on to Appendix 3, which deals with the um, sustainable harvest for the Tar Pamlico and Noose River stocks. The Commission chose preferred management to continue with the no possession measure in the Tar Pamlico and Noose Rivers. Uh, they chose to maintain the gillnet closure above the ferry lines and maintain the three-foot tie-downs below the ferry lines to the current tie-down line, um, which is basically a line that runs um, east of the mouths of the Tar Pamlico River. Um, and Noose Rivers from Ruse Point south to, to Point of Marsh. Um, so they, the Commission also approved the adaptive management uh, for the Tar Pam Noose, which is in uh, 2025. We will review the data uh, with the Wildlife Commission, uh, the PDT, um, through 2024 to determine if populations um, have reached a level of, of self-sustainability and sustainable harvest can be determined. Uh, in addition, the Commission approved a motion that the DMF study the effects of the gillnet closure and reevaluated at the next full amendment review. Uh, this research will be conducted preferably within two years and the closure be addressed based on that study. And that's the, the exact language of that motion from the last meeting. Uh, moving on to the Cape Fear River issue paper, the Commission chose option 1A as preferred management, to main, uh, which was to maintain the Cape Fear River uh, no possession measure. Uh, I do want to just briefly mention, um, bring it to the Commission's attention, that at the Wildlife Resources Commission's Fisheries Committee meeting um, in July, I think it was July 13th, the Inland Fisheries Division proposed in their 2023-2024 regulatory cycle to open striped bass harvest in the Cape Fear River and its tributaries upstream of Lock and Dam 1, which is inland waters in the Cape Fear, um, from March 1st, April 30th, with an 18-inch minimum size limit and a two-fish daily cruel limit. So again, that was just to uh, kind of start the rulemaking um, process that they go through. Um, we'll have public hearings and everything. So that, that could change between now and then. That's, that rule's not in effect. It's just starting the um, process. Um, so the Commission also chose preferred management in the Cape Fear River, uh, the adaptive management, which include continuing young of year surveys and uh, genetic parentage-based tagging analysis um, to inform adaptive management. And that genetic parentage-based tagging analysis is just basically a way that we have to determine whether a fish has been stocked or if it's a wild, um, wild spawned fish. Uh, management measures may be adjusted, uh, include means and methods, a harvest area, season, size, and creel limits. Um, and if we, um, when we do this adaptive management, uh, if we recommend changes, uh, then that must be evaluated by staff with the Marine Fisheries Commission FinFish Advisory Committee um, consultation. All right, and this is the last one. Um, if you remember, this issue paper examines management considerations with the possibility of implementing hook and line as a commercial gear, and if it is an appropriate time to allow that gear in this fishery. So again, just as a little bit of background for our new commissioners, striped bass is one of the few um, species to where you cannot harvest, um, you, you cannot commercially, you know, hook and line is not a commercial gear. You know, you can't harvest and sell striped bass with a uh, hook, and, hook and line, and that's got a long history that I won't get into, but. Um, so the Marine Fisheries Commission selected preferred management option 1A, uh, which is the adaptive management, which is basically to maintain hook and line as a gear option if needed as stack, stock status improves. But right now, uh, with the status of the stocks and all the systems, um, not to implement it at this time. So the action item before the Marine Fisheries Commission at this time, uh, at the conclusion of this presentation, is to vote on final adoption of Amendment 2 to the Estuarine Striped Bass FMP. Uh, and again, I just want to put up um, the striped bass species folks, if you will, that you can call with any, any questions. Again, Todd Mathis is in the regional office. Uh, Joe Fashindala is in the Wilmington regional office. Um, Nathaniel Hancock, who's not here today, uh, he's in the Elizabeth City field office with me. And, um, 
as, as Steve mentioned and Chris Bat Savage earlier, I think, for ASMFC managed striped bass. Um, I'm the uh, TC rep for ASMFC for, for the uh, you know, uh, ocean striped bass fishery. Um, and any of us will be happy to answer any questions um, if they ever come up relative to striped bass. Okay. Um, and with that, uh, we'll, we will um, take any questions. Okay, questions or comments? Commissioner Cross. Oh, okay, any questions or comments? Okay, Commissioner Wright. And I'm sorry about my ignorance on this. Would you um, explain the basis for using landings as the harvest control rule for these stocks, you know, as we've been trying to, as far as I know, been getting, getting using catch or total mortality um, as opposed to landings. And I, I know that you handle it by internalizing discard mortality in the stock assessment and setting the towel. We've been generally trying to reallocate uh, discard mortality to sector and to stock and to internalize those and I just wonder what the basis is for maintaining the landings targets here uh, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right dr. Rader we, we do incorporate um, the discard estimates so we for so for striped bass in internal waters of uh, just first off you know marine uh, recreational information program they don't monitor this far uh, up river in our you know more estuaries you know locations so we have our own um, surveys for striped bass. So we incorporate um, dead discards um, for the Aramal Sound Roanoke River where we have a, a catch it age stock assessment from the Roanoke River, Aramal Sound. Uh, the commercial sector discards are estimated annually. Um, so we do have estimates of discards that we use in our projections of total allowable landings, but, but the discards just can't quite be, especially for the commercial fishery, um, you know, they just can't be quite estimated real time like we do for striped bass. So another thing for striped bass is, um, you know, we have, have for years, um, striped bass have to, the commercial fish houses have to tag striped bass, and this is an ASMFC coastwide thing. They all have to be tagged. Uh, so every day the dealers call us in with the number of and uh, pounds of striped bass harvest that they've collected. So when we get to that quota, we can close the fishery pretty quickly. Um, so, you know, it's just a, a matter, I, I guess, of the individual fisheries and, and how they choose to, whether they try to put the, the discards in with the total allowable landings and just call it attack, um, you know, or, or whether they choose to, to put them in at the backside. But the discards are always um, included. When we do projections for the future quota, we also include um, what we um, you know, we include an estimate of discards moving forward. I hope that answers your question. It does. Maybe we can talk about it more later, but I'm interested in the history there and why that choice was made since I think increasingly the field is moving away from that and towards trying to internalize, especially by sector. So if you're allocating targets by sector, and there's a difference, if there were to be a difference in mortality uh, associated with handling in each of those sectors, then those should be counted against sectoral quotas. Um, if they're the same, of course, it doesn't matter. But anyway, we don't need to belabor that now, but I just was interested in the basis for the choice to use a towel. Yeah, and I will just say briefly that we do include um, in the stock assessment model, we do include each of those as a different fleet. Um, so I'm, we can, you know, we can have estimates of F from not only the harvest, but the discards from the different fleets. Commissioner Roller. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you can answer this one, but this is a kind of a question going back to the WRC allowing, looking, starting the rulemaking process to allow harvest in the Cape Fear River region. Do you know if they had any discussion regarding toxins in the Cape Fear? I mean, we had this discussion here that, um, you know, as it stands, striped bass in that river system, they're contaminated with PFAS, mercury, and other things, and there's, a, there's, there's ag advocacy groups asking people not to eat fish out of that river. So do you know if that came up for discussion? I listened to some of their inland fisheries meeting, but I couldn't listen to all of it, and I, and I did not um, hear them discuss it. Um, however, we, we certainly do. We, you know, have had that same issue in other, in the Hudson River, for example, um, and we've talked about it before, and we've certainly talked about it internally as the PDT. Um, and, you know, we, we discussed that the Department of Health and Human Services are the ones, as, as um, folks may know, that, that issue those warnings. So. Um, at that WRC meeting, I don't know if they discussed it, but Joe is works on that a lot. And if that didn't answer your question, he may have some he has some more information.
So, sorry. <laughs> so right now, the, uh, both WRC and DMF, we've provided striped bass samples to be analyzed from, uh, I'm not sure, I think from um, pretty far up the river, I think Buckhorn down to kind of Wilmington, the river's been broken down into several stretches and we've provided uh, multiple striped bass for analysis. So they're in Raleigh, I think being processed, They've been processed, and now I think they're just waiting on the analysis. So that will come out at some point. And you will inform us, or at least inform me. I'd love to hear it about it when it comes out. Yeah, so. when we get results, we'll we'll bring it back. Wonderful. I'm assuming that whole thing will be – it's not just focused on striped bass, too. It's multiple species in the Cape Fear. So I'm assuming that's going to be, you know, public a public document. But we'll bring the striped bass results back here for sure. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, regarding the motion at the last meeting regarding the analysis of the net closure in the two-year time frame, have you had any discussions about the practicality of collecting that data and analyzing in that time frame? I know you raised concerns at the last meeting. Yeah, the, the two-year time frame is tough, um, and I think that was discussed at the last meeting. We have not had a lot, well, hardly any discussion about what that study may look like, and we and to, that was my direction, really. We weren't going to have a whole lot of discussion and let, until the plan was finalized, and that was, was part of it. So, but, but it will be problematic. And, and then what do you, then you have to kind of look at what do you have after a two-year time frame uh, to look at, really. So, Mr. Thank Cross. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, due to the lack of supporting qualified science, and the lack of divisional support at the time of the special meeting that was called and the lack really now from the division because it was never offered as an initial option, the transparency of the process at the time of inception and really the disdain by the secretary towards this commission and the reprimand basically by the secretary that we took at that time, I'm going to make a motion that, Patricia, please. I make a motion that we remove the temporary closure to the gill nets above the fair lines and amendment two to the striped bass fishery management plan and that the rest of the plan be passed as presented. Okay, we have a motion on the floor looking for a second. I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Blanton. Discussion. Commissioner Roller. I would like to offer a substitute motion. Okay. I uh, move that we approve the plan as passed at the last commission meeting. Um, with the one caveat that when it's far as the two year time frame, I'd like to offer a little bit more flexibility, but I want to do it in a way that it would pass. I'm looking to counsel. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? So in the last plan, we looked at reevaluating the gillnet closure in a two-year time frame, and our concern is that that's not enough time to put money together, look at the data. Um, I would like to change that to give the division more time to look at it, but want to do so in a way that it will pass final approval if we are so, if we vote in approval of this motion. I would defer to staff as to how much time they need. I think from a Robert's Rules of Order, you can make whatever motion you want. How would staff like to address that time frame, that two-year time frame? Well, I think that I mean, two years to do a study, then that still just leaves you with a two-year study, which may or may not tell you much of anything. So depending on what the commission wants to get from said study, um, maybe the <clears throat> maybe to at least give us a flexibility to work on this until the next amendment, or is that too much? I mean, I'm not sure what what exactly you want to cover, but that would sound, that would be, I think, more reasonable for on our end staff. Do you do you have any 
objections to that or, or concerns about that? So I would, I would move in my motion that when it comes to the review of the Gilnet closure, that we analyze it, the effectiveness of it, at the next full amendment, right? It gives some flexibility there. All right, make sure that motion is as you want to present it. Help her out, Commissioner Roller. Would that be uh, to collect data um, sufficient to analyze the net, the gill net closure by the next amendment? After, yeah, I'll repeat your motion, Commissioner After Roller. the May 2022 meeting, um, and collect data sufficient to analyze the gill net closure by the next amendment. Thank you. Okay, is that your motion as you have made it? That is my motion as I have made it. Is there a second to it? Second. Second, Commissioner McNeil. Okay, discussion. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chairman. We have had this discussion many times, and I know it's hard for a lot of people in this room, whether it's striped bass or flounder or gillnuts, it is always an emotional and difficult subject. Um, I want to point out for the new commissioners, we've heard a a lot of what I hate to say just comes down to hyperbole. Council has told us many times the actions of the commission were within our purview and were totally legal. So I understand that this is tough, particularly for the, the paid staff of the Fisheries Association. It's their job you know, to protect their industry and their fisheries and they view it that way, that's fine. We just put this into place for a really imperiled fishery by our own anecdotal observations from public commenters, from other fishermen. I know from my own experience, there is a clear increase in biomass in that fishery. I mean, we just broke a, one of the longest standing inshore fishery state records of speckled sea trout, you know, in the News River. So I would also point out that North Carolina, this is not a gillnet ban, I hate that word, when it, particularly when it's used to these small areas. We, North Carolina has the most expansive gillnet fisheries in the country. There is no ban on commercial fishing in the Upper Noose River. They can still gig up there. They can still use cast nets. We heard ample public comment at the last meeting from fishermen coming and saying, hey, we want all the gillnets to go back in so we can catch bait mullet. Why didn't you just ask for a fishery for bait mullet? I just don't feel there's been a lot of honesty in that fishery. And by the division's own data, as was presented multiple times and was showed by uh, 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 one of the members of the public this morning, the, the catches and value of that fishery has gone up. So there is some benefit. So I think we just need to leave this in place Let's look at it. Let's do everything we can protect, do, do to protect this imperiled and important estuarine fishery in the state. Okay. Commissioner Krause. A couple of things to get correct. I'm not a paid member of the Fishery Association. I wasn't referring to you, Commissioner no. Krause. Okay, well, let's get that straight. But uh, the second thing, uh, you know, this was put in place with the premise of protecting the returning stock for two years of a good class of striped bass that had been more or less registered. And it's been over two years. And what we found out since then that a lot of these striped bass that have come down aren't actually returning up Neuse River anyway. They're going up the other estuaries, as we've been told. Uh, the capture of other species, so far as hook and line, was already going up before this ever got put in place. 
along with flounder, everything, spot, I mean, uh, croaker. There actually is some croaker up in East River now. But, you know, this was put in place in an ill-advised manner. It wasn't supported by the division at that time. It wasn't supported by the director at that time. It wasn't supported by the secretary at that time. And it was nothing more than a premise and another mechanism to put a net or get a net out of the water. Now, you can sit here and analyze it all you want, but I believe we've already had on the minutes that it actually has no effect, no biological effect whatsoever on the species that they're basically championing that it does. So this was supposedly a temporary measure. Uh, it was not... Uh, supported at that time by the powers that be in the division and the secretary, and it's time for it to go. And that's pretty much my statement. Thank you. Commissioner Roller. A uh, point of clarification on that comment. Is there much evidence that the uh, Noose River fish are spawning in other estuarine systems, as was stated by Commissioner Cross? So I'll start if, Todd, you want to jump in. If, but um, So um, we, we put have... Uh, Todd and the folks at Washington put um, Vimco tags, the acoustic tags, and a lot of those fish that were in that 2014-2015 uh, year classes, which is the two couple of year classes that um, Mr. Cross was referring to, and I don't know, 50 of the fish that were not um, stocked fish, well, over 50% have it's gone up. 70% now. Have, so, so have we, gone back up the Roanoke to spawn. So they were bleed over, but of the ones that were, but still some did go up to tar pam noose. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, we kind of were able to look at the genetics of them to tell whether they were hatchery or, or not. And so we were really concerned about the wild fish and then looked at those tracking. And so far, we've gotten 70% of those fish that have been detected back in the Arbor Mile Sound or Roanoke River um, of those wild fish. So it looks like we've got, you know, in good year classes, the AR fish come down. They reside in the Tar Pamlico and Noose. They make potential spawning runs back to the Roanoke and then reside back in the Tar Pamlico and Noose. But not all of them. So some still go up the Noose Tar Pam to spawn. We don't know that they spawn, but we do have some fish that do go up there, but that's it's less now because um, I think these um, fish are getting bigger and so you know their ages are such where they may be starting their um, you know out migration into oceans or things like that so they're okay. starting to get up and age those fish okay fair enough um, but we do have some spawning activity obviously in the central management area correct so and I, I guess my point is is I don't want to act like I, I don't like this 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 road that we seem to be going down at times like where some people want to give up on this fishery. I'm not get, I, I personally don't want to give up on this fishery. So I don't think it should be a put-and-take fishery. I think we should try to rebuild it. Commissioner Bland. There's a few things that's not being said and the new commissioner's not aware of. It is a put-and-take fishery. These fish are stocked, 100,000 or so. Um, they're bought and paid for by funds, federal funds, uh, licensed funds, and, and, and they, are, they are put there for recreational purposes. And, and what's funny about it is, is that there's a no, position, no possession limit for recreational fisheries in that striped bass fishery in that area, both them areas. So you hear this, oh, these, these fish are, are growing up. Well, yeah, they are growing up because nobody can access these fish, neither commercial nor recreational. So I want to talk a little further. The, the ban was put into effect to figure out if these fish were naturally spawned fish. We just heard evidence here that what fish in those two year classes that, that was of concern have now started returning to the more proper spawning grounds that are more fitting, that have, still have very well natural flows, and, and, and they, are, they are assumed to be spillover fish. 
that is what what the driving factor was to implement these lines that that were going to allow us to figure out this question right here. And 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 what still what's what's not being told is that this these lines are implemented by proclamation. Right now, they sit in a proclamation. What's trying to be done is put in a permanent ban into a, an amendment which will s seal the deal for these lines. We have to open the plan back up to take these lines apart and, or to remove them or to, to reconsider them or whatever beyond this point if this plan is approved as it is written right now. Now, there's some words that's been thrown around. Uh, disproportionate impact. I've heard that said today. Now, when I think about that and the disproportionate impact, commercial fishers have been dispro disproportionately impacted because we have access to no fish up there. Whereas the recreational fisher, still hook and line, can go up there and access the drum, the trout, the perch, the flounders when it opens, different things, different fish that recreational people fish for, such as, and as such, commercial fish for. Now, the, the Fisheries Reform Act was set out for fair and equitable access. That's what it set out to be, fair and equitable. And I have argued this since day one. It is not fair and equitable. We did our science project. We're starting to learn more about our science project. And our science project is telling us that we have spillover fish that are hanging out down there from a very robust 2014, from what I understand, was one of the largest in, in, in recent times of a spawning event from, spite, from striped bass out of Albemarle Roanoke stock. Now, I didn't vote for this plan to move forward, just to be clear. Not in their time. Not a single time ha have I voted for this plan to move forward. Neither have any of the other commercial commissioners. And I feel like it is time to separate what we really need to be focused on, which is the Almar Roanoke stock, right, which, which this plan should, should entail, and we should have action towards that stock to help it continue to rebuild and to, to further help it. But this is not a plan to implement a, 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 a ban that is disproportionately impacts Key words there, disproportionate impacts. That, that is not fair and equitable. When we did our science project, and our science project is starting to, to, to tell us the story. Now, the division, if you have listened, has really started to talk about a moratorium on the Albemarle Roanoke striped bass. And if that is the case, they're going to come back and ask us, for some sort of supplement action. And so what will happen is, is that any management measures that are put out and set forth in Appendix 2 for the Albemarle Sound Roanoke River stock will now be null and void. We would then fall under a supplement, if, if so choose, and there will be a moratorium on that stock, which will then have a amendment that does nothing but stand for a net ban up these rivers, which disproportionately impacts the commercial industry and those who use or have historically used that waterway above those lines. Now, I heard something, and this might be anecdotal, but this year, the salt content at the Newburn Bridge going across the, 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 the Noose River was like 20 some parts. I might be wrong, the division might can confirm that. 
what happens is, is we have bait fisheries that occur. We, these bait fisheries are absolutely important, more so now than they ever have been. Crabbers are paying upwards of $30 a flat for bait. These lines have effectively taken out bait fisheries, they've taken out mullet fisheries, they've taken out any fisheries that, that these fish are going to move above these, these high salt contents and, and push fish away from where these fishermen can target. This has a history. You have heard the history through public comment. You have heard the disagreement for these net ban lines from the secretaries, from the division, from, from all sorts of things. So it's up to these new commissioners to make the ultimate decision because the commissioners that have been sitting here fighting it are still sitting here and we're still trying to fight it to the very end. This is what's not being told. And I, I feel like it was very fair to you, for you to hear the truth because this absolutely dispro disproportionately impacts the commercial sector and it is not fair and equitable access to that portion of the waterway. And so you can take that for what you want it to be, but it puts guys, hardworking guys, honest guys, out. They have to move down into places that get rougher. They, they, they have to lose, leave the cover of shelter at times. There are other considerations here that go well beyond just a line. Boats have to go further. They have to spend more money. They have to travel, put themselves in different situations, pile up on top of each other. Um, when you start crowding commercial fishermen together, then they get a bad name because all the wreck fishermen say, well, oh, they're all right there. They did it to us. We didn't have a choice. We have fought this from day one. Now, you can take that for what you want it to be, and I know what my vote is going to be. But we're in a position right now that we really don't even need to approve this plan, in my honest opinion. Because if, if, and what I heard a while ago that at the November 2022 meeting, we are going to get possibly a stock assessment update, right, which is the absolute next meeting, which will then determine whether or not the division will come forward with a possible moratorium suggestion. So, we can leave this, we can table this plan and let it sit right here and nothing changes. The lines stay right there in effect. We can disapprove the plan and the lines go away before we hear more data and more, more information on what we really need to do. But, but essentially, I'm gonna come back to this, essentially, Appendix 2 will go away if a moratorium is, is suggested and, the, and these bans will stay in effect. So you can talk about all this, that, and the other, and why it needs to stay there, and oh, the fish is doing so much better, and blah, 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 but that is not the case. Fish move in waterways based on weather, based on salt content, based on many factors. And what'll happen is we get a big rain event, it'll push all the fish out the back of that river toward the mouth, and everybody moves out there and fishes. This is fish biology, this is fishery management. And, and, and I'm just telling you, it goes deeper than just saying yes or no right now. And I feel like, based on what all we know, these lines need to go away, they don't need to be there, we need to not approve the plan, we need to wait on the stock assessment update because nothing really changes. A few small things. Or we can take this Appendix 3 out, which was offered in the first motion, 
and we can go ahead with Appendix 2, wait on the stock assessment update, wait for the division to come back and tell us more details about what's going on in the Almar Roanoke stock. This up to y'all, because I know which way I'm going to vote. And I think it's very apparent and clear which way all the commercial fish fishers that sit on this commission should vote. It's up to everybody else how they feel about it. And that's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I typically don't comment on the issues that we bring forward here. Uh, but I feel compelled to comment on this one. Virtually every person at our last meeting who came at the public comment session to talk about removing the uh, limit uh, to allowing nets back into the rivers focused in on the need to catch bait fish, striped mullet. And we have heard today from staff that striped mullet is being overfished and overfishing is occurring. So what we would be in essence in doing is if we allow these nets back into these rivers, is endorsing the catch of an overfished species. That's irresponsible. We're not doing our job if we vote for that. So that's what I want to say about that. Director. Just a couple of comments um, relative to the process, really. Um, we, so we will manage striped bass by Amendment 1, until which time another amendment is adopted. The update of the stock assessment, the stock assessment is relative to the Albemarle Roanoke stock. The update of that assessment, uh, based on the adaptive management, even included in Amendment 1, if we are overfishing, then we will have to address overfishing and take uh, F back to target. So that is part of adaptive management, even in Amendment 1. We would, that would come back to discussion with this commission. And the reason we mentioned moratorium is because we reduce these uh, towels already so low that it's hard to manage, um, go from managing 275,000 pounds to 52,000 pounds. It's just a very difficult jump to handle, as you're aware. So if we have to further reduce based on the Amendment 1 adaptive management and based on the stock assessment results, it will bring about the question of can we really further reduce and effectively manage or should we uh, have a harvest moratorium? That would be the discussion under adaptive management would not require a supplement in my the way I, I view this but because it is part of the adaptive management but certainly would, would bring a, a conversation about. So I just wanted to make sure that we, we put that out there and also just for thought, uh, um, not trying to push this one way or the other, but if the commission goes with um, something along the lines of what Commissioner Cross put up first, if there, so if there is a significant change in the options, uh, we would have to go back to public comment and back to the secretary and the legislative body for review. I just wanted to put that out there for consider. I mean, just for Commissioner take Cross. Out. Just as one quick point of clarification to uh, what Chairman Bizzle said, they, there was a lot of discussion on uh, catching strike mullet. The strike mullet capture is for recreational use. It's for bait fish for the recreational sector. The main thing that they would be fishing for up there that time of the year would be for menhaden for the crab pot bait that Commissioner Blanton is talking about. When you're talking about striped mullet capture, that's, that's at that time of the year, and you can't, nobody can dispute it's for, basically for the recreational side. And yes, it's important. It's important to the commercial side to catch it for the recreational side, but it's for drum fishing, tarpon fishing, everything else. So there's, there's a dual edge up there of what they're actually trying to catch for bait. And in response to that, Maybe I was asleep or something, but I did not hear Menhaden mentioned during those comments. I heard Stripe Mullet, Commissioner Roller. 
Yeah, I want to reiterate the chairman's comment there. I listened and took notes. I didn't hear a single fisherman come and ask to be able to catch menhaden in the noose. They all asked specifically for bait mullet. That was what, or virtually every comment called. And um, I've been saving this, but I wanted to read a, a quote from the Rachels and Rick study from the WRC, which examined the cryptic mortality which in this fishery. Linear modeling indicates that gillnet effort is the most important factor influencing spawning stock mortality among the exploitation and environmental factors examined. Gillnet effort accounted for substantially greater variability in spawning stock mortality than commercial harvest and modeled average coefficient I identified a discrete annual exploitation rate of 0.29 for gillnet effort. This suggests that the commercial multi-species gillnet fishery imparts substantial mortality even when the striped bass harvest season is closed. You know, we've rehashed that many times during this process. And Com uh, Commissioner Blanton brought up a great point regarding the Albemarle Sound. Um, we've heard a lot of, I mean, the recruitment retrains really low in this fishery. We're not looking at a good future for that stock. And we're going to have to protect those fish in the Albemarle Sound or if they go on vacation to grandma's house in the noose, which is apparently what some of them are doing. So, and if we did go to more stringent harvest measures under adaptive management, whatever that be, it's going to impact the gillnet fisheries. And in addition, I want to reiterate again that this is not eliminating commercial access to that river. It's eliminating some gillnet effort in part of the river. You can still gig. You can still hook in line for allowed species. You can still use cast nets and other allowed gears in those areas, just not gill nets. Yes, Trump. Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> make a, a point of clarification without trying to get too deep into the weeds of, of the modeling that was done into the Rachel, Rachel's and Rick's paper. However, we did include it in the, um, it's in the FMP um, document. So they did do, do, do some modeling uh, and those were indeed the results. However, um, they included, um, you know, gillnet effort, harvest, some dissolved oxygen, uh, but they did not include any recreational harvest estimates in those in that modeling, uh, nor did they include um, recreational um, trips. So obviously, um, if they didn't include those as one of, in the model as one of the options that the model could have picked, well, then it can't it can't pick that as a significant factor. So anyway, our stock assessment folks, um, you know, this was a peer reviewed uh, paper and the, the modeling that they did was was right there. So um, Laura Lee and, and Yan, I think it was actually Yan Lee, um, she redid the modeling and included um, recreational harvest and recreational trips and, and found that when they were included, uh, they were about as significant as um, commercial uh, discard removals. There's some other, you know, issues that or um, some things with, with that paper, like they, they lagged um, the, the gillnet effort and the harvest from one year and a couple of other things. But at any rate, if um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to point that out. But, but what you said is true. In the modeling they did, putting the elements that they did in there, that, that did come out. They just didn't include uh, recreational um, harvest and um, trips. And, and I will tell you why they did not include it. Uh, what they stated in the paper was because the recreational krill survey estimates didn't go quite back as far as the recreational harvest. We haven't always had a recreational krill survey. Um, so at any rate, I just wanted to just to clarify that for the record. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director. Mr. Chairman, too, could I ask Charlton uh, just to talk a little bit about um, the division's preliminary recommendations for this uh, management option before they were pulled um, at, at the behest of this commission. Just talk a little bit about that and the discussions at the PDT and why uh, they were our preliminary uh, management options. So the division w did look at this. Basically, our preliminary management recommendation was to allow a fishery but just large mesh for American shad in that system and Ch Charlton, could you just talk a little bit about what how that discussion was at the PDT? Whoever's, whoever's got the control of the motion thing, could you switch it back to the uh, presentation? Thank you.
So um, here is the, the language from the FMP as it went to the commission at their February meeting, I believe, when we um, sent it out to public comment. So under Appendix 3, um, Option 2, those, those about the, the net ban, um, at the Fisheries Management Plan Advisory Committee um, meetings, you know, this is when we have the, the various members from the different sectors advise us during the fisheries management plan process. Um, the commercial industry, um, their recommendation and their request um, was initially started out as option B here. So it was basically a request to remove the gillnet closure above the ferry lines during the commercial shad fishing seasons. They felt like that they could um, still prosecute the shad fishery with a, an additional, um, so it would have been 50 yards from shore, but they said, you know, we can get 200 yards from shore, stay away from striped bass, uh, and still catch shad uh, and have this fishery um, from February 15th to the end of the commercial shad harvest system uh, as determined through the Shad Sustainable Fishery Plan, which for, which for the tarpam usually ends um, um, uh, by April, April 15th. Yep, so it would be from February 15th to April 15th, unless that changes. Um, and it was to remove the gill net closure and remove the three-foot tie-down requirements and implement a 200-yard distance from shore requirement. Um, after the shad harvest season, they would reinitiate the gill net closure above the ferry line and reinstate that tie-down. So, um, you know, we had a lot of good discussion at this at the uh, advisory committee um, meetings. Um, we went back and uh, analyzed um, some additional data, Todd, um, and, and that is in the FMP as well. Um, so this figure shows uh, the observer data uh, for striped bass, hickory shad, and American shad from gill nets set above the ferry lines um, in the Tarpan and Noose rivers, and this is for years uh, 2012 to 2018, uh, a total of 162 trips. Um, uh, so what we have is the number of striped bass observed on the bottom line there, well, the number of fish, period, the, the different color column indicates whether it's striped bass, hickory shad, or American shad. And then on the uh, up and down axis there, we have the distance from shore. Um, so you can see um, as they, they increase from the distance from shore with their gill nets, you know, striped bass catches decreases. We've known that for years. That's why we've had the 50-yard distance from shore. Um, in, in these rivers for since 2008, essentially after the shed after the striped bass commercial season closes to reduce striped bass discards when harvest season is not open and we require the three foot tie downs. Um, so at any rate, um, that is what we that was the discussion that we had. The the we never really actually um, discussed uh, completely removing the the gill net um, ban uh, in these rivers at our FMP advisory committee meetings. So this was what we had discussed. This was what we looked at. This is what the industry representatives kind of, that's, that's what they requested. Um, so just to give everybody a little bit more background uh, about, about that. Is, is that good, no, Director? Yeah, th thank you, Charlton. And that I just wanted Charlton to cover that because, again, this was our preliminary uh, management recommendation. We did not fully um, finalize a management recommendation because the options were were pulled from the plan so we didn't once that happened we didn't discuss this any further and it really was based on uh, PDT discussion and and um, and that so I just wanted to bring that to the Commission's attention okay Commissioner Ola I just want to bring up some discussion from the February meeting regarding that recommendation that we removed and the rationale I had for removing that uh, first of all just to be clear that fishery would need to be observed right since it's large mesh if that were to be placed in, yeah, so we would be observing that fishery. That fishery is not worth any money. It's worth like $5,000 a year for all the rivers. Some years in the past, 10 years ago, it was worth like 20000 I mean, this is a low, low, low value fishery, the shad fishery. And that's a lot of effort for fish that are 20 cents a pound, 50 cents a pound for American shad at best. I have all the data right here. I'd be happy to forward it to any commission members. Low value, well, a lot of effort to keep that fishery open. Commission Blanton. Well, we've run right down a rabbit hole, and that's my thing of where we're at right this second. Let's get back to what we really need to talk about. 
There are lines that commercial fishermen right now cannot cross to access any fish up there with a net, whether it be a white perch, a menhaden, a mullet, a, a drum, a flounder, anything. Don't matter. Anything that is commercially viable. So you can isolate the shad fishery and tell us that it ain't worth anything, and that's fine. But, but, but what, you, what you have here is that the entire commercial fishery has been taken away above them lines, which is worth a whole lot more money. And so where we're at here is back to the main point of you have, this is two parts, two parts. So a while ago it was said, we need to keep the lines in the rivers elsewhere where fish are migrating back to their original spawning grounds of the Almar Roanoke, which we're going to allow harvest in through Appendix 2, but we need to not harvest them in another place. It was also said that the fish are aging to the point where they're going to go in the ocean. They're going to start migrating away from these, these, these rivers, and they're going to start entering the ocean fishery, which is going to be accessible coast-wide, coast-wide, from Maine to North Carolina. And chances are there's going to be a handful of these fish caught in the ocean, up off of New Jersey, up somewhere by recreational fishermen, and they will be harvested if they fall within the limit of where they can, of where they can harvest. This is nothing other than, let me go back to the, what we used, because we talked about a disproportionate impact earlier today, and we endorsed a letter about disproportionate impact. And we have the same thing here, but we are disproportioning, dis disproportionately impacting one sector over the other. Whereas earlier, we endorsed a letter not to in, in disproportionately impact one sector over the other. And so where are we really at? Because <clears throat> I'm just trying to put the truth out there. The truth is we have new commissioners that haven't been involved in the history of this, and we have a big change, and this is a big, big issue that I don't think y'all knew that you're really walking into. And so there's a lot of history here. You know, when these lines were put in place, you know how long, nobody even called me until like the day before the meeting. I had to get in my car, drop every plan that I had, get in my car and drive to Kinston the next day. Hey, we got a meeting. When? What? Meeting? Yeah. Meeting. Oh, yeah. Well, where? Kinston. Why? Where's the public comment? Wait, there was none. I'm just telling you, there's history here, and this is not right. This is not right. And, and, and so <clears throat> we have two, it's two parts. We have a net ban from these ferry lines, whatever, up rivers, and then we have a trying to achieve sustainable harvest in a whole nother stop. And so you deal with it how you may, but the net ban needs to go away because we've done our science project. We found out these fish overflowed into another estuary, came back into another estuary, went and spawned, and that's where they should have done, which is great. Great. Glad they did. But we can take away the no possession limit for the fish that are bought and paid for, put and take. They're, they are put in as fanglings. They grow up. Recreational fishing go out there to catch them. They've already paid for them. They get a striped bass, go home, put it in the frying pan and eat it. Take it away. Give them back to the people that, they, that own them. This, any striped bass that occur was a bycatch anyway. Any, any harvest of the striped bass was a bycatch anyway. And so we are disproportionately impacting one sector over another. And there's no other way to put it because we're tasked with fair and equitable access. And that is not what is going on right now. And I'm just, that, that is the cold, hard facts of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Blanton. And I do respect you and your opinions, but when I hear 
the majority, if not all, the individuals that show up for public hearing want the nets put back in the river to concentrate, to target a fish stock that has been said to be overfishing, overfishing occurring. I don't care what else we're talking about. That is what they said they wanted to fish on, and our staff has said that's we got to do something. We may have to do a supplement. We have, I don't know when the last time we did a supplement. That's how drastic we're getting, and it's just for no other reason than that. That's the responsible outcome of our vote today. So if anybody else has something to add, please do, but we need to move on with the vote on the substitute motion. Would you put the substitute motion back up there, Laura? Y yes. I kind of hate to say anything. And actually, the three of us probably don't appreciate <laughs> being put in the position of not having understood the context, at least I don't. Um, but I, and actually, just to be direct, real direct about that, if I had been involved in, from the beginning, it wouldn't be here because I actually don't think that the right answer to the problem is even on the table related to the news and tar pamica stock. I, I'll tell you, I don't think the questions that the putative research would be addressed to are clear at all and not on the table. In other words, are we trying to see whether or in whether or not uh, one or the other or both of the central and southern stock components uh, are likely to ever be able to become a self-sustaining stock? I can't even imagine how you would answer that question. I can't, as a scientist, I can tell you, I don't think you can answer that question. Um, now, you would have to put together a concerted effort to do that that tied short-term management actions to research in order to be able to do it in an integrated fashion. And I don't think taking, taking the management measure in isolation from that really gets you to that answer. But the other question has to do with whether the mortality for striped bass, particularly in that setting, has any particular, well, first of all, if it's mitigated by the net ban or not, uh, uh, total mortality, since the, the, you got the two components, the one that's a put-and-take local fishery, the other one that's a 70% uh, occasional migratory subcomponent of the Albemarle stock. And so what is the total reduced mortality anticipated in, that seg in the central and southern region associated with this closure and other measures that are in place? And so that worries me. I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the honest truth because you know, I've never seen, I'm not a fan of net bands, to tell you the truth, because in isolation they almost never achieve what people claim they will unless they're tied closely either to the solving a research question that needs to be solved with research dedicated and adequate to do that or tied to an overall mortality reduction target that is across those cross sectoral in a stock. And so that, wor that worries me. But I think that there was another answer back last time to try to figure out what a fair and equitable approach might have been. So what truthfully worries me, though, is me choosing to vote any of the three ways that are possible at this point in the process, because I don't think I really understand yet what's, what has the Wildlife Commission done how does how do different actions taken by this board today affect what the process would be thereby, and for that matter, what happens with a tie vote <laughs> here? I mean, given the small number of people that are here, the possibilities for abstentions and whatnot, then what happens? So I guess it's a point of process and clarification, Mary, if you could. That one's easy. If there's a tie vote, the motion does not pass according to your bylaws. Okay. And so that, that would have the effect of keeping in place the existing quota, but also not putting in place the additional measures in the Albemarle stock that it seems to me we all more or less agree on, right? And so th that's why I feel like I'm in a cleft stick. And you know, I, the answers on this table are not the ones I would have crafted, uh, given what I know. And I hopefully I would have known more to do something different. 
but I feel like I feel like we're so late in the process. Even saying that is not that helpful, and so that's anyway. I don't know if that's useful. We, we got a little more to the process than than, than that. I was just going to explain the process a little bit more. So, with the substitute motion, the next thing that will happen when the discussion is finished is the chair will call the question, and then the substitute motion will be voted on. If it's a tie, 4-4, four, four, it will not pass. At that point, you go and vote on the original motion. And if that's a tie, it does not pass. Um, one does not go and make the same motions over and over again, because there's just no point to it. You would have other options, for example, to table the motion indefinitely to a specific time. Um, there are other options, as, you know, you could think of another motion that you wanted to do as well, I'm sure. Okay. And Mr. Chair, if I could say one more thing, sure. um, I'm, I'm not a, a allergic to um, to taking precautionary measures that aren't fully supported by science. I mean, I, we're not ever going to have what we do fully supported by science. And so being out there, but being out there in a way that we all understand what it's for, to me, is really appropriate. And I'm just, I'm just not clear on what our expectations are for um, for this measure. I think it's very likely that we won't have adequate information at the end of two years or four years or five years to answer really either one of those two questions, the one having to do with whether or not there's a future for an independent central and southern stock or not, and the second one having to do with whether a reduced striped bass, striped bass plant, striped bass mortality in those areas would actually significantly contribute to the, um, to the pr um, likelihood of the Albemarle and Roanoke stock actually recovering. And I, I just don't see how you design that research project or how you get those answers in that time. And just really, really brutally, frankly, unless you have gill nets there actually doing their thing that you can assess and get data from, how do you figure out? what they might or might not have caught, given the vagaries of time series and climate change and all those other kinds of things. I mean, I, I, again, I I'm, don't mean to wax so poetic, but, but I mean, I think we ought to dedicate ourselves to solving the problems and answering the questions. And I just feel kind of caught in a cleft stick over having to vote really any of these three ways. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and call a question on this. I think we've had enough good debate on this motion. Um, Laura, will you do the roll call? Does everybody understand the motion? Do, we're voting on the substitute motion. Pull, pull that back down, please, if you would, Laura, they, or whoever. That's the motion that we're voting on right there. So, Laura, would you do the roll call, please? Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Nay. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? No. Thank you. Will you scroll down, Patricia? Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? <coughs> Nay. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? <laughs> I think I have to say nay. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Shalom? I completely agree with Doug um, uh, on it just being really difficult. I think I'm going to have to go nay. Thank you. And Chairman Bizzle. Aye. So the motion fails 3 to 5. So with the substitute motion failing, we'll go back to the original motion. Okay, we've had <clears throat> discussion with this motion, with the other motion. Uh, make sure everybody, pull, pull that down again, please. Just make sure everybody knows what we're voting on now. That's, that's the motion that we are now voting on. Okay. Let's do the roll call then. Laura? Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Thank you. 
Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Nay. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? I can't say shit on the re record, can I? Um, aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? No. Thank you. Commissioner Shellam? Um, sorry. Hmm. Nay, I'm just confused. I'd like more time. Okay. Sorry. Thank well, this you. This is going to give it to you. Chairman Bizzle. Nay. So the motion fails. So right now we have two failed motions in regards to, which I hear some signs of relief. Now, what we could do, we could take up another motion or we could make a motion to table this to our next meeting when everybody will have a good chance to, to study it and have more introspection on it. Yes. I would like a chance to do that, but I need further to understand what the consequences of that would be with respect to this commission and the Wildlife Commission and the overall process. I don't think we would really have any problems with doing that, would we? And, and also with the um, division's plans for moving forward with the fishery more generally. And so whether we can come together and find something that we think and sat, I just hate the idea of leaving this as a commercial versus recreational mess. I mean, I seriously just hate that. Well, so what, there's got to be some way to proceed. What we would be doing if somebody wanted to make a motion to table consideration for this to our uh, November meeting is that we would still have the last motion from our last meeting to consider, which could be... Uh, move forward, it could be amended like it was tried to today, anything could happen. No, nothing's going to happen anything any differently. Okay, well, still this is going to take a motion to pass out. Okay. So, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we can take this up. Uh, if you want to I'm willing to entertain any motion anybody wants to make, including tabling to the next meeting. Nobody wants to table it? Okay, we, we, that's why we get paid the big bucks to do our work here. So, it, we, we, yes. So, so what happens if nobody moves? You know, We're going to sit here till somebody does. Yeah, and so, and so that's really stupid, right? Yeah. So I don't think Mr. we can Blatt. resolve this. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Blanton. All right, I'll make a motion. I'm going I'm to I'm move to not approve Amendment 2 to the strike bass, estrogen strike bass management plan. And that keeps everything like it is right now. And if I can get a second, I, I, I'll continue to, to discuss, to, to, to give my justification. Okay, is there a second for this motion? I'll second it for discussion. Okay, Chairman, second like cross. Commissioner Blanton. So what, what we have here now is a motion to not approve what is written here. It keeps, it keeps the, the net lines in proclamation and not permanent. Okay. Keeps us in Amendment 1, which was explained earlier. We're down to 25,000 and 25,000 pounds. Recreational people don't get access to the striped bass in the new and, and, and tarp am. We, don't, we still don't get access to anything above those lines with nets. Everything stays the same. We're going to come back with a stock assessment update in November, right? And, and so, so we can just take this document and just throw it right out because essentially it is exactly what I said it is. It's two parts, makes a net ban permanent before, so we would have to open this plan back up, Amendment 3, to change any of that. 
keeps the lines in proclamation, which can be changed at any time, right? Um, especially at the request of the commission. Um, it addresses some issues I've heard at the table about overfished and overfished striped mullets. And, and if it's that important, we, 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 we continue to keep that corridor in place. But, but we, we, we don't need to make these lines absolutely permanent. Um, that's setting a bad precedence uh, moving forward because right now, what else? What else? I feel like these new commissioners are, are, are out of speed on is that we are now discussing with WRC lines, um, inland boundary lines, joint water lines, which will essentially, in turn, kick commercial access out to the point we can't even access blue crabs or anything like that. So that goes even further to, to restrict areas. And so there, there's a lot of history here that these, I feel like these new commissioners really need to understand what they have stepped into. And so we can throw this out. It ain't no big deal. They've done the work, but it ain't that much work. Nothing changes, because let, let's, let's, let's read it. Continue to use stock assessments and projections. Continue managing the ASMA commercial fishery as a bycatch. Just modify a measure or two. That's, that's what it reads. They're putting a slot limit here. Just a few, few, few things. It doesn't change much. It's, appendix two is basically the same as Amendment one. And we're not solidifying the lines. And the lines stay in, 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 this, in this limbo state because we have other issues in the limbo state that y'all ha haven't even heard about yet. And that's, that's, these are the facts. This is, this is what we're up against. You're going you're gonna to hear about this stuff later on in, in, in other meetings. You might even get appointed to a committee that, 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 that's going to address some of this issue. And so, you know, I, I would say we just don't even approve it. Throw it right out and stay with the same management we're doing right now because it really isn't no different. The, the lines stay the same. We're not taking, you know, we'll keep the line right where they're at and we'll continue talking about the lines. But we're not. I don't. I don't feel like it is fair to make them permanent in an amendment. I really don't. Thank you, Director. So first of all, Commissioner Blanton, when you talk about the lines being permanent in an amendment, um, the lines just because the lines are in proclamation doesn't mean that the director will change the lines, regardless, without an amendment or, or a, a absolute order from this commission. So. I won't do that. And then the other thing is, um, to your point, well, your comment about it's not a whole lot. And, and we have been managing the AR stock for a long time in a similar fashion. The, the, the um, slot limit is, is something new for the, uh, Almar, for the uh, Almaro area. But this plan has gone through, and I'm not I'm not trying to push this either way. I just want to make a statement to say that there, this takes a lot even to change this one thing. This plan goes through a considerable amount of public comment and review, AC comment and review. We are here at the end of this process. Now, I say that only to turn right around and say that this process affords this commission to not approve this plan. Uh, so I'm not trying to say that, but I am trying to just point to the, you know, the, the process that we have been through uh, has very, been very complete and very thorough. And I will say it is a little disappointing that we won't get the rest of the plan adopted except for this one issue, because this one issue is the entire thing that we, this commission and the public and the stakeholders have been very concerned about throughout the whole entire process, that this, this gill net closure issue. So, uh, it is a little bit disappointing that the rest of the plan won't move forward and that we will, you know, hang up on this one issue. And I'm not suggesting that this issue is not important uh, because I, I do think it is, but I just wanted to, uh, to make those couple of comments. Would the resource be better served if we table this to our next meeting instead of just voting it down? Um, but, well, potentially if that would allow us to... I really don't know what happens if you vote it down because that's never happened before. Um, so, except for the fact that we'll continue to manage under Amendment 1 and the things that we did want to put in place outside of this gillnet issue, 
uh, we would have to reevaluate, I'm assuming, in uh, the next amendment because I would not have, I would not have the stomach for turning around and doing this again uh, after I have just done it. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, I mean, I, I, that's, that's all I know to, to really say about that. But uh, there was something else I wanted to, point I wanted to make, but I, slipped, I don't know what it was, but maybe it'll it's come back to me. <laughs> okay, yes. I plan on voting against this motion. And the reason is that I actually, as a newcomer, I'll tell you what the optics looks like to me is that the three of us got appointed and torpedoed a long moving ship. And, and that's not what's going on, in my view. And so I, I think we should respect the time that not just the commission, but all the public have put into the development process so far, take stock of where things stand and and actually go forward with getting the last bit done. And now maybe that will prove to be impossible, but I don't think so. If we can clarify what we're trying to achieve specifically in the Upper Noose and Pamlico, not one thing, but a series of things, and lay them out on paper so that we're making a commitment to that with management measures and science that together can solve those issues. <laughs> I don't, we ought to be able to do that between now and November. I mean, if we maybe I'm, maybe I'm naive, but I think we can. So, are you offering up a substitute motion to table this till the November meeting? Yes. Let me uh, hear what uh, Commissioner Bland has to say Commissioner first. Blatt. It was just told to us that we had to make another motion, and I made another motion just for discussion here. Okay, and so I'm keeping the conversation going. We're continuing to talk, and you're continuing to learn. Okay, we're all continuing to learn. Everybody's on the edge of their seat right now. And I promise you that. Okay, now we're down a commissioner. So things change next time. It becomes even more important that people understand what's really going on here. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to just throw this away, but I'd had no other option than to make a motion. So we could continue to talk, and I don't. I want you to understand this was this was not what 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 was initially we were initially talking. This is the third motion of, the, of this of this of this process here. And so, what my intent for the whole time of here was was that y'all get educated. That was my whole intent. Now, where we come to, and I feel like where the chairman is wanting this to go, I don't have an issue with that. We can we can all just re table this motion. We can just take a deep breath, and we can come back to it at the next meeting with a full commission. I don't, and I don't have any issues with that, and I, and I can say that I can advocate for that right now, and I think that would probably be the smartest thing, in my own opinion. Right. But I could not, I could not live with it if I walked away from this meeting, allowing this amendment to just pass. Okay. Okay. And and, and 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 that's that's where I was with it, because it's not fair to sit new people down at a very at the very final stage of of of, of a controversial amendment and expect them to not to have a very narrow window of time to learn everything they need to learn about how far this amendment's been and how much time has been put into. Uh, navigating the process or whatever you want to call it and, and the discussions that have been had and all the things and, and, and because that's not due process and and I don't feel like the commercial industry has gotten due process because this issue of these lines has been tried and tried and tried to take out of the discussion it's, they, they, it's been wanting to make it permanent you go back and listen to the meeting minutes, all the things. It's just necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Commissioner Roller. Oh. Thank you. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not going to support. I understand you put this forward for um, discussion purposes, and I always support motions going forward for discussion purposes. Um, but I'm also going to oppose tabling motion, and I just before we, if we get to that point, and I'm just going to state for a couple of practical reasons. This is an important fishery. I don't agree with everything in this plan, but 
we worked it out through the scoping process, through the public process, through deliberations with com with uh, commission with you know different makeups. Part of this process, and and I understand that this is a really hard vote for some of our new commissioners, but when you're appointed to a process like this, it's virtually impossible to enter a meeting without having to make a tough decision that has already been worked out before you came here. When I was appointed to the South Atlantic Council, we had a very tough final decision. And we had to, I had to get up to speed, learn it, and do it. And I know that's really difficult. But when it comes down to it, that's just part of being involved in this sort of process. Commissioner Shellum. Can we just table it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Motion to table it, please. Okay. Okay, yeah. Never mind. Never mind. Hang no, on. No, 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 no. Okay. You can do that. You're, so you're making a substitute motion. You're offering up a substitute motion to table the vote on this amendment till our November meeting. Yes, sir. That's what you're doing. Yes, okay. sir. I'll second it. And second by Commissioner Cross. Thank you. Can. you can. Okay. You can. <laughs> you already seconded the first one. That's oh, right. Okay. Okay. For clarification, sorry. Okay, no yes. problem. Yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. Who? who? Oh, we got to have something to table it. So we're, here we are. Uh, so did, did you did second? Okay. I did second. Commissioner Huggins seconded it. Okay. No more discussion. <laughs> call to question. Roll call vote, please, on the substitute motion to table the motion. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Roller? No. Thank you. Commissioner Shellum? Aye. Thank you. Chairman Bizzle? Aye. Motion passes 7 to 1. We will take this up uh, in our November meeting. No. no. Okay. So, 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 thank you, everybody. Thank you. Catherine, you got in full gear, girl? For those of y'all who don't know Catherine Bloom, she is our hidden treasure here at the commission. She handles all of our rulemaking, and the rulemaking is enough to give anybody a headache and convert a saint into a sinner. So, Catherine, thank you again. Not chairman. <laughs> yeah. Have at it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, with me today, I have another saint who is a subject matter expert on one of the rules that we'll be covering at the end of the presentation. Um, in an effort to cover everything. Um, uh, it's a hard act to follow after that difficult discussion, but there are a lot of rules to tell you about. Um, we have a total of four packages ongoing, that some of which have been ongoing, and two of the four uh, I will be able to report to you as of um, next week will be resolved. So the content of those rules has been pending a while. So I do want, if the commission would indulge me, Mr. Chairman, so let me get through those details because I think sure. it is important for the commission and for those listening online and stakeholders. So I'm sorry about the time factor. Uh, so as the chairman said, I'm Catherine Bloom. I'm the division's rulemaking coordinator. And for the benefit of our newest commissioners, um, North Carolina General Statute 113-134 gives the commission broad authority to adopt rules that implement your authority and jurisdiction, which is also set out in other state laws, um, over the management protection, preservation, and enhancement of the state's marine and estuarine resources. Additionally, General Statute 150B-21.3A, which is the periodic review and expiration of existing rules, um, that requires state agencies that implement rules uh, to review their existing rules every 10 years in accordance with the prescribed process that includes rule readoption as if the rules are brand new rules. And so taken together, um, those responsibilities have contributed to the commission undertaking numerous rulemaking activities over the last five years or so. Um, and so as I mentioned, the commission has promulgated multiple packages of rules in any given year. 
And we are on the waning side of that, I'm very pleased to say. Um, and so uh, we are um, coming down to the end of the rules that need that process to be applied, that periodic review and readoption process. Uh, the commission does have approximately 375 rules, so it, it is a fair number of rules as state agencies go. Um, you will notice that the report provides an update on several different packages, and those are demarcated within a given year by just simple letters, A, B, and C. It's just a way to tell them apart. Um, so, as I said, starting with this meeting, um, we will be able to return to a single rule package per year. So, you have uh, briefing materials, and there is a rulemaking update section, and in that is a memo and supporting documents that provide an update to the Commission on the status of rulemaking. And I will pause for just a moment if you want to flip to that. It's the first item. It's probably the easiest one to follow if you'd like to follow along um, with, with all the detail that I, I need to share. Um, there are two rulemaking actions. I will cover one of those, and Shannon Jenkins, who's seated next to me here, he's the Shellfish Sanitation and Recreational Water Quality Section Chief. He will cover the second rule, and we'll do those at the end. So we'll get through the information updates first. Um, so the first one is an update on a... Yes, sir. Yeah, so you have a rulemaking section in your materials, rulemaking update, and it, it's near the near the end. Usually rules are at the end. <laughs> And uh, the very first item is a uh, memo from me to the commission, and then behind that uh, are several other documents that provide supporting details. So as folks, some folks have uh, computers and some have paper, so we'll just give it a, a minute here. I think Laura's coming around to try to help to make sure you can put your fingers on it. So we'll pause for just a second. We're on the downhill slope. The, the, the actions that remain for you, um, we're, we're really on the downhill. So. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Blanton. Okay, sure. All right, I want you to stay with me. So um, at your August 2020 business meeting, so two years ago, you started the process for rulemaking. That's called Notice of Text for Rulemaking. And you did that for a package of 50 rules that was in package B for that year. And three of the proposed rules address user conflicts associated with shellfish leases while still supporting a productive shellfish aquaculture industry. And that's required by Session Law 2019-37. And the proposed changes will increase setback requirements from developed shorelines for new shellfish leases limit the allowable number of corner markers for demarcating shellfish leases, and that is to simplify the polygon shapes of those leases, set new criteria for shellfish lease stakes and signage to alleviate navigation concerns, and then initiate a new shellfish leaseholder training program that emphasizes user conflict reduction strategies. And earlier today, Owen provided an update to you about the shellfish uh, program at large. Um, shellfish leasing and mentioned that I would be giving you additional details. Um, and I'll share just a little more detail in just a second, but you gave final approval of those rules in February of 2021, and the rules are automatically subject to legislative review. And that has to happen before they can become effective per two other laws, Session Law 2019-198 and General Statute 14-4.1. So what do these laws do? Why am I telling you about this? Uh, these laws require that any rule that creates a new criminal offense or otherwise subjects a person to criminal penalties is automatically subject to legislative review. And about one third of your rules, uh, that 375, about a third of those are impacted by these laws. So in very general terms, the legislative review process means that unless a bill is filed that specifically disapproves a rule, then the rule becomes effective automatically on the 31st legislative day or the day of adjournment of the next regular session of the General Assembly. That's not as linear as it may sound because of uh, recesses that they can take. 
so which is what occurred this year. But I am pleased to inform you that these rules that address user conflicts associated with shellfish leases will be effective on next Tuesday, August 23rd. That will be the 31st legislative day from the 2022 short session um, that ended up being not as short as we anticipated. So I've been talking about these a couple extra meetings. Um, but we will be issuing a news release and an update to your rule book. Uh, the, the folks that received a new rule book, there's a thing clipped to the back of it. That's called a rule book supplement. And that contains the rules that are different since the hardbound book was actually published. So we will do that again, and that, those supplements aggregate. So every time we have additional new rules, they're all added together. There's only ever one supplement to the rule book. Um, and this is a different supplement than what we were just talking about in the fishery management plan. Same word, totally different meaning, okay? Um, it, thank you, Mary. She's holding up that packet that's stapled, and that's your supplement. So rules, look in the supplement first, and if you don't see a rule in the supplement, then the one in the hardbound book is still in force. So there'll be a new one on Tuesday with a news release explaining all that. Okay, so for the benefit of the stakeholders listening and for the commission, um, this is a really good thing and we've been waiting two years to get to this point. Um, those setbacks, the current rule only allows 100 feet of setback. Um, this will be 250 feet from any existing shellfish leases from developed shoreline or from water-dependent shore-based structures, and that includes docks, wharves, uh, boat ramps, bridges, bulkheads, anything like that, groins, terminal groins, all of that is included in what is defined in the rule as a water-dependent shore-based structure. So that buffer is gonna be increased from 100 feet to 250 feet. That's gonna really help to mitigate user conflicts around the shellfish leases. Uh, the corner markers I mentioned, they'll be limited to eight eight corner markers, and again, that's simplifying the shape of those shellfish leases. Um, as far as signs, the existing rule uh, just says no less than three inches. It's clarified it would be three to 12 inches, because if you get above 12 inches, you need a CAMA permit. Um, so that was bumping up against the other agency that deals with that. Um, yellow reflective tape or light uh, reflective material needs to be on at least 12 inches vertically of each of those eight corner markers and visible from all sides. Um, it, it, there's a lot of additional detail, but these are good things that protect the leases, um, but also help with navigation concerns, user conflicts. So this is some of the detail um, that Owen indicated I would give to you, and if we had a little more time, I could offer more, but I will move on, Mr. Chairman. Unless there's questions, I'll just stop there in case there are immediate questions on that package. I don't think there is. <laughs> I will stop asking for questions until the end then. Yes, sir. Okay, that was the worst one with the most detail. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be able to increase the, the pace here. Um, so next up is the package that happened after that, um, the, the annual cycle that happened after that, 21-22. Uh, we had three different packages, and the first one is package A. Um, again, no action for the commission to take, this is just an update, but at your May 2021 meeting, so a little over a year ago, you began the process with notice of text on a package of 56 rules, and it covered four different topics. Um, there were some very general uh, changes to some gear rules, um, interjurisdictional species, rules with minor changes that have to do with handling packing and shipping crustacean meat, and then prohibiting the repacking of foreign crab meat in North Carolina. Um, and you gave final approval of these rules, this whole package of 56 rules, last November. And the rules that were not automatically subject to legislative review, as I've already described, those came out April 1st of this past year. Um, there were no impactful changes, just technical items. We did issue a news release and a rule book supplement. 13 of the 56 rules were automatically subject to legislative review, and that includes the rules to prohibit the repacking of foreign crab meat in North Carolina into another container. The proposed rules will be effective Tuesday, August 23rd. It's the same grouping, and they were subject to the same legislative sessions review, okay? Um, so those rules will be effective this coming Tuesday, August the 23rd, which is that 31st legislative day. It will also be included in that news release and the rule book supplement. Um, and for the newer commissioners or folks that haven't heard about this, um, this was a, a commission-driven uh, uh, request that was following recent developments in North Carolina where foreign crab meat was fraudulently marketed and sold as domestic blue crab. 
um, and you may have heard about this, but you requested that we develop rules to prohibit the repacking of foreign crab meat in the state um, to prevent future fraud and improve consumer confidence moving forward. Um, and so we, we did that um, and put that through. It does not affect value-added products like crab, uh, crab cakes. Um, and again, that will be in effect August 23rd. If you need additional information about what's happened to get to this point, uh, please reach out to Laura. We certainly can provide that to you. So there was a separate rule under development to require additional labeling requirements for repacked foreign crab meat, kind of a part two to the issue. Um, but it was determined that the commission had insufficient authority to proceed. Um, you did uh, approve at your last meeting, last regular meeting, to send a letter to the Department of Agriculture for assistance with closing that loophole. Um, that letter has been sent, and we are awaiting their response. So we'll keep you posted on that. Uh, so next up is package B, no action again. Uh, this one you started this time last year, so August of 2021. And this was the largest package of rules that uh, the commission has undertaken in, in quite a long time. It was a package of 109 rules covering eight subjects. Um, you did give final approval of those rules this past February. There were 38 that were not automatically subject to legislative review. And those became effective either June 1st or July 1st. They each had a, a little bit of different procedure involved. Uh, fishermen saw very little change from those rules, again, mostly technical items. Uh, a news release and, and supplement to the rule book were distributed. Um, those documents are in your briefing materials and are, are still in force until next Tuesday. The remaining 71 rules uh, are automatically subject to legislative review. Um, they will have, obviously, a delayed effective date. Three of them kind of got in in time to be considered in the short session. And so uh, I'll detail that in just a second. The other 68 have to wait till the 2023 long session. Um, but the three rules in question, they restrict highly efficient fishing gears on artificial reefs in state ocean waters to protect all species of finfish. And this was something the commission requested as a complement to restrictions for artificial reefs in the EEZ for snapper grouper species. Um, so the allowed gears are hand line, hook and line, rod and reel, and spear fishing gear and all spear fishing gear will be restricted to recreational limits. The intention is to reduce the likelihood of over excuse me, over-exploitation of finfish resources on the reefs where the fish aggregate. Um, and so those three rules will also be in effect this coming Tuesday, August 23rd. Um, so we have three topics that are gonna be headliners in that news release on Tuesday. As I said, the remaining 68 rules um, will continue to keep you updated on that as we approach the 2023 long session. So one more package to update you on and we'll move into the new material for today's action items. Uh, so this is package C from this past year. Uh, again, no action. At your March special meeting this year, you approved notice of text to begin the process for nine joint rules that pertain to the classification of the waters of North Carolina as coastal fishing waters, joint fishing waters, or inland fishing waters. And the rules were proposed for readoption with no changes. They simply were subject to that periodic review process and we needed to get them through the process. So you gave final approval of those at your June special meeting. And these are shared rules, the joint rules for joint fishing waters, inland fishing waters, coastal fishing waters. Um, they are shared rules with uh, the authority with the Wildlife Resources Commission. So both agencies had to approve both sets of rules. Um, so the Wildlife Resources Commission also gave its concurrence of this commission's rules in June. Um, and earlier in the spring, the flip-flop had already happened where this commission approved theirs and they approved theirs. So all four votes had occurred by the end of June. Um, in fact, uh, June 29th is when those rules were submitted, and um, June 30th was the readoption deadline. So we just made it. <laughs> um, so thanks to everybody involved there. Uh, they were submitted to the Office of Administrative Hearings for final approval, and coincidentally, the Rules Review Commission met this morning. Uh, everybody decided that August 18th was a terrific day to have a meeting. So um, they did meet this morning, and the Rules Review Commission did approve the 20 joint rules. Um, one of those is automatically subject to legislative review, so that'll be in the bin for next spring's uh, long session. 
um, and the other 19 uh, should be effective September 1st. Again, there were no changes in the rules, so it's really more of a procedural matter to make sure that the rules got readopted within the given time frame. I am going to take a breath, Mr. Chairman, and just make sure there's no questions because that was a lot of material in a short time. That was a lot of material. Any questions on this? This is one of these things that we just trust her to run with because <laughs> she hasn't disappointed us yet, and I don't think she will. <laughs> Well, don't jinx me now, but I won't. I won't. Um, I, I'm the spokesperson for dozens and dozens and dozens of people that do a ton of work, and I yeah. come up here and get to look like I know what I'm talking about because I have great people sitting behind me and, and at home. So. Well, you do a good um, job. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so as I said, there's just a single rule package for this coming year, and uh, a table that shows the timing of the steps in the process is part of what's behind the memo. Um, and you'll see just a one-pager that shows that the public comment period will be October 3rd through December 2nd. We'll hold a single public hearing by WebEx uh, scheduled for Tuesday, November 1st in the evening, 6 p.m. And Laura will coordinate with you, Mr. Chairman, uh, so that you can name a hearing officer for that uh, public hearing for November 1st. Um, there's just two rules. So that sounds a lot better than 109. Uh, which was this time last year. So um, we're going to take them one at a time. You will get a break from hearing me, uh, but I'll go ahead and get through the first rule. And when I hand it over to Shannon, unless you have questions for me, you don't have to hear me any further. Um, okay, so first up is the mutilated finfish rule. This should sound familiar. You've heard some about this in the previous year in the development phase. So last year at your August meeting, a motion was passed requesting the division to develop an issue paper for rulemaking examining the mutilated finfish rule. Um, discussions during the meeting identified potential issues with the rule, current limitations of the rule, and potential changes that were uh, needed. The division presented the issue paper at your February meeting, and when you selected your preferred management option uh, and associated language for rulemaking, that's what you did in February. Once we had that, the division was able to draft the fiscal analysis of the proposed rule change, which is required by state law. That's a part of the process. We got approval by Office of State Budget and Management, and so that fiscal analysis and the actual rule are in your materials, and both items are part of your vote when you're approving notice of tax. You're approving the proposed rule to go out to the public for comment, and you're approving that the Office of State Budget and Management's okay of our fiscal note that is the approved fiscal note it's the companion with that rule and both the rule and fiscal note are subject to public comment um, so you're approving both items when you approve notice of text uh, those proposed amendments would provide flexibility to manage variable conditions for the use of finfish as cut bait um, and that would be done by simplifying the rule such that only species subject to a possession limit are subject to the requirements unless otherwise specified in a commission rule or a proclamation issued under authority of a commission rule. Um, and so the original intent of the mutilated finfish rule was to provide added resource protection for finfish species that are subject to a size or bag limit, other possession limit. Um, so proposed amendments to the rule would provide flexibility to manage current conditions for the use of certain finfish species as cut bait, as well as variable conditions that could occur in the future and all while continuing to protect fisheries resources. So proposed amendments would clarify requirements and benefit affected stakeholders as well as Marine Patrol officers. Specifically, uh, the species that, that brought this to light, um, due to current possession limits, use of American eel, spot, Atlantic croaker, and bluefish as cut bait create conflicts with the current mutilated finfish rule. Um, and this came to light based on communication from stakeholders and feedback from Marine Patrol officers. Um, also implications from stock assessments and fishery management plans. So a lot of factors came into play that brought this to the table for the commission. So additionally, changes to the current exception for mullet may be needed based on the outcome of the striped mullet stock assessment and management changes developed through the FMP process. So this was considered in discussions of development of this mutilated finfish rule. Um, it is likely that species beyond the five I just mentioned could require similar consideration in the future. So proposed changes would amend the rule in a way that can resolve current conflicts um, and also provide flexibility in the future to manage variable conditions. 
It would allow all requirements for a particular finfish species to be aggregated into a single proclamation, including bait usage. Um, and so for more comprehensive management, essentially one-stop shopping, so that you don't have to go here to know what you can do with a certain fish, but also remember to go here to see that something's prohibited for cutting it up as bait. We can put it all in one place. Um, and then all the while still protect those fisheries resources. Uh, one uh, item I really wanna focus on about this rule, um, it is important to note, it is not predetermined that species allowed to be cut now for bait would continue or that relief would be granted for the use of species that are prohibited now. Um, for example, what really brought this to the, to the top of the, the heap last summer uh, was the use of American eel for, for cut bait. Um, so relief would not necessarily be granted based on the timing, and I'll explain that. Um, the amended rule would just provide the fisheries director the authority to use her discretion to determine in the context of the then current variable conditions and available data and information, if it would be appropriate to issue a proclamation that would allow a particular species to be used as cut bait. Um, the issue paper that outlines much more of the detail of the specific species is included again in your materials. You received this in February, but we added it here again because it has more information on the details of that than the fiscal analysis does. Uh, this mutilated finfish rule is one of the one-third of the rules <laughs> that is automatically subject to legislative review. And so it will not be reviewed um, any earlier than the 2024 short session. Uh, so based on this year's short session, that could be at least two years from now uh, before the rule could become effective and the director could have the authority to consider the variable conditions in place then um, to balance the use of bait with the needs of the resource. Um, so things could change by then. Spot and croaker uh, bag limits could change by then. Uh, the status of striped mullet could change. Um, so uh, the way to get there, though, is to begin the rulemaking process. Um, and again, this is just bringing a proposed rule out to the public for public comment to get that feedback. We will bring that feedback to you. So this is not a final action or anything like that. But in order to proceed, Staff needs a motion to approve notice of text for rulemaking for the proposed amended mutilated finfish rule 15A NCAC 03M0101 and associated fiscal analysis. Um, and Mr. Chairman, I will pause here uh, if there are questions and so that the commission um, can uh, entertain, you know, taking that action before we continue with the rest of the rulemaking update. Okay. Uh Mr. Chairman, I, I can offer a motion if that would be proper. It will be, okay. be proper to approve the notice of text to amend mutilated finfish rule 15A, blah, 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 blah. Absolutely. Okay. And you got a second? Second. Commissioner Cross. Uh, new commissioners, what this basically is doing is uh, keeping some legal, well intended fishermen from breaking the law. I mean, uh, Spots and croakers were being cut up for bait for a number of fisheries, and nobody knew they weren't supposed to be doing it, really. So that's helping keeping honest people honest. Uh, okay, any discussion? All right, roll call vote, please. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Blanton? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Huggins? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner McNeil? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Rader? Aye. Com thank you. Commissioner Roller? Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Shalom. Aye. Thank you, and Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Thank Motion you. passes unanimously. Okay. okay, so continuing with the second of the two rules, just as sort of the logistic preamble, <laughs> um, there's just one rule about marinas, and that's subject to readoption under the periodic review requirements. Um, as with the first rule, the division drafted the fiscal analysis of the proposed rule change, um, and we received approval by the Office of State Budget and Management on that fiscal analysis. Um, the analysis and the rule, again, are in your briefing materials. Uh, the vote on notice of text is inclusive of both items, the proposed rule and the OSBM approved fiscal note. Both would go out for public comment and both are subject to those comments. Um, the uh, intended effective date of the Marina's rule, which is not automatically subject to legislative review, is next May, May 1st, 2023. Um, so as I said, this is where I get to um, stop talking and you don't have to listen to me anymore, Mr. Chairman. But we like listening to you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and uh, a certain commissioner is still awake, so I'm glad to, to see that, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Cross. Um, we had discussion about that earlier. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, seated next to me here, Shannon Jenkins, a good sport that had to sit up here with me this whole time. Um, he is our Recreational Water Quality and Shellfish Sanitation Section Chief and subject matter expert for everything within uh, that section. So um, him and, and all the staff that work for him. Um, he is going to provide a summary of the proposed changes to the Marina's rule, and you thought I was done. But before I turn it over to you, the only other thing I wanted to share, um, in 2017, you began the rulemaking process uh, for the periodic review with that, you know, sort of head count of about 375 rules. Um, there are only 79 left, and all of those pertain to shellfish plants and inspections. So we are already working on getting those rules prepared, including the fiscal analysis, to begin rulemaking at your usual start time in normal times when we're not doing so many rules, which is your May meeting every year. So for next May, we're going to bring you one big packet of very similar rules, um, and those 79 represent the end of that periodic review headcount. Um, so we'll bring you those in plenty of time to meet the readoption deadline of June 30th, 2024. So that now does officially conclude my portion, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Shannon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Shannon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. All right, again, my name is Shannon Jenkins. I'm the uh, section chief of the Shellfish Sanitation and Recreational Water Quality section within DMF. As Catherine mentioned, I'd like to give a very brief overview of the proposed change to the Marina Rule, which is uh, 18A.0911. This rule is certainly in need of an update. It was last uh, uh, amended in July 1993. So the purpose of the rule is for the protection of public health by prohibiting the harvest of shellfish at marinas. When we're talking shellfish here, we're talking bivalve mollusks such as oysters and clams, which are filter feeders. The uh, harvest and consumption of shellfish from a marina can result in illness due to the overboard discharge of sewage from boats as well as other potential pollution sources found at marinas. The uh, National Shellfish Sanitation Program, the NSSP, requires that states meet minimum health-related standards in order to be eligible to ship shellfish in interstate commerce. The NSSP Guide for the Control of Molluscan Shellfish, which is called the Model Ordinance, requires that states implement a shellfish harvest buffer closure at marinas using a pollution assessment and a dilution analysis to determine the size of the closure. A dilution analysis uses water volume at the marina and other factors to calculate the closure size necessary to dilute an overboard discharge of sewage to a safe level outside the marina. <clears throat> the current MSC rule instead prescribes a specific closure size based on a limited number of marina characteristics but primarily uses the total number of boat slips at a marina. In essence, the current rule uses a very blunt method of determining the closed harvest zone and also may not be in full compliance with the NSSP. The current MSC marina's rule also contains an exemption clause whereby marinas with certain characteristics do not require a shellfish closure. These include marinas with less than 30 boat slips having no boats with heads, no boats with cabins, and no boats greater than 24 feet. In other words, these are marinas with a limited number of boats, smaller boat sizes that don't support toilets, liverboards, or overnight stays. This is an exemption may not be in full compliance with the NSSP and has also been problematic regarding the monitoring and enforcement of these restrictions by DMF and the Division of Coastal Management, DCM that issues permits for these facilities. It also has been confusing to the public, such as homeowners associations, which are uh, charged with maintaining these permits for neighborhood marinas. I want to give a quick example. There have been uh, instances where homeowners have unknowingly purchased and docked a boat at an exemption marina that, that does not meet the exemption criteria and the homeowner later had to either sell the boat or find an alternative storage location in order to comply with the DCM marina permit. It should be noted that this exemption only applies to a small portion 
of total marinas in North Carolina, about 10 or so. So the goals of the proposed amendments to this rule are to, one, use a dilution analysis to replace the current process for determining the size of the necessary buffer closure as required by the NSSP, and also provide a more scientific and public health-based rationale for these buffer closures, and two, delete the exemption section of the existing rule such that it makes implementation of the rule easier, reduces uh, gray areas, and eliminate portions of the rule that were unenforceable. The proposed changes to this rule have been communicated to both DCM and the Division of Water Resources, DWR, both of which also have, a, have an interest in marinas and their programs. DMF staff met, met with the DCM director and staff regarding the proposed amendments, and DCM expressed their support. A copy of the uh, fiscal analysis and the proposed rule amendments were recently sent to both the DCM and DWR division directors on behalf of Director Rawls. Uh, I'd be glad to try to any, uh, answer any questions prior to your scheduled vote on the proposed amendments to readopt this rule. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Not. Uh, Chair is looking for a motion to approve notice of text to readopt Marines docking facilities and everything else. So moved. Put up there. So moved, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Second. And second. Motion by Commissioner Blanton. Second by Commissioner Roller. Any other discussion? Not. Roll call. Yes, Chair. Commissioner Cross. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Blanton. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Huggins. Thank you, Commissioner McNeil. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Rader. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Roller. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Shellum. Aye. Thank you, and Chairman Bizzle. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work. It's very important and uh, it's very intense and it's recognized. Thank you. Okay, we've come to the point on our agenda where we open it up for any issues for our commissioners. Um, if there's something you'd like to see brought up in the future or uh, looked into or just a little fuzzy on, now's the time to bring it forth to staff and let them be, um, be looking into it. Commissioner Roller. Thank you, Chair. Um, just reiterate one of my previous positions regarding the discussion this morning at the South Atlantic update. Um, would really like to see up like any sort of discussion from the division regarding the South Atlantic permits and any ways in which they could be enforced or specifically how outreach may be able to do some of that. That's it. Okay. Anybody else with anything? What? Oh, go ahead then. Wait, wait. You don't recognize him? I'd rather not. Not no. in public anyway. Don't. Actually, it's not an issue. It's a thank you. I want to thank the prior members of the commission that uh, have just been replaced. Uh, I want to thank them for their service. I want to thank them for the work they did, especially on uh, one of the shrimp plans, which ironically, uh, three or four weeks ago, we've seen the most incredible historical capture of product in the very area we were talking about closing down with the least amount of bycatch I've ever seen in history. I mean, you talk about four to one bycatch to shrimp. This stuff's going 30 to one to 50 to one shrimp to fish. I mean, it's, I've got some pictures. I don't know if Laura can pop them up or not, but it, it was absolutely incredible. It lasted about 10 days, and now the shrimp have dispersed, and because they've dispersed and with the price of fuel and whatnot, the boys really can't work on them. But for 10 days, right in the area we were – possibly talking about closing, it was uh, historical. It truly was. In landings, you just had to see it to believe it. If she can get up a couple of these pictures, I mean, it was like towing in just what they call pure hair. It was unreal. You got it? It's that fast cable. You, you're going to drag this meat now? No, no. Nah, I, 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 mean, I just want to thank the commission and the division for, you know, having the foresight to let's work it out the way we did. That's all. And I'm, okay. But I would like y'all to see these pictures. You won't believe them. Okay. We'll be, they'll, they'll be up by the time we leave. Anything else from anybody? 
Uh, we will be giving some plaques for our uh, retiring commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Shellam, Huggins, Raider, I want to thank y'all for being part of this. Y'all had a good baptism of fire today. Believe it or not, this is not the worst first meeting that there has been for commissioners. It gets intense sometimes, but you'll feel your way along and you'll be a, a very good um, attribute for our commission. We're looking forward to working with y'all on this. Laura, you got our meeting assignments. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I'm just going to do a very quick review and also talk about your November meeting also very briefly. Um, so we will be drafting a letter uh, to the South Atlantic Council addressing the dolphin issue. And with regard to the content, there was a lot of discussion, so I will be reaching out to a number of you who um, talked about that just to get the content correct. So we will be having, um, we are going to be updating the 2017 white paper on false albacore to include um, framing potential management options for future consideration. So just for clarification, um, we referred to a white paper and an information paper and an issue paper. A white paper and an information paper are the same thing. They are before a information or before an issue paper is developed. So it's just looking at the data and the issue. Go ahead. Updating the paper that you already have. Exactly. How's that? Updating okay. the paper that we already have. Um, so for the, we will continue to review um, information regarding the federal permits um, and the feasibility of incorporating those as state regulation and also outreach. Um, your, uh, you did approve the River Herring FMP as an information update, uh, meaning there are no changes to management at this time. Um, as Corinne said, the ASMFC stock assessment is underway, so we will update you once that is complete. The estuarine striped bass um, has been tabled until your November meeting, um, so um, we will discuss it then. For uh, new commissioners, I will be in touch to complete your onboarding, um, specifically to make sure that you get your e uh, MFC emails set up so that you can start to receive um, correspondence for those. Um, and then after today's meeting, I'll be working with Chairman Bizzle on the commission appointments, as he referred in the beginning of the day. Um, for November, your meeting is scheduled uh, to take place in Emerald Isle at the Islander Hotel, and that is set for November 16th through the 18th. Um, and at that time, you're going to uh, be receiving the uh, scoping update for striped mullet and also be voting on approval of the goals and objectives for that plan. So that's the very first step in beginning the develop development of that plan. For spotted sea trout, um, you are going to be receiving the stock assessment presentation. Um, there is uh, the peer review is occurring this fall, so there is a chance that could move to your February meeting, but we do expect it to come to November. Um, and then I will talk to Chairman Bizzle about a hearing officer for November 1st. Okay. Um, and if I can see the new commissioners just for a minute before you leave, that would be great. Thank right. you. Our, our meetings are normally a day and a half with the evening public comment. We thought we could get everything done in a day today, and we barely did, but we did. So, But plan on a day and a half going forward. And, uh, D, I'm going to miss you. You're irreplaceable. How many are you going to get, two, three, to take her role over? At least. At least. <laughs> okay. Well, <Yeah. laughs> you're not. Yep, if there's nothing else to be brought forward to the commission for the betterment of the fish, we stand adjourned.